Hachette Audio presents One Good Deed Written by David Baldacci Read by Eduardo Ballerini To Ben Severe For believing in both me and Aloysius Archer Chapter 1 It was a good day to be free of prison The mechanical whoosh and greasy smell of the opening bus doors greeted Aloysius Archer as he breathed free air for the first time in a while. He wore a threadbare, single-breasted brown victory suit with peak lapels that he'd bought from the Sears Roebuck catalog before heading off to war. The jacket was shorter than normal, and there were no pleats or cuffs to the pants because that all took up more material than the war would allow. There was no belt for the same reason. A string tie, a fraying, wrinkled white shirt, and scuffed lace-up size 12 plain Oxford shoes completed the only wardrobe he owned. Small clouds of dust rose off his footwear as he trudged to the bus. His pointed chocolate brown fedora with a dented crown had a loop of faded burgundy silk around it. He'd bought the hat after coming back from the war, one of the few times he'd splurged on anything. But a global victory over evil had seemed to warrant it. These were the clothes he'd worn to prison, and now he was leaving in them. He comically lamented that in all this time, the good folks of the correctional world had not seen fit to clean or even press them. And his hat held stains that he hadn't brought with him to incarceration. Yet a man couldn't go around without a hat. The pants hung loosely around his waist, a waist grown slimmer and harder while he'd been locked up. He was fully 25 pounds heavier than when he'd gone into prison. But the extra weight was all muscle, grafted onto his arms, shoulders, chest, back, and legs, like thickened vines on a mature tree. In his socks, he was exactly six feet one and a quarter. The army had measured him years before. They were quite adept at calculating height, though they had too frequently failed to supply him with enough ammunition for his M1 rifle or food for his belly, while he and his fellow soldiers were trying to free large patches of the world from an oddball collection of deranged men. The prison had a rudimentary gym of which he'd taken full advantage. It wasn't just to build up his body. When he was pumping weights or running or working his gut, it allowed him to forget for a precious hour or two that he was squirreled away in a cage with felonious men. The prison also held a book depository, teeming with tattered coverless books that sported missing pages at inopportune times but they were precious to him nonetheless. His favorites had been westerns, where the man got the gal, and detective novels, where the man got the gal and also caught the bad guy, which he supposed was a funny sort of way for a prisoner to be entertained. Yet he liked the puzzle component of the mystery novels. He tried to solve them before he got to the end, and found that as time went on, he had happened upon the correct solution more often than not the jail grub he had pretty much done without. What wasn't spoiled or wormy held no discernible taste to persuade him to ingest it. He'd gotten by in a variety of fruits picked from a nearby orchard, vegetables harvested from the small garden inside the prison walls, and the occasional piece of fried chicken or soft bread and clots of warm apple fritters that arrived at the prison in mysterious ways. Some said they were dropped off by compassionate ladies, either looking to do good or else hoping for a husband in three to five years. The rest of his time was spent either busting big rocks into smaller ones using sledgehammers, collecting trash along the side of the roads, only to see it back the next day, or else digging ditches to nowhere fast, because a man with a double-barreled shotgun, sunglasses, a wide-brimmed hat, and a stone-cold stare told him that was all he was good for. He was not yet thirty, was never married, and had no children. But one glance in the mirror showed a man who seemed older, his skin baked brown by the sun and further aged by being behind bars the rest of the time. A world war, coupled with the brutal experience of losing one's liberty, had left their indelible marks on him. These two experiences had successfully robbed him of the remainder of his youth, but hardened him in ways that might at some point work out in his favor. His hair had been long going into prison. On the first day, they had a cut army short. Then he tried to grow a beard. They shaved that off, too. They said something about lice and hiding places for contraband. 
He vowed never to cut his hair again, or at least to go as long as possible without doing so. It was a small thing, to be sure. He had started out life concentrated only on achieving large goals. Now he was focused on just getting by. The impossibly difficult ambitions had been driven from him. On the other hand, the mundane seemed reasonably doable for Archer. He ducked his head and swept off his fedora to avoid colliding with the ceiling of the rickety vehicle. The bus doors closed with a hiss and a thud, and he walked down the center aisle, a suddenly free man looking for unencumbered space. The rocking bus was surprisingly full. Well, perhaps not surprisingly. He assumed this mode of transport was the only way to get around. This was not the sort of land where they built airfields or train depots. And those black ribbons of state highways never seemed to get rolled out in these places. It was the sort of area where folks did not own a vehicle that could travel more than 50 miles at any given time. Nor did the folks driving said vehicles ever want to go that far anyway. They might fall off the edge of the earth. The other passengers looked as bedraggled as he, perhaps more so. Maybe they'd been behind their own sorts of bars that day, while he was leaving his. They were all dressed in pre-war clothes, or close to it, with dirty nails, raw eyes, hungry looks, and not even a glimmer of hope in the bunch. That surprised him, since they were now a few years removed from a wondrous global victory, and things were settling down. But then again, victory did not mean that prosperity had suddenly rained down upon all parts of the country. Like anything else, some fared better than others. It seemed he was currently riding with the others. They all stared up at him with fear, or suspicion, or sometimes both running seamlessly together. He saw not one friendly expression in the crowd. Perhaps humankind had changed while he'd been away. Or then again, maybe it was the same as it had always been. He couldn't tell just yet. He hadn't gotten his land legs back. Archer spotted an empty seat next to an older man in threadbare overalls over a stained undershirt. A stubby straw hat perched in his lap, brogans the size of babies on his feet, and a large canvas bag clutched in one calloused hand. He had watched Archer bug-eyed for the whole time it took him to reach his seat. An instant before Archer's bottom hit the stained fabric of the chair, the other man let himself go wide, splaying out like a pot boiling over forcing Archer to ride on the edge, and uncomfortably so. Still, he didn't mind. While his prison cell had been bigger than the space he was now occupying, he had shared it with four other men, and not a single one of them was going anywhere. But now, now I'm going somewhere. Joint stop! What's that? asked Archer, eyeballing the man looking at him now. His seatmate's hair was going white, and his mustache and beard had already gone all the way there. He got on at the prison stop. Did I now? Yeah, you did. How long did you do in the can? Archer turned away and looked out the windshield into the painful glare of sunshine and the vast sky over the broad plains ahead that was unblemished by a single cloud. Long enough. Hey, you don't happen to have a smoke I can bum. You can't really borrow a smoke, now can you? And you can't smoke on here anyways. The hell you say? The man pointed to a handwritten sign on cardboard hanging overhead that said this very thing. More rules. Archer shook his head. I've smoked on a train, on a navy ship, and in a damn church. My old man smoked in the waiting room when I was being born, so they told me. And he said my mom had a palm mall in her mouth when I came out. What's the deal here, friend? They've had trouble before, see? Like what? Like some knucklehead fell asleep smoking and caught a whole dang bus on fire. Right. Ruin it for everybody else. Ain't good for you anyway, I believe, said the man. Most things not good for me I enjoy every now and again. What'd you do to get locked up? Kill a man? Archer shook his head. Never killed anybody. Guess they all say that. Guess they do. Guess you were innocent. No, I did it, admitted Archer. Did what? Killed a man. Why? He was asking too many questions of me. 
But Archer smiled, so the man didn't appear too alarmed at the veiled threat. Where are you headed? Somewhere that's not here, said Archer. He took off his jacket, carefully folded it, and laid it on his lap with his hat on top. Is all you got the clothes on your back? All I got. What's your ticket say? Archer dug into his pocket and pulled it out. It was 80 and dry outside, and about a 100 inside the bus, even with the windows half down. The created breeze was like oven heat, and the mingled odors were peculiar. And yet Archer didn't really sweat, not anymore. Prison had been far hotter, far more peculiar. His pores and sense of smell had apparently recalibrated. Poker City, he read off the flimsy ticket. Never been there, but I hear it's growing like gangbusters. Used to be the boondocks, but then it went from cattle pasture to a real town. People coming out this way after the war, you see. And what do they do once they get there? Anything they can, brother, to make ends meet. Sounds like a plan good as another. The older man studied him. Were you in the war? You looked like you were. I was. Seen a lot of the world, I bet? I have. Not always places I wanted to be. I've been out of this state exactly one time. Went to Texas to buy some cattle. Never been to Texas. Hey, you been to New York City? Yes, I have. The man sat up straighter. You have? Archer casually nodded his head. Passed through there on account of the war. Seen the Statue of Liberty. Been to the top of the Empire State Building. Rode the rides over at Coney Island. Even seen some rockets walking down the street in their get-ups and all. The man licked his lips. Tell me something. Are their legs like they say, friend? Better. Gams like Betty Grable and faces like Lana Turner. Damn! What else? He asked eagerly. Had a box lunch in the middle of Central Park. Sat on a blanket with a honey worked at Macy's department store. We drank sodas, and then she slipped out a flask from the top of her stocking. What was in there? Well, it was better than grape soda, I can tell you that. We had a nice day, and a better night. The man scratched his cheek. So, what are you doing all the way out here, then? Life has a crazy path sometimes. And like you said, folks heading this way after the war. The man, evidently intrigued now by his companion, sat up straighter, allowing Archer more purchase on his seat. And the war was a long time ago, or seems it anyway, said Archer, stretching out. But you got one life, right? Lest somebody's been lying to me. Hold on now, church says we get two lives. One now, one after we're dead, eternal. Don't think that's in the cards for me. Man never knows. No, I think I know. Archer tipped his head back, closed his eyes, and grabbed his first bit of shut-eye as a free man in a long time. Chapter Two Archer got off at Polka City seven hours later and too many stops in between to remember. People had gotten on and people had gotten off. They'd had a dinner and bathroom break at a roadside diner with an outhouse in the back, both of which looked only a stiff breeze away from falling over. It was nearly eight in the evening now. He stood there as the bus in the rube with too many queries and the remaining nervous folks clutching all they owned, sped off into the night chasing pots of gold along dusty roads with nary a helpful leprechaun in sight. Good riddance to them all, thought Archer. And then a second later, his more charitable consideration was, well, good luck to them. We all needed luck now and then, was his firm belief. And maybe right now he needed it more than most. The point was, would he get it? Or will I have to make my own damn luck and hope for no bad luck as a chaser? He put on his hat and then his jacket and looked around. He was in Polka City because the D.O.P. said it was here he had to serve as parole. He dragged out the pages he'd been given. In fat, bold typeface at the top of the page was Department of Prisons, or the D.O.P. Below that was a long list of don'ts and a far shorter list of do's. These rules would govern his life for the next three years. Though he was free, there was a liberty with lassos attached, 
with so-called legal conditions that he mostly could make neither head nor tail of. Who knew prison could stick to you? Like running into a spider's web in the morning, flailing about, just wanting to be free of the tendrils, while alarmed that a poisonous thing was coming for you. Archer had been released from prison well before he served his full sentence, due to time off for good behavior, and also for passing muster at his first parole board meeting. He had ventured into the little stuffy room that held a flimsy table with three chairs behind and one chair in front, and him not knowing what to expect. Two burly prison guards had accompanied him to this meeting. He had been dressed in his prison duds, which seemed to shriek guilt and continued danger from each pore of the sweat-stained fabric. Behind the table were three people, two men and one woman. The men were short and stout and freely perspiring in the closeness of the room. They looked self-important and bored as they greedily puffed on their fat cigars. The woman, who sat in the middle of this little band of freedom-givers or takers, was tall and matronly, with an elaborate hat on which a fabric bird clung to one side and with a dead fox around her blocky shoulders. Archer had instantly seized on her as the real power, and thus had focused all of his attention there. His contriteness was genuine, his remorse complete. He stared into her large brown eyes and said his piece with heartfelt emphasis contained in each word, until he saw quivering at the corners of those eyes, the false bird and fox start to shake. When he'd finished and then answered all her questions, the consultation among the board was swift and in his favor as the men quickly capitulated to the woman's magisterial decree. And that had been the price of freedom, which he had gladly paid. The Derby Hotel was where the D.O.P. said it would be. Point for those folks, grudgingly. Its architecture reminded him of places he'd seen in Germany. That did not sit particularly well with him. Archer hadn't fought all those years to come home and see any elements of the vanquished settled here. He trudged across the macadam, the collected heat of the day wicking up into his long feet. Though the sky was now dark, it was still cloudless and clear. The air was so dry he felt his skin try to pull back into itself. Archer also thought he saw dust exhaled along with breath. A pair of old withered men were bent over a checkerboard table and congruously perched in the shadow of a large fountain. The thing was built principally of gray and white marble, with naked fat cherubs suspended in the middle holding harps and flutes, and not a drop of water coming out of the myriad spouts. With furtive glances, the old men watched him coming. Archer shuffled along rather than walked. For long distances in prison, meaning longer than a walk to the john, you had your feet shackled, and so you shuffled along. It was demeaning, to be sure, and that was the whole purpose behind it. Archer meant to rid himself of the motion, but it was easier said than done. He could feel their gazes tracking him, like silent parasites sucking the life out of him at a distance, him in his cheap wrinkled clothes with his awkward gait. Prison stop. Look out, gents. Ex-con shuffling on by. He nodded to them as he and his filthy shoes grew closer to the cherubic fountain and the bent checker-playing men. Neither nodded in return. Poca City, apparently, was not that sort of place. He reached the harder pavement in front of the hotel, swung the front door wide and let it bang shut behind him. He crossed the floor, the plush carpet sucking him in, and tapped a bell set on the front desk. As its ringing died down, he gazed at a sign on the wall promising shine shoes fast for a good rate. That and a shave and a haircut, and a masculine aftershave included. A middle-aged man with a chrome dome and wearing a not overly clean white shirt with a gray vest over it and faded corduroy trousers came out from behind a frayed burgundy curtain to greet him. His sleeves were rolled up, and his forearms were about as hairy as any archer had ever seen. It was like fat, fuzzy caterpillars had colonized there. His nails could have used a scrubbing, and he seemed to have the same coating of dust as Archer. Yes, he said, running an appraising glance over Archer, and clearly coming away not in any way, shape, or form satisfied. Need a room. Figured that. Rates on the wall right there. You okay with that? Do I have a choice? 
The man gave him a look while Archer felt for the wrinkled dollars in his pocket. Three nights. The man put out his hand, and Archer passed him the money. He put it in the till and swung a stiff ledger around. Please sign, complete with a current address. Do I have to? Yes. Why? It's the law. The law seemed to be everywhere these days. Archer reluctantly took up the chubby pen the man handed him. What's the address of this place? Why? Because that's my current address, is why. The man harumphed and told him. Archer dutifully wrote it down and signed his name in a flourish of cursive. The man eyed the signature upside down. That's really a name? Why? You mostly get Smiths and Jones here with ladies on their arms for short stays? Hey, fella, this ain't that kind of a place. Yeah, I know, you're all class. Like the naked baby set in marble outside. Look it, where are you from? Said the man, a scowl now crowding his face. Here and there, now here. The man slid open a drawer and pulled out a fat brass key. Number 610, top floor, elevators that way. He pointed to his left. Stairs, same way. As Archer started off, the man said, Wait, don't you have no bags? Wearing them instead of carrying them, replied Archer over his shoulder. He took the stairs, not the elevator. Elevators were really little prison cells, was his opinion. And maybe the doors wouldn't open when he wanted them to. What then? One thing prison took away from you hard and clear was simple trust. He unlocked the door to 610 and surveyed it, taking his time. He had all the time in the world now. After counting every minute of every hour of every day for the last few years, he no longer had to. But still, it was a tough habit to break. He figured he might actually miss it. He checked the bed. Flimsy, squeaky. His in prison had been concrete masquerading as a mattress, so this was just fine. He opened a drawer and saw the Gideon Bible there along with stationery and a ballpoint pen. Well, Jesus and letter writing are covered. He took off his jacket and hung it on a peg, placing his hat on top of it. He slipped out his folding money. He laid the bills out precisely on the bed, divided by denomination. There was not much there after he'd laid out the dough for the room. The D.O.P. had been stingy, but in an effective way. He would have to work to survive. This would keep him from mischief. He wasn't guessing about this. Archer took out his parole papers. It was right there in the very first paragraph. Gainful employment will keep you from returning to your wayward ways, and thus to prison. Do not forget this. He continued running his eye down the page. First meeting was tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. sharp, at the Polka City Courts and Municipality Building. That was a long name, and it somehow stoked fear in Archer. Of rules and regulations, and too many things for him to contemplate readily or adhere to consistently. Ernestine Crabtree was her name, his parole officer. Ernestine Crabtree. It sounded like quite a fine name for a parole officer. He opened his window for one reason only. His window had never opened in prison. He sucked in the hot, dry air and surveyed Polka City. Polka City looked back at him without a lick of interest. Archer wondered if that would always be the case, no matter where he went. He lay back on the bed. But his Elgin wristwatch told him it was too early to go to bed, probably too late to get a drink, though number 14 on his DOP don't list was no bars and no drink. Number 15 was no women. So was number 16, at least in a way, though it more specifically referred to no loose women. The DOP probably had amassed a vast collection of statistics that clearly showed why the confluence of parolees and alcohol in close proximity to others drinking likewise was not a good thing. And when you threw in women, and more to the point, loose women, an apocalypse was the only likely outcome. Of course, right now, he dearly wished for a libation of risky proportion. Archer put on his jacket and his hat, scooped up his cash, and went in search of one. And maybe the loose women, too. 
A man in his position could not afford to be choosy, or withholding of his desires. On his first day of freedom, he deemed life just too damn short for that. Chapter 3 He found it only a short distance from the hotel, not on the main drag of Polka City, but down a side street that was only half the length of the one he'd left. But it was far more interesting, at least to Archer's mind. If the main street was for checker playing and marble musical babies, this was where the adults got their jollies. And Archer had always been a fan of the underdog with weaknesses of the flesh, considering how often he fell on that side of the ledger. The marquee was neon blue and green, with a smattering of sputtering red. He hadn't seen the likes of such since New York City, where it had been ubiquitous. Yet he hadn't expected a smidge of it in Polka City. The Cat's Meow. That's what the neon spelled out along with the outline of a feline, in full, luxurious stretch that seemed erotic in nature. To Archer, Polka City was getting more interesting by the minute. He pushed open the red door and walked in. The first thing he noted was the floor, planked and nailed, and slimed with the slop of what they'd been serving here since the place opened, he reckoned. His one shoe stuck a bit, and then so did the other. Archer compensated by picking up the force of his steps. The next thing of note was the crowd, or the size of it anyway. He didn't know the population of the town, but if it had any more people than were in here, it might qualify as a metropolis. The bar nearly ran the length of one wall, and like on the bows of old ships, sculpted into the corner support posts of the bar were the heads of exposed bosoms of women, he supposed loose ones, and every stool had a butt firmly planted on it. Against one wall, fiddling guitar players plucked and strummed, while one gal was singing for all she was worth. She had red curly hair, a pink freckled face, and slim hips with stiff dungarees on over them. Her notes seemed to hit the ceiling so hard they ricocheted off with the force of combat shrapnel. Behind the bar was a wall of shelves holding every type of bottled liquor Archer had ever seen, and then some, by a considerable margin. He reckoned a man could live his whole life here and never grow thirsty, so long as the coin of the realm kept up. Indeed, happening on this place after being behind bars this morning and enduring a long, dusty bus ride, and encountering less than friendly citizens hereabouts, Archer considered he might be in a dream. With three years of probation to endure, he felt like a large fish with a hook in its mouth. He could be yanked back at any moment, and that lent force to a man's whims. Thus he decided to take full advantage while he could. Sidling up to the bar, he wedged in between what seemed a colossus of a farmer, with a rowdy beard and hands the width of Archer's head, and a short, thick, late fifties something, slick haired banker type, in a creamy white three piece suit far nicer than Archer's. He also had a knotted blue and white striped tie, with reptile leather two toned shoes on his feet, a fully realized smirk in his eye, and a woman less than half his age on his arm. Resting on the bar in front of the man was a flat crowned Panama hat with a yellow band of silk. Archer caught the bartender's attention and held up two horizontally stacked fingers and tacked on the words, Bourbon, straight up. The gent, old, spent, and thin as a strand of rope, nodded, retrieved the liquor from the vast stacks, poured it neat into a short glass, and held it out with one hand, while the other presented itself palm up for payment. It was a practiced motion that a man like Archer could appreciate. How much you charging for that? he asked. Fifty cents for two fingers. Take it or leave it, son. What's the bourbon again, Pops? Only one bourbon in these parts, young feller. Rebel yell. Wheat, not rye. You don't like rebel? You best pick another type of alcohol or another part of the state. Give me an answer, because I ain't getting any younger, and I got thirsty folks with folding money want my attention. Rebel sounds fine to me. He passed over the two quarters and settled his elbows on the bar with the short glass cupped in both hands. He hadn't had a drink in a while. He'd banged one back the day before prison, just for good luck, so he reckoned it was a certain symmetry to have one the day he left prison. He was into balance, if nothing else these days, and moderation, too, until it proved inconvenient, 
which it very often did to a man like him. The banker eyed Archer, while his lady ran her tongue over full lips, painted as warm a red as a sky hosting a setting sun. You're not from here, said the banker. His silver hair was cut, combed, and styled with the precision available only to a man who had the dollars and leisure time for such tasks. His face was as flabby as the rest of him, and also tanned and creased with lines in a way that women might or might not find attractive. For such a man, the thickness of his wallet, and not the fitness of his torso, was his main and perhaps only aphrodisiac for the ladies. I know I'm not, replied Archer, sipping the rebel and letting it go down slow, the only way to drink bourbon, or so his granddad had informed him. And not only informed, but demonstrated on more than one occasion. He tipped his hat back, turned around, bony elbows on the bar, his long torso angled off it, and studied the banker, then flitted his gaze to the lady. The banker's smirk broadened. He was reading Archer's mind, no doubt. I like this town, said the banker, and everything in it. He patted the ladies behind, and then his hand remained perched there. She seemed not to mind, or else had grown accustomed to this fondling, or both. As the man's fingers stroked her, she took a moment to powder her nose while looking in a mirror attached to a shiny compact. The lady next shook out a tube of lipstick from her clutch purse and repainted her mouth before once more taking up what looked to be a murky martini, with three fat olives lurking mostly below the surface, like gators in a bog. Been in Poker City long, have you? inquired Archer. Long enough to see what's good and what needs changing, and then changing it. He closed his mouth and eyed Archer from under tilted tufts of eyebrow. You gonna keep me in suspense? said Archer finally. The banker laughed and swallowed some of his whiskey. His eyes flickered just a bit as the drink went down, like wobbly lights in a storm. Archer's mouth eased into a smile at this weakness, but the man didn't seem to notice or care. Poker's growing. This used to be just cattle land and farming. Now that's changing. Business and money coming in. Not too much riffraff. How do you decide about riffraff? See, I might fall into that category. And then where do we go with this happy conversation? The lady laughed at this, but the banker did not. She shut her mouth and sipped her bog. The banker intoned, Fact is, a man can make money here if he's willing to work. With the war over, we have winners and losers. I aim to make certain poker falls on the winner's side of the ledger. See, I was here before the war, trying to make things work. Place was an armpit then. Now the country is rebuilding. Hell, we're putting the bricks and glass back up all over Europe, too. Had that damn Berlin airlift feeding all them folks. Commies taking over in China. That Stalin fella getting half of Europe under his iron thumb and testing them damn nuclear bombs. Now, Truman said we'd all be getting a fair deal here, but I don't take no man's word for that, president or not. Folks are heading west again, making their way to new lives, new fortunes. And in poker, we're sort of at the crossroads of all that, betwixt old America, where most now still live, and new America that lies west of here. People pass through. Some stay. Most keep going because we can't compete with the likes of Los Angeles and Frisco and that gambling haven in Las Vegas. But opportunities still abound here, and I'm well positioned to take advantage of every one of them, and I am, by God. Archer listened to all this, nodding, his mouth twitching back and forth as he processed the man's many words. He said, Saw the fountain with the babies and the geezers playing checkers. Kind of odd sight. The man laughed. Old and the new. Before long, there won't be time for people to be sitting around playing checkers. No water coming out the fountain, though. We've had a drought, the man said. For a long time now. People gonna come to a place where there's no water? Not if your livelihood depends on raising cattle and crops. That's why we're changing our ways. We use the water for drinking and bathing and such, and not cattle and crops. We'll be fine. 
you know how damn much a cow drinks. He laughed. Archer nodded and took another sip of the rebel and let it slide down his throat like lava over fresh dirt. I guess I can see that, he replied. Look, where are you coming in from? A seven-hour slow, dusty bus ride from the east. The banker squinted as he calculated. That's a fair stretch of road, mister. I figure you for a banker type, but I'd like to be sure. Why, you looking to rob me? They all three had a laugh at that, but Archer's died out before the other two had finished guffawing. Archer glanced at the woman, who was doing the tongue-on-lip thing again. She was in her late twenties, with silky dark hair and a Veronica Lake peekaboo. The sheet of hair fell off the side of her head like a waterfall at night, which contrasted sharply with her pale complexion. Archer could smell her scent across the span of the banker's cologne. It was spicy and warm, and tapped something in him that prison had never inspired. She had on a tight, late-day, thunder-blue dress with a wide, deep neckline that revealed things she evidently wanted to reveal, and a black dog-leash belt encircling her small waist. She had on white wrist-length gloves and a matching narrow-brimmed hat with a small bow. Her heels were high enough to muscle her calves. She wore a small necklace with a rock of diamond in the center. She kept fingering it like she wanted to make sure it was still there. Archer slowly drew his gaze away from her. So you came here all those years ago, and the town starts to make something of itself at the same time. Am I to imply a connection? The other man chuckled. I like you. I like how you handle yourself. Man favors a compliment, same as a woman, said Archer, tipping his hat at the lady. Fact is, I've been instrumental in putting Poker City on the map. Got my finger in all the pies worth anything. Saw its potential, you could say. And now that potential is being realized. The man ran his gaze over Archer's long, broad-shouldered, muscular frame. You look like you can handle yourself just fine. Bet you were in the army. I did my bit. About three years without ever seeing America once. Why? A strong and brave man, then, who knows how to survive difficult circumstances. Which means you're just the hombre for me. He took out a wad of cash as big as any fist Archer had ever made in prison or seen coming his way. The man trimmed five twenties off the pile and laid the bills on the bar within easy reach. Archer made no move to pick them up. Well, said the man. Fellow hands out cash like that, something's expected. I'm just waiting on details. The man guffawed again and slapped Archer on the shoulder a bit harder than was necessary. He immediately grimaced and shook out his hand. Damn! You made of rock or what, soldier? Or what, said Archer. I like to pay for potential, and I trust my instincts. Maybe we can do some business. Archer still did not pick up the money. He finished the last finger of his drink and set it down. He said nothing, and neither did the man, for a bit. All around them, gazes flitted to this little group and then away. Maybe it was the money in plain sight. Maybe it was something of a visceral nature between the two men, with the woman hanging on as the lovely sidekick to whatever was going on here. The man took his time removing a cigar from his pocket, efficiently slitting the cellophane band with a switchblade, trimmed the end with the same tool, put the knife away, dropped the cellophane on the bar. The bartender swept it up and then he lit the cigar with a platinum lighter. He puffed luxuriously on the stogie a couple times until it was drawing properly, put the lighter away, and eyed Archer, who had been watching the deliberateness of the man's actions with fascination. The man held up the smoke and said, This here's from Cuba, finest in the world. I like all my things that way. Archer glanced once more at the woman. I can see that. Now to business. You can do a job for me. That money there will be your payment. I'm listening. A man owes me something. I'd like you to collect it for me. What man and what something? His name is Lucas Tuttle. Lives down the roadways. And the something is his Cadillac. Why does he owe that to you? I made him a loan and he failed to repay it. The caddy is the collateral. 
Maybe he forgot. These things happen. The man pointed to the cash. Hundred dollars. Take it or leave it. He tapped his ash free right on the wood grain of the bar. The skinny bartender once more swooped in and cleared the mess with a cloth. Archer snagged an ashtray from in front of the big farmer who was draining highballs at an alarming rate. He placed it right under the fellow's stogie, drawing a sneer from the banker man. Archer said, I have to know some more. Like, how do I know he owes you anything? I go there and take his car, that's stealing. You go to the joint for that in a heartbeat. You understand me? So I need to know if you're giving me a bum steer or what. The man nodded appreciatively. I like a man who's cautious. I'm one myself. He glanced at his lady. Am I not cautious, Jackie? He gave her right buttock a hard squeeze that made her wince a bit, and then removed his hand. The creature named Jackie glanced at Archer, maybe to show she still counted for something here, and then dutifully turned her attention to her man before saying, Cautious as a young woman with a drunken man in close proximity. Her voice was surprisingly husky and assured. It starkly emboldened every fantasy of her Archer was holding. The man perched his cigar in the ashtray and pulled something from his pocket. It was a mess of wrinkled papers. He unfolded and straightened them out, placing them on the bar. On the pages was a swath of tiny printed writing. This is a promissory note for five thousand dollars. See, this is the amount I loaned Tuttle in good faith and everything. Man needed the money, and he came to me. I loaned him the cash from my own pocket. You can see the amount here and his signature there. Now on this page, he flipped through to a second one. This is the security that I required for the loan and which he provided. You read your way right down there. He paused. Hold on. You can read, can't you? Things might not work out between us if you can't. I can read said Archer, with a touch of impatience because he was feeling it. He even did two years of college before the war came calling. He caught the woman's eye on this. She seemed to be calculating him in a new and maybe more favorable light. He ran his eye over the paper. 1947 Cadillac Series 62 sedan painted dark green. And the license plate number is listed. The man pointed to the page. That's right. That's the collateral for the loan that was not repaid. That's what I want you to get for me. Archer scratched his chin. Okay, got a question. Shoot. Nothing personal, but how do I know he didn't repay you? Now you're thinking. I like that. Well, here's how. If the man had paid the loan, this note would be returned to him. The fact that I still got it shows that never happened. Tuttle's a smart man and he'd never have let his money go without getting this in return. See, this is the same as cash money, mister. Same as those five twenties right there. And you see the date the loan was due. He shuffled back to the first page and stabbed at a line with his finger. Right there, you read that. Go on. Archer did so, doing the numbers in his head. That date's exactly two months ago yesterday. That's right. Got me another question. You like your questions, said the man, and Jackie giggled. How come it's two months past due and you don't have the money or the caddy yet? You don't strike me as a man overly full of generosity. The man looked at Jackie. This gent is a keeper, Jackie, I'm telling you. Jackie commenced shooting admiring glances Archer's way and giggled once more. She your wife? asked Archer, though he saw no ring on her. I got me a wife. But she ain't it, said the man offhandedly. Jackie's giggle died in her throat as she glanced, embarrassed, at Archer. She took a sip of her gator bog drink and said, There's no need to be like that. The man glanced at her, a look on his mug that Archer had seen many times before on gents, especially in bars, and one he had never once liked. Did I ask for your opinion, sweet cheeks? Well, no, but... His hand shot out, gripped a wrist, and squeezed. Then keep it to your goddamn self, you hear me? Archer tensed, and was about to jerk the man's hand off her, when he caught a look from Jackie that silently pleaded with him to do no such thing. 
Archer relaxed back against the bar as the fellow gave Jackie's wrist one more grind, then flung her hand away as he drilled her with a look of quiet satisfaction. Just so we understand each other, honey. He turned back to Archer like nothing had just happened. So? Asked Archer expectantly, masking his anger. The truth is I've tried to collect on this debt, only Mr. Tuttle is not amenable to honoring the debt. And how many men have you paid a hundred dollars to try for you? Well, I will concede that you are not the first. The exact number I prefer to keep private. But I will say that Lucas Tuttle is not a man you want to crowd. And suppose I try and fail. Do I keep the money? Depends on the effort expended. I mean, you can't just waltz on down the road and make a feeble attempt at obtaining my collateral and then expect to get the cash, now can you? I don't expect so, no. Then you would be the judge of that? I would be, but I'm a reasonable man. Wouldn't be in business for long if I weren't. And if I failed your expectations, I'd have to give this back? Well, the fact of the matter is, soldier, till you deliver me the car or show me the efforts you undertook to my reasonable satisfaction, you don't walk out of here with that money. I just put it there as what they call an inducement. Supposing I have expenses in gaining back your collateral, how am I to pay for them with nothing up front? You see my problem? What sort of expenses? Till I see the lay of the land and this Mr. Tuttle in particular, how should I know? The man looked warily at Archer then at the money, and then back at Archer. You're the first one to lay out that issue. Well, I'm looking ahead. Maybe I get this done for you. There's more opportunity for me in Poker City, like you said. How much front money are we talking about then? Asked the man warily. I'd say two Jacksons would do amply. The man picked up a pair of bills and handed them to him. I'm placing my faith in you. Now see here, what's your name, soldier? Aloysius Archer. That's a heck of a name. You go by your Christian name, son? Archer shook his head. Too hard to spell and most folks can't pronounce it. I go by Archer. The man put out his hand. I'm Hank. Hank Piddleman. Well, Mr. Piddleman, let me see what I can do. Now, if I get the car for you, doesn't that mean he gets that paper you showed me marked paid? So do I need to take that with me? Piddleman smiled took a long puff on his stogie and shook his head. Oh, no, that's not how this works, Archer. Squinting through the man's wispy curtain of cigar smoke, Archer said, Well, tell me how it does work, then. Like your expenses, how can I know what I'm gonna get for a 1947 Cadillac? I might get 5000 for it, though I sure as hell doubt it. I was crazy in the head for not asking for more collateral. He glanced here at Jackie. Maybe my heart is just too soft. The point is, Archer, even if a miracle happened and I got some poor sucker to fork over five grand for the caddy, the debt still isn't paid in full because there's interest on top. I got to make a profit on my money. You see that, don't you? Money neither is nor should be free. I always like to make a profit off my money, too. He rubbed his fingers over the twenties. Say I sell the caddy for three thousand, then Tuttle still owes me another two thousand plus interest, plus my incidental costs of collection. He tapped the pile of twenties. Like this. Adds up. Mr. Tuttle has dug himself one deep hole. A smile creased Piddleman's face. Hell, I didn't make him take my money, did I? You have his address and directions there? I don't know the area. Piddleman took out a thick pencil and wrote something down on a bar napkin and slid it over to Archer. When do you expect to do this, then? He asked, pocketing the pencil. Soon. What does soon mean? Pretty soon. He put the twenties in his jacket pocket. Piddleman watched this move. Now, so you know, I have technically just made a loan to you though not a scrap of paper has passed between us to legally memorialize that arrangement. But my money has long strings attached, same as Tuttle's, and I demand honesty and integrity in my associates. Expect the same of myself. 
Well, I aim to deliver both, Mr. Piddleman. In response, Piddleman drew the switchblade from his coat pocket once more, sprung it open, and speared the remaining twenties lying there, pinning them to the wood of the bar. The knife quivered there like a pine tree in the wind. I'll hold you to that. Archer didn't even look at the blade or the stabbed twenties. Now where can I reach you most times? Right here at this time will do. Every day except Saturday and the Sabbath. And then you'll be at worship? No. Then I'll be with my dear beloved wife. Piddleman suddenly clutched his head and grimaced in pain. Hey, you okay? Asked Archer, gripping him by the shoulder. Must be all this cheap hooch. Recovered, Piddleman unpinned his knife and thrust it back inside his pocket after closing it. I trust I will hear good news from you, Archer. Archer tipped his hat, first to Jackie and then to Piddleman. I will do my best. For me, you will, you mean. Well, can you see it any other way? Archer headed to the door while most of those at the bar, and Piddleman and Jackie in particular, watched him go. He was no longer shuffling. He was walking upright, springy and brisk, like any free man with serious folding money in his pocket would. Chapter 4 It was five minutes before nine in the morning. The sun was scaling the sky, which was a dazzling blue without a single cloud marring its surface. As Archer stood there on the pavement looking up, he had started to doubt that Cumulus was even allowed here. Then he lowered his gaze and turned it to the Polka City Courts and Municipality Building. Done in the Rococo style and also decidedly on the cheap, the structure was easily big enough for the unwieldy name chiseled across its imitation stone front that was bracketed by false spindle turrets and its middle filled in with even more curious architectural elements. It looked to Archer like it had been dropped from a fairy tale into their midst. A castle without a king or queen. He wondered what they'd done with the moat. Archer spat on his hand and wiped it through his hair before replacing his hat there. He had sink-washed his shirt, undershorts, and socks the night before, letting the breeze dry them fine. His worn and dusty Oxfords had been spit-polished. He'd even found an iron at the hotel, and for a nickel's worth of rental time had done the best he could on his suit and shirt. He'd even given his slender tie a few passes. He'd stopped by a barber shop and splurged for a shave overseen by a tiny wrinkled black man with no teeth, who wielded his strap and razor like a musketeer. His jaw and chin had never been this smooth since he'd dropped from the womb. He was as smart-looking as he was ever likely to be, he figured. The lobby had marble floor tiles and swirls of emerald green and fat columns holding up a ceiling with murals depicting things close to the musical infant stuck in the fountain, just with more color and poorer taste. He quickly found the proper department, emblazoned as it was on a black-backed directory, in a lobby that was full of strays looking for direction, as he was. The elevator was a grill door operation, which Archer still did not cotton to. So he walked two floors up and headed down the hall, counting office numbers as he went. He neared the sheriff's haunts, and also that of the tax revenue bureau. A uniformed man in his fifties came out of the former's door as he passed by and gave Archer the once-over. He had on a big Stetson hat, a Colt long-barreled revolver in a waist holster, and sported a gut that one would see coming around the corner before one did its owner. Pinned to his broad chest was a shiny pointed star. Where are you headed, son? Parole office, said Archer. The man's eyes gleamed with condescension. Carterock? Archer nodded, fingering his hat. Ernestine Crabtree's the parole officer, said the man. That's what my paper says. She's a damn fine-looking woman. The man tongued his lips, and his eyes tightened and his nostrils flared. Damn fine. Okay, said Archer. But she don't mess with your kind, son. I'm not looking to mess with anyone, least of all my parole officer. She likes men with badges, he said, pointing to his own. You tell her Deputy Sheriff Willie Free says hello. Will do, Sheriff Free. Archer watched the man saunter down the hall before he turned and walked on. 
The door was half-frosted glass above, transom over that, stained and scraped pine down below. Engraved across the glass was Parole Office, Ernestine J. Crabtree. Archer drew a calming breath and wondered what the next few minutes would hold for him. He gripped the knob and pushed the door open. The room inside was small, varnished parquetry floor, walls painted white, whirly fan going above, the smell of cigarette smoke enticingly lingered, as did a trail of its vapor in the air. Well, this place had the bus beat by a mile just on the tobacco issue, he thought. There was a hat tree in the corner from which dangled a woman's trim green pillbox hat. He closed the door behind him, glanced down at the floor and saw the piece of folded paper that apparently had been slipped under the door. He bent down and picked it up. He read the words on the page. They were crude and mostly misspelled, and they were all of a sexual and violent nature directed at Ernestine Crabtree. Archer's mouth curled in disgust as he scrunched up the paper and put it in his pocket. A plain wooden desk sat in the middle of the room. A straight-backed chair not built for comfort was lined up behind it and perched in the knee hole and a weighty and ponderous dull gray royal typewriter dominated the top of the desk with a pre-printed form wound into it. A pulled-out leaf was on the left side of the desk and had several files on it. A blue fountain pen lay in its cradle, its brass nib sparkling from the overhead light. Archer ducked down to take a look at the page in progress. It looked official, and the typed comments on another poor parolee soul held phrases like, Unacceptable attitude overly aggressive, and devious. He looked for the name of the person she was reporting about, but it must have been on another page. A fat black phone sat to the right of the typewriter, its cords snaking into the knee hole. Next to the phone was a speckled glass ashtray, with a spent, unfiltered butt lingering and a chrome lighter parallel to it. He twirled his hat and waited, until the clock on the wall overhead hit 9 a.m., the door he'd come through opened, and there stood, apparently, Miss Ernestine J. Crabtree. His first thought was she looked nothing like her name. His second impression was the name did her justice just fine. She was around his age, more or less, and tall for a woman, about five-eight barefoot, he estimated. She wore a black skirt that stopped below the knee and was flared out by a petticoat underneath that widened her hips, and a white blouse with ruffles down the front and a schoolmarm Peter Pan collar. Despite the fullness of the skirt, he could gauge her figure, which was shapely, perhaps more than that now that he thought about it. She had on flesh-colored stockings, and no doubt the seams would be lined up perfectly in back, and grim, low-heeled pumps. Her blonde hair was done up in so tight a bun that it pulled at her face. Her chin was sharply defined, the cheeks nicely formed and riding high, the lips full with not a trace of lipstick, which he'd already figured on because there'd been none on the cigarette end. Behind black shell glasses, her eyes were blue and wide, the irises plump, but the overall effect being what he thought some might call vivacious. At least they held the potential if she let her hair down, in more ways than one. All in all, quite a looker, he concluded. And then he thought about the sick note residing in his pocket, and he stopped thinking about the woman in that way. Her countenance did fit her name, he concluded. It was a slab of granite with nothing behind it. The baby blue eyes, now that he studied them again, seemed bound to the surface of the fleshy sockets only. It was a cold and untrusting face peering back at him. You are Mr. Archer? she said, coming forward after shutting the door. Yes, ma'am, I am. I am Ernestine Crabtree. I figured from the name on the door. He put out his hand. Been here a couple of minutes. She did not return the gesture. Then you're two minutes early. I guess my watch has the runs. The granite only deepened a notch at his poor joke. Let's get down to it then, she said sharply. She motioned to a chair set against the wall. Pull that up across from the desk, she commanded, as she sat down in front of the typewriter, her back straight as a two-by-four. She spun out the page in there and rolled in a fresh sheet with a few firm cranks of the wheel as he sat down across from her, his legs splayed wide, his hat dangling in one hand. Full name? 
Aloysius Archer. Middle name? Never had one. Really? She said incredulously. I think they believed one name was good enough, and certainly Aloysius might under some circumstances be quite as good as two names. She stared at him for a long moment with what he thought were lips fighting to become a smile. In the end, the granite won out. She asked for more personal information, which he readily gave, and that Crabtree promptly typed on the form. You have your parole papers? He presented the pages, and she dutifully looked over them. I trust you have studied your list of do's and don'ts? Yes, ma'am. And you have adhered to these instructions since leaving prison? Yes, ma'am. No drinking, no carousing? And no women, loose or otherwise. She looked up from the papers. I think you're taking this matter far too frivolously, Mr. Archer. This is a serious business. I can guarantee you that I'm giving it a lot of weight, ma'am. I don't want to go back to prison. That life is not for me. It was worse than fighting in the war. And that's saying something. The granite receded a bit, as she seemed pleased by his candid admission. That's the proper attitude. She used a rubber stamp to imprint the seal of her office across the top of the first page, and placed her initials and the date on a line provided by the stamp, and passed the pages back to him. A fellow I met in the hall asked me to say hello to you, he said. She glanced up at him. What fellow? Willie Free. He's with the law. Archer watched closely for her reaction. She did not smile. Instead, the woman grimaced. That told him a lot. Maybe that he had already suspected, from the way Free had looked and talked about her. She cleared her throat. I have some job interviews for you to go on. Gainful employment is absolutely vital to achieving your goal of never returning to prison. Thing is, I already have a job. Her fingers paused over the drawer she was about to open. Excuse me? I had an interview with a gent last night. He hired me. To do what, exactly? Man's in the business of loaning money. He hired me to collect a debt he's owed. This is highly irregular. I'm not sure. He pulled the two twenties from his pocket and held the bills up. He already gave me an advance. She eyed the cash, her eyes widening a bit. That's a lot of money just for an advance. What do you get when you complete the job? Another sixty dollars. A moment of silence passed as Archer slowly put the money away. When he looked up, the woman seemed to be appraising him in a different light. All right, but if that position does not work out, you'll be required to go on three job interviews in the next week and have gainful employment by that time. There's plenty of work here if you apply yourself. Fine, but let's hope it doesn't come to that. You'll need to report in once a week for the next two months. If your progress is satisfactory, the visits can fall back to once a month, though I can perform spot checks on you at my discretion. I'm in room 610 at the Derby Hotel. You're welcome any time. Her frown deepened. I'm readily aware that you're staying at the Derby Hotel, as that is where all parolees go initially. But I will not be visiting you in your room there. This is a professional relationship. I'm sure you can appreciate that. Sorry, ma'am. No offense. And I do appreciate that. When you do change your place of residence, you are required to immediately notify me of same. Do you understand? You'll be the first to know. I need you to sign this form evidencing that you were here today. I'll place it in your file and communicate the fact of your attendance to the proper authorities. And I'll see you in a week's time. She held up the pen. Right. He stood, came around to her side of the desk, took the pen, and signed the document. He took a moment to breathe in her scent, which frankly intrigued him far more than Jackie's had the prior night. Then he thought of the misspelled note, and the repulsive comments, and the cocksure manner of Deputy Sheriff Willie Free, and he quickly straightened and laid down the pen. Um, you can't spare a smoke, can you? he asked. She glanced at the ashtray and appeared to bristle a bit. No, I can't. It's against the rules for me to provide that sort of thing to parolees under my jurisdiction. It could be viewed as improper. That's okay. Someone told me they were bad for you anyway. She gave him a condescending look. Really, Mr. Archer, I highly doubt that if cigarettes were really bad for you, the companies making them would continue to do so. Well, I guess that's the difference in our thinking. 
She looked startled again by his words. How do you mean? My way of looking at the world is that some folks do what they want, and they don't care what happens to others, so long as it's good for them. I try to be more optimistic. He twirled his hat between his fingers. See you in a week, Miss Crabtree. She returned to her typing and started clacking away. He walked to the door and looked back in time to see her watching him. Hope you're saying good things about me. Goodbye, Mr. Archer. She immediately went back to her typing. As Archer was coming down the front steps of the courts and municipality building, he saw on the street someone he recognized. Archer would have kept walking, but the man saw him too. Archer, by God! Tell me it ain't you and I still won't believe it. What a damn sight for sore eyes. So you're out then? The speaker was short and reedy, with a neck too long for his body, and an Adam's apple the size of a ripe peach. He was in his late forties, and his hair was graying rapidly and thinning even faster. His sideburns were long and curled inward at the bottom. Physically unimposing, he still seemed to take up more space on earth than his stature warranted. Dickie Dill, said Archer, reluctantly coming over to him. Never expected to see your mug again. Dill put out a thin hand with fingers like little scythe blades. Archer had seen those same hands wrap around the neck of a fellow inmate who was three times Dill's size and come close to strangling the life out of him. It took four guards to pull the little man off the far larger one. After that, prisoners and guards at Carter Rock Prison let Dickie Dill be. Archer had thankfully never had a beef with the man. But there was something about Dill that just struck him as peculiar enough to be avoided if possible. The men shook hands. Hellfire, boy! I think we all come through Polka. Been here three months now. Ain't too bad. Yeah. Wondered what happened to you. Got me out and I'll be staying out this time. Third time's the charm, they say. I'll kill a man to keep from going back if I have to. He cracked his knuckles and gave Archer a look that made him conclude that Dickie Dill, ever not being behind bars, was not a good thing for the rest of humanity. He wore faded dungarees and what looked to be a homespun shirt tucked in with dusty brogans on his feet. His belt was a length of braided rope, and his old pork pie hat was creased, worn, and stained. The few teeth he had were displayed in a perpetual snarl. You checking in with Miss Crabtree, were you? asked Dill, eyeing the building behind them. I was in there not more than half hour ago. She is a looker, all right, but a cold fish. Gal needs a man to warm her up. Archer briefly wondered if Dill was the subject of the comments on the page in the typewriter. He could see all of them fairly applying. He put his hand in his pocket and felt the balled up note. And was Dill also the author of that? Archer could see that being the case, too particularly given the violence and misspellings. Just finished up. A woman as a parole officer? What's her story, anyway? Ain't you never heard of Carson Crabtree? Doesn't ring any bells. Guess he's related? Her daddy! Okay. Everybody's got a daddy. Yeah, but Carson Crabtree done killed three people down in Texas. Oh, been more than a dozen years gone by now. Archer processed this. Three people? What for? Man was just mean. They electrocuted his ass. Being mean doesn't sound like enough reason to murder three people. Bill thumped his thumb against his temple. Touched in the head, more like. You know, crazy, I suppose. To kill a man, you got to be. Or else he done you a wrong and you're just settling matters. Not a damn thing wrong with that. And I got experience that way. Not sure the law would agree with that, Dickie. That's your goddamn problem, Archer. You think rules is all there is. More or less what the army taught me. Hellfire, boy. You ain't in uniform no more. Live life and kick you some ass now and then. Archer looked thoughtful as he glanced back at the steps he'd just come down. Maybe Miss Crabtree is overcompensating then. He said this more to himself than Dill. Come again, said Dill eyes twitching, and his sideburns doing the same. What's that mean? Her father was a criminal, so now she's working to help other criminals turn away from their bad ways. Oh, right, I see. 
Hey, I'm thinking about maybe having a go at her. Like I said, Gal needs a man to tell her what's what. Archer emphatically shook his head. You do not want to do that, Dickie. Trust me. Why not? I think she might cotton to me after a while. You do anything? Touch one hair on her head? Say one word out of line? And they'll send your butt right back to Carterock. And you won't be getting out ever. Dill eyed him funny. But there was alarm in the man's eyes, too. You sure about that? Damn sure, Dickie. Don't try it. Promise me now. I'm looking out for you. Oh, all right, then, I promise. Thanks for the advice, Archer. You working? Yeah, got me a job at the slaughterhouse. Would be there already, except I had my talk with Miss Crabtree and then lined my belly over at a diner. Truck's gonna take me out now. What's it you do there? Dill grinned ferociously. Kill the dang hogs! How do you do that? Smack him in the head with a sledgehammer. He pointed to a spot on his own skull. Right about here. They don't feel no pain. Unless I don't kill him with the first pop. I tried to, though. Hell, man, you know how much pork this here country eats? Never gave it a minute's thought. A lot. Bacon and sausage and something called cutlets. Me, I can't stomach it. I'm up to my ass in blood and hog brains all day long. Gets to you after a while. But it pays good. Got dollars in my pocket. Got three other ex-cons from Carterock working there. Miss Crabtree's suggestion? Yep, got the job same day. They need skull crushers. I don't mind it. I mean, somebody's got to do it. If you want your bacon, right? Where are you living? Little room over the mercantile on the west side of town. Bath and shower down the hall. Dollar a day. You? The Derby. But I'll be moving, I expect. Yeah, I started out there, too. Guess we all do. But then I moved on. Can't afford the damn derby. You working yet? Archer hesitated. Looking around. You know a man named of Hank Piddleman? Piddleman? Yeah, I heard of him. He's some big wheel around town. Saw him coming out of a place called the Cat's Meow last night, and we struck up a conversation. Dill's face scrunched up like a frostbit flower. You listen up, Archer. Don't you go near that place. Well, I know we're not supposed to. No. What I mean is they check for our kind there, boy. Come again? They got what you call plants in there. They look for ex-cons breaking parole there. It's a temptation like send your ass right back to prison in a heartbeat. Same as you just now told me if I messed with Ernestine Crabtree. Archer's features remained inscrutable. Is that right? Well, thanks for the warning. Won't catch me in there. Yet Archer wondered if he already had been caught. But then wouldn't Crabtree have mentioned it? Sure thing. Hey, maybe we ought to get together sometime. Archer shook his head. No can do, Dickie. Huh, why's that? Rule number two. Come again? Rule number two on our parole list. You can't be hanging around with other ex-cons. Didn't you read the papers? Dill looked chagrined. Well, reading ain't never been my strong suit, boy. They had a book depository at Carterock. Book depository? What's that, then? Like a library. Ain't nobody told me about that. But then again, I don't much like books. Archer nodded. Well, good luck, he said, without any enthusiasm. He left Dill there and walked off into the sunshine with $40 in his pocket and the rest of the day to figure out. Chapter 5 Polka City had a reasonable number of distractions fraught with legal and other peril. However, Archer managed to avoid them all that day. He wasn't sure about the next day, though. His natural defenses did have their limits. And when he was presented squarely with choices of right and wrong, Archer could be reasonably counted on to miss the angel's cue about 20% of the time on a good day. But then again, he had been truthful with Ernestine Crabtree. He did not want to return to prison. He mostly walked the pavements, halting to eat a ham and cheese sandwich for his lunch outside while sitting on a turned-over box, and later an ice cream cone bought from a uniformed good-humor man perched in his blue-and-white truck. They jawed about matters both important and frivolous. 
He looked for but never saw Miss Ernestine Crabtree with the murderous father, though he kept a constant sight line on the court building. He thought she might come out to enjoy the sunshine and perhaps smoke one or two, but that never happened. He didn't know why he wanted this. He was not going to have anything other than a professional relationship with the woman, but the note he'd found and the lawman's leer and Dill's telling him about the woman's violent past made him curious about her. His spending spree had cost him all of fifty cents, with the twin Jacksons lying in the depths of his pocket undiminished. He managed to scrounge a cigarette off a passing stranger, and he sat on a bench near the town square, taking his time whittling it down and watching all who passed by in front of him. There was prosperity in the air, commingling with those clearly in economic despair. But those on that woeful side of the equation would no doubt work hard to get to the other side with all due speed rising to the mountaintop to look down on others scrambling madly for their piece of the pie. And that, to Archer, was the fledgling American dream in a nutshell, particularly after a war that had knocked the stuffing out of just about everyone. Archer had good reason to soak in as much of Polka City as he possibly could. This would be his home, at least for the foreseeable future, and he had made friendly with as many folks as he could on his walking tour, at the same time foraging for information to the extent he could without raising their suspicions. He had learned that some had short fuses, and he was not looking to make enemies of any sort. Like Dill, many had heard of Mr. Hank Pittleman, though the opinions of these folks varied greatly. He was either a devil or a benefactor, with not one commentator occupying the middle ground. Archer took in all this with a grain of salt and let it marinate as he smoked. Many had also heard of Lucas Tuttle. He was described as a farmer of fierce devotion to the soil and a provocateur of skilled debate. He was also a seasoned hunter, as comfortable with firearms as he was skewering with his impressive vocabulary and agile wits those who did not align with his points of view on myriad subjects. These ranged from local crop rotation theories to the efficacy of the Marshall Plan to the question of the gold standard versus all other benchmarks. A curious combination, and perhaps the earmarks of a formidable person from whom to collect a debt. This was possibly why all efforts heretofore employed by Mr. Piddleman had suffered failure in their execution, with perhaps the stark execution of the poor debt collector having followed. On this very point, Archer said to one man, wearing an aged Hoover collar, a greasy felt hat, and an intense expression, Tell me something. Has this man Tuttle ever killed anybody in a dispute? Well, said the fellow, his teeth gnawing at his top lip. If he has, it never reached a court of law, and that's a fact, for I am a member of the local bar and would be in a position to know of such. Would you reasonably expect that it would have reached a court of law? Archer had persisted. I would expect that in Polka City all results are possible, except for consistent rain and politicians who keep their promises. And a man with influence can achieve things unavailable to the rabble. I trust you recognize the both of us as part of that unfortunate clan, mister. Archer could not doubt that the man spoke the bold truth. After his smoke, Archer flicked a shard of tobacco off his tongue, made a decision, rose, and set out to the west at a steady pace his long legs energetically eating up distance. He wanted to explore new territory. It was in his blood. After he'd gotten out of the army, someone had asked him if he was good, bad, or indifferent to having once been a person fighting a world war, now consigned to a normal existence. Archer had answered that he was all of those things, or could be, depending on the opportunity. You mean the circumstance? The man had corrected. No, I think I got it right the first time. Archer had recorrected. And his thinking in Polka City had not been changed by recent events. It led him to march out to the road he'd taken the prison stop bus in on and lift his thumb to the sky. In the army, he'd often served as a scout, going ahead to see where the enemy might be and what sort of killing assets they might have. It was rough going and dangerous because he often found himself behind enemy lines outnumbered forty to one. But in his opinion, it was always better to know than not know. 
which was why he was standing on a dusty road with a cloudless sky overhead and his thumb pointed to heaven. Or at least, in the kingdom's vicinity. Archer never seemed to know the exact location of God, because the fellow never seemed to stay still long enough to allow Archer to make his acquaintance. The bean-pole, ginger-haired farmer in the truck who stopped to pick him up made no inquiries other than to ask where Archer was headed. He told him, the man nodded, pointed to the rear, shifted his gears, and they set off. Archer rode in the back with a bale of hay and a baby goat curled up asleep on a pile of rags. The air remained intensely dry. Archer had it on good authority from at least a half dozen folks in town that Polka City saw rain about as often as one viewed a rich man in a soup line. You telling me it never rains here? He'd asked one bright-eyed citizen. No, it does. But if you're asleep when it commences, there might not be any evidence of it remaining the next morning when you wake up and make inquiries. But don't they grow crops here? Absolutely, the same gent had volunteered. But just the kind that fertilizes itself on wind and dust, of which we have an abundance. The ride took nearly an hour, and as soon as he bid the farmer, the hail bay, and the still sleeping baby goat adieu, Archer wondered how he was going to get back. But like most things, he decided he would tackle that when the time came and not before. He was a man who lived each moment as though it would surely be his last. War just did that to you. And prison had piled on that notion, forcing it bone deep into Archer. He figured he would never be free of it now. He eyed the name on the mailbox that leaned toward the road, like it was giving an edge to the postman coming. L. Tuttle. The farm stretched as far as Archer could see. He didn't know if that qualified it as a big farm or not. He was not versed in such matters. He'd grown up far from here, in a home of glass, brick, and vertical quality. Grass had not been included in the deal. There was not a cow that he knew of within twenty miles of his birthplace. Here, though, the bovines were everywhere, dotting the land like a foraging army bivouacked for a stretch till the time for fighting would come along. He saw the gravel road that led out of sight and figured the home of L. Tuttle would be just along that way. He eyed the sky, and the sun told him it was now nearer to four than three. He checked his watch, although he trusted the sky more than he did his wind-up. He saw dust kicking up in the distance, either a tornado or a tractor working away. As he squinted, Archer could make out it was the latter. He took off his hat, slapped it against his pants leg to dispel the dust that clung to every bit of him, and headed up the road. He'd been right. The one road branched off like the sweep of a river to three o'clock, and a quarter mile down this fork he saw the house and the outbuildings. It occurred to him that Tuttle was a prosperous man, which made the matter of the debt more problematic, at least in his mind. But a promissory note signed, with collateral laid against it, was a serious thing he was finding. While perhaps some would see it as a small issue, the fact was, if debts remained unpaid, whatever followed would genuinely be the collapse of civilization as any of them would know it, Archer included. And he and millions of others had just fought a world war to ensure that neither anarchy, nor fascism, nor anything else would replace the reasonable screwing over of people without money by those who possessed damn near all of it. Archer had come back from the war feeling lucky to be alive. He had not come back to seek a fortune. He wanted his share, to be sure, but it constituted a small ambition and would not move mountains or deprive others of theirs. He had undertaken a years-long small detour due to a profound lack of judgment over a concern that he had no sooner deemed of little importance when it rose up and smote him with the power of a king and his legions crossing the Rubicon. And that mistake had caused his ass to be dragged right to Carterock Prison. His two years of college had included readings in ancient history. He didn't know that material would have applied so readily to him in the year 1949. He picked up his pace as he went in search of Lucas Tuttle. He had a plan. Whether it would work or not was anyone's guess. But something tickled at the back of his head, same as when he was a scout looking first for Italians and later for Germans. He had found the Italians the far easier of the pair. They didn't really want to fight, he reckoned, because every time he'd run into some, they were either drunk or eating their dinner. 
He wasn't surprised they'd turned on Mussolini and stuck his head up on a pike. They probably wanted to simply get back to their pasta and bottles of wine and their women. The Germans, on the other hand, seemed to like killing about as much as Dickie Dill liked strangling folks or smashing hogs in the head just so till they died. Archer had never ventured to the Pacific Theater, but he'd heard the Japanese were worse than the Germans. As he drew closer, he saw that the house was a large, neat one-story, made of stained plank siding, with quarry stone chimneys, plenty of windows, and a wide porch on which sat two rocking chairs. The thing looked well-built, trim and tight as a drum. He supposed there was no dust inside. He rapped on the single door with his knuckles. He could hear the footsteps coming. Something was about to happen, and you couldn't ask more from life than that. Chapter 6 The front door swung wide open in an inviting way, until the twin barrels of the Remington 12-gauge over-under greeted Archer. They were aimed at his belly, and he could see no easy way around that. He looked at the fellow holding the advantage on him, he was around fifty-five, with about as interesting a face as Archer had ever beheld. The large head was topped by a great crown of white hair that toppled downward like a snow avalanche off a mountaintop. The tanned brow was thickly furrowed, and the chin was a V of bone, while the jutting jaw seemed a flesh-and-blood version of the over-under's muzzle. But what really caught his attention were the green eyes hovering in stark contrast to the tumble of white hair. They occupied their sockets with the intensity of twin machine guns in a bunker. The impression was mesmerizing and appalling to Archer all at the same time. Can I help you, mister? The man said politely, belying the ominous threat held in his hands. Are you Mr. Lucas Tuttle? What do you want, pray tell? His benign look hardened several notches. The eyes now seemed an emerald fire. And you might, indeed, want to start praying, son. Well, right now, all I want is some separation from me and that Remington. Oh, no, that may well be premature. State your business, or your belly will grow quite familiar with the intrinsic purpose of this firearm. I was hired by Hank Pittleman to come here and relieve you of your 1947 dark green Cadillac sedan. The machine gun eyes narrowed a bit. You're not endearing yourself to me, stranger. You seem like a fine young man, though a bit rough around the edges. It would be a shame to end things for you right here and now. I had determined to come out here at night when you were asleep and see if I could take back your Cadillac without you knowing. But then I decided to approach the matter on a more direct footing. The muzzle lowered to a part of Archer's anatomy that was even more precious to him than his stomach. To answer your query, I am. Lucas Tuttle, sir. Now explain yourself further, but you best tell me your full legal name first. That way it can go on the tombstone properly. Aloysius Archer, but just call me Archer. Tuttle looked him up and down with a practiced stare. You're the right age, and you look like a tough cookie for sure. Did you serve, Archer? Did you do your patriotic duty? Archer thought this an odd departure, but if it kept the man's mind off the Remington? I did my bit. Over three years in Europe. Who under? For most of the war, the Fifth Army, General Mark Clark. I was part of Second Corps, 34th Infantry Division. That was the Mediterranean Theater, was it not? Yes, sir. Salerno, Bologna, Genoa, Milan, the Barbara, Volturno and Gustav Lines, Anzio Beach. Names I couldn't say before, and places I never thought I'd be, and I truly have no desire to go back. That was some fierce fighting, I understand. You could say. The Fifth had over a hundred thousand casualties when all was said and done. Lost a lot of good men and good friends. Were you wounded, Archer, fighting? Most everybody was wounded, Mr. Tuttle, and I was no exception. Your medals, sir. Did you distinguish yourself? Be detailed. Now Archer's features set firm, like cement going from fluid to hard. I killed folks I didn't know, 
because they were trying to kill me. I left the army with metal inside me I didn't start out life with. I got a box of medals and ribbons somewhere, and they don't amount to a hill of beans now. That's my piece, so you can just pull the damn trigger if you got to and be done with it. The muzzle dropped a shade lower, but then held on Archer's knees. I like your spirit, Archer. What I do not understand is your alliance with that scoundrel Piddleman. I needed a job, and he gave me one. A hundred dollars if I deliver the Cadillac to him. He advanced me forty dollars with the rest to come on him getting that car. He sent others before you. That I've heard. They came at night. They did not wish to face me. Archer eyed the over-under. I can see why they might have done it that way. Trespassing is a crime hereabouts, as it should be in every democratic union that holds property rights as sacred. Thus I furnished them exactly what they deserved. Okay. I'm one who doesn't think property is worth a man's life, but that may just be me. The emerald eyes blazed at this comment. However you, sir, show up in broad daylight and knock on my door and admit your mission to my face. Explain yourself. Pretty simple. I wanted you to tell me to my face whether you owe that debt or not. Why is that important to you? Well, if you don't owe it, I have no further business here. And if I do owe the debt? Archer said nothing. Tuttle appraised him, running his gaze from the top of the hat to the heels of the shoes. Come on inside, Archer, and let's talk. He moved aside so Archer could enter, and led him down a long, tiled hallway to a small, plainly furnished room with wood paneling and a plank floor with a colorful rug laid over it. Sit down over there, he said, motioning with his shotgun to a chair. Tuttle took the chair opposite, his shotgun muzzle pointed to the floor. I borrowed the money from Hank Piddleman. I had need to do so at the time. Do you owe the man five thousand dollars plus interest? Yes, and it's also true that I gave my 1947 Cadillac as collateral for that loan. Why'd you do that? Seems like you have a good deal of prosperity going on here. Prosperity sometimes does not equal folding money, Archer. And my suppliers do not barter in wishful thinking. So you owe the debt but won't pay it back? Do you think life is that simple? Life has never struck me as being simple unless you're determined to make it so. Peddleman has stolen from me. That is why I have not repaid the money. What's he taken from you? Something far more precious than the sum of five thousand dollars. Can you be more specific? He has taken my daughter. That was a new one on Archer, and his face showed it to be so. How's that exactly? He has convinced my beautiful daughter that she should no longer be a part of her father's life. She has fallen in with his evil and sick ways. For all of her life, I saw her sweet face every day. Now I have not seen her for over a year. How do you do that? By giving her things, Archer, by turning her head with materialistic offers, by introducing her to the shallow pleasures of his hedonistic lifestyle. And he treats her roughly, or so I've been told. What's her name? Archer asked, though he was reasonably confident of the answer. Jackie. I've met her. Indeed? And she was no doubt in the company of this heathen. And you won't pay back the debt because he's turned your daughter against you? You said before that property is not worth a man's life. Well, why is a debt, though legally owed, more important than a father's love for his daughter? And you said you hadn't seen her for over a year? That is so. Well, why not try talking to her? I can't, Archer. She refuses to see me. Why? That is my business. When I saw her, she didn't act like she was being held against her will. And you're talking to a man who has seen that up close and personal. Tuttle shook his head dismissively at this comment. He has her trapped in a prison of the mind's making archer, far stronger than steel bars with no predetermined release date and no judge to whom to appeal. Archer rubbed his chin, thinking about his sixty dollars. Just to be clear. You have the money for the repayment? I have, 
but not one penny will the man receive so long as my daughter remains absent from her home. I can only imagine the ways in which she has defiled her. Archer glanced at the Remington. I have to say I'm kind of surprised you haven't taken out your anger on him directly. And with what result, Archer? Do you think me a simpleton? You want to explain that? If I were to shoot that foul being, my freedom would be forfeited, if not my life. And if I did not succeed in killing him, he would sue me for all I have. Then he would have not only my Jackie, but all my worldly possessions and the land that my father and his father before him have built into a tidy industry. Indeed, in the depths of my mind, I think it no coincidence that he has seduced my daughter in such a manner in the hopes that I would attempt to take out any murderous intentions I might have, just so he could confiscate it all. You're saying he planned all this? Archer said skeptically. To me, the connection is as inevitable as the eastern rise of the sun on the rotation of the Earth's axis. I understand from Mr. Piddleman that he's currently married. That is indeed the case. And his wife has no issue with her husband being with your daughter? I think Marjorie Piddleman takes great issue, but her options are limited, seeing that he controls the purse strings. Hank Piddleman does seem to be the controlling type. And he does have a lot of money, apparently. That'll raise the over-under to its original position. So what are your current intentions? Seems to me there's only one solution. What's that, I wonder, Archer? If I can get your daughter to leave Piddleman, will you repay the loan? And exactly how do you propose to do that? You'll have to let me work through it. And then you'll be able to collect your commission. About that. Got a question. I'm listening, Archer. What's it worth to you to have your daughter away from this man? Tuttle's features turned a shade darker, and the pair of green eyes flamed with phosphorus intensity. You would charge money to a father to free his daughter of an abomination? Archer sat forward and twirled his hat. Look at it my way. From what you're telling me, Piddleman is not a man of his word. Now, suppose I get the loan repaid. Why do I think the forty dollars in my pocket will be the last cash I ever see from him? Don't get me wrong. I don't mind doing the right thing for the right thing's sake. Hell, I did that over in Italy and Germany. But a man has to eat, and he has to have a roof over his head. You see my point? Tuttle's finger danced over the trigger of the Remington. How much, then? Let's make it sixty dollars. That way I'll be made whole in case Piddleman doesn't come through. I think that's fair and square. But if he does come through, do I get a refund of my contribution to your economic stability? Archer rubbed at his cheek and glanced at the Remington. Well, that would come under the title of risk, Mr. Tuttle. And a man has to be fairly compensated for accepting it. So no refund, then? Honestly? No, sir. I'll give you three days. Then I'll come looking for Piddleman and you. I'll be sure to hold you to that, sir. It was an unexpected reply that made Tuttle fully lower his shotgun. Desiree here will show you out, Archer. Archer turned to see a woman standing there, as Tuttle passed by them both and disappeared down the hall. Desiree was in her forties, medium height, bland, brown hair with black framed specks over dull eyes, but her facial features were etched in stone, and she had an air of efficiency about her. She was dressed in a quiet gray jacket and skirt, and black pumps with heels sharp enough to pierce his skull. A small string of fake pearls lay against her light blue blouse. Mr. Archer, she said, putting out a hand. He rose and shook it. This way, sir. As they walked along, Archer said, So what is it that you do here, ma'am? I assist Mr. Tuttle as his secretary. He seems like a real sweetheart when he's not pointing his shotgun at my privates. It pays well, and it requires little interaction with anything other than my typewriter. You know Jackie Tuttle? I knew her when she was here, yes. I met her in town last night. She was with Hank Piddleman. The eyes behind the lenses swelled a bit. I expect she was. Mr. Tuttle wants her back. 
He doesn't want her with Piddleman. I am well aware of that. I bet you are. So if you don't mind my asking, why'd she leave home? I do mind you asking. Well, to explain things, Mr. Tuttle wants me to convince Jackie to leave Piddleman. If I knew a little more about the situation, I might be able to accomplish that. Desiree stopped and looked up at him. And bring her back here? I never said I would bring her back here. I just said I'd try to get her to leave Piddleman. I mean, he's married and all anyway. Doesn't seem right. How refreshingly moral of you, Mr. Archer. You can drop the mister. I'm just Archer. All right, Archer. I appreciate your honesty and frankness. The fact is, Jackie never told me why she was leaving, though it was around the time her mother died. What was her name? Isabel. Pretty name. What's that, Spanish? She was from Brazil. Mr. Tuttle traveled there for business when he was younger, and they met. They married and came back here, where they had Miss Tuttle. Was Isabel sick? Is that how she died? No, she died in an accident. Sorry to hear that. What kind of accident? It was just a horrible, horrible accident. I'll leave it at that. Was she and Jackie close? Isabel adored her daughter, and that adoration was returned. Maybe that's why she left, because she was so heartbroken about her mother. Desiree looked at him funny and said, I'm sure that was part of it. She hesitated. Would you like to see a picture of Isabel? Sure. Desiree led him down another hall and opened a door into a large and comfortable sitting room with several oval windows that looked out onto the stark fields behind the house. Archer took it all in. Big, solid furniture. Colorful rug on the Spanish tile floor. Paintings on the wall depicting countryside and wildlife. And a stone fireplace that rose to the ceiling. A mantle of petrified wood fronted the stone with a framed photo on it. Mr. Tuttle sure has nice things, he noted. He's had his ups and downs, but now things are looking up. Archer didn't think the woman sounded too happy about that. This is Isabel. Desiree had lifted the framed photo off the mantel and held it out to him. Archer gripped the frame and stared at the woman in the snapshot. She was dark-haired and olive-skinned, and Archer could not remember seeing a lovelier countenance. It wasn't just the beautiful features. It was the spark of life in the eyes that made his own pair seem dull and unresponsive by comparison. So she died about a year ago? That's when Mr. Tuttle said Jackie had left home. Yes, that's right. She took the photo from him and replaced it on the mantle. Twirling his hat, Archer said, Why'd you really bring me in here and show me that picture? I just thought you'd like to see Miss Tuttle's mother. Okay, said Archer, and I'm Harry Truman. She looked him up and down. I thought Truman was older and shorter. He fiddled with his hat some more. What do you think about Mr. Tuttle wanting her to come back home? I haven't thought about it. And if you did? She's a grown woman. She should be able to make her own decisions. What sort of accident, again? I told you that I know Jackie, and I like her. I was just wondering, that's all. Well, I don't really know all the details, just that it was very tragic. Now I have some dictation to type up. I'll show you out. I can find my own way, thanks. You should probably get to your typewriter. Don't want Tuttle pointing his shotgun at you because you got behind in your typing. It's a little unsettling. Archer left the tidy house, put on his hat, and wondered what the hell all that had been about. Chapter 7 A hitched ride back with a mother and her buck-toothed, runny-nosed son in a dented Studebaker, with no wheel caps and a rattling sound that signaled the engine was close to throwing a rod, brought Archer to Polka City before the dinner hour. He used the down-the-hall shower to clean off the dust and put his only clothes back on. He set off now to do something about that wardrobe predicament. His long legs took him down the street to a haberdashery about three blocks from his hotel that he had passed on his earlier ramblings. The old gent in there seemed to be thinking about closing up for the day and contemplating his dinner when Archer strolled in. Need some fresh duds, he said. 
The fellow was dressed like a walking billboard for his line of business, down to the cufflinks and the pocket square aligned with an engineer's precision. I can sure see that, young man. What can I do you for? To start, let's get a copy of what I got on now, only better. Well, that's fine, since I only got better. But can I see your money first? Just a common courtesy from folks I don't know is all. This is a respectable establishment. I deal with no other kind. The show of the twin twenties was all it took to capture the man's undivided interest. And it took only an hour to complete the selling and buying. With Archer's physique and height, nothing needed to be altered. And the man had his girl cuff both pairs of pants on her sewing machine right then and there. That's a damn sight miracle, said the man of the fine fit. It was a single-breasted, heart shafter and marks model of a medium blue color with narrow pinstripes. His wide knotted tie was a blood red, and the command collar on his Alden dress shirt softened the thickness of his neck. The leather belt holding up his pants was black and braided. I like the hat, said Archer, as he peered in the mirror at his new felt snap brim with a dented crown and a burgundy silk band. He had bypassed the recommendation of a rabbit hair trilby headpiece. His white pocket square had a two-point fold. Shoes good? Those wingtips are the very finest leather. You'll need to keep them conditioned and shined regularly. I'll break them in. The man handed him a bag and a hanger with the extra pair of slacks on them. Two pairs of underwear, same number of socks, and the extra pair of trousers pleated and cuffed. Right, said Archer. I'm good to go. His Jacksons had been drastically reduced, although Archer had been surprised that he'd been able to afford the new clothes and shoes for less than forty dollars. The man told him he hadn't been open that long, and was looking to build up his business, and thus was giving Archer a deal. You look fine in the new duds, so talk my place up to everybody, you hear me? said the man, and Archer promised that he would. He walked out the door wearing his new clothes. The girl had put his old suit, shirt, and shoes in another bag. He dropped all this off at the derby, hung up his old things and new spare pants, and headed out to eat some dinner. The restaurant was named The Checkered Past. Whoever had come up with the names of the places here had a sense of humor. Archer would grant them that. The sign out front promised steaks and fat potatoes at good prices and coffee until midnight. He entered and took his seat at a table with a red and white checkered cloth covering it and matching napkins. He ordered his steak rare and his coffee piping hot, and afterwards sampled the peach cobbler, which was good, the best he'd ever had, perhaps. He laid down his coins for the meal and then plotted out his next steps on the way back to the derby. He got up the next morning, cleaned up in the bath down the hall, and headed down to the front desk. You know where Hank Piddleman has his house? The clerk, the same gent who had checked him in the first night, scratched his furry forearms and said, Why you want to know that? Have business with the man, and he told me he spends Saturday and the Sabbath at his home with his wife. Well? I need a way to get out there. Can always walk. How far is it? Take you a good four hours. Any way I can hitch a ride with somebody? The man stroked his chin and looked Archer up and down. Actually got a delivery going out there this morning. You help with that, it'll pay for the price of the ride. I can fix it up. When does it leave? Hour from now. Where from? Alley behind the hotel. Okay, I'm gonna grab some breakfast then. Do what you want. Hey now, where'd you get those clothes? Those sure ain't the duds you were wearing when you got here. I bought some new things. With what? Same what I paid for the room. Cash. Where'd you get that kind of moolah? The Department of Prisons gave it to me. Thought you was one of them when you checked in. Are you shitting me? They give prisoners money? Well, I promised him I wouldn't kill anybody else if they did. Archer fell silent and stared at the man with a look that he hoped meant business. Well, you be at the alley in an hour. I will, friend. Archer got a cup of coffee and a fried egg and toast at a hole in the wall a block down from the hotel, and read a discarded newspaper while doing so. The Soviet Union had recently detonated its first nuclear weapon. While Archer had been in prison, something called NATO had been established. 
The newspaper Archer had been reading at the time said the creation of NATO would make sure there were no more wars. They must have forgotten to tell old Joe Stalin that, thought Archer. He met the truck and driver behind the hotel. The man told him his name was Sid Duckett. Around 60 years old, he was about three inches taller than Archer and outweighed him by maybe 50 pounds. He looked like he could lift the truck he'd be driving, but then told Archer he'd thrown out his back and welcomed the help in exchange for a ride out. He had on faded jeans that showed off his wide hips and bow legs, a cotton shirt tucked in, a wide leather belt with a buckle the size of a paperweight, dusty boots, and a greasy snap-brim hat with a fake bird feather sticking from the band. Well, get to it then while I check my paperwork, said Duckett. What are we hauling? They pointed to a large stack of wooden crates piled next to the hotel's tradesman entrance. What, all that? All that, buddy, if you want the ride. Archer took off his hat and coat and rolled up his sleeves. A half hour later, after much grunting and heaving, and words of unhelpful advice from Duckett, the truck was loaded. Archer rolled down his sleeves and picked up his jacket and hat. Let's go, hollered Duckett from the front seat. Time's a wasting, fella. Archer climbed in next to him and they set off. Guess you folks don't use much talcum powder around here, noted Archer. What's that? replied Duckett, looking puzzled. Just worked my butt off, but the air's so dry I didn't even break a sweat. They drove for an hour and not once did the landscape change from flat and brown, or the sky from clear to something else. Archer didn't recall even seeing a bird passing over. Archer eyed this for a while before saying, See here, does it always look this way? What? Archer pointed out the windshield. The land around here. Duckett eyeballed what they were passing. Sometimes we get a bit of snow. But other than that, I don't like change, said Duckett gruffly. When things are the same, you got no surprises. I'm into variety myself, replied Archer. Well, you're in the wrong damn place, brother. Least when it comes to the weather. Does that mean there are surprises around here not having to do with the weather? Duckett eyed him suspiciously. You ask a lot of questions. My mama told me that was the only way to learn. Maybe your mama should have told you not to be so damn nosy. They pulled off the road and shortly came to a set of wrought iron gates. Duck had honked the horn, and a dark-skinned, strongly-built man with small features, dressed in worn olive-green dungarees, a faded striped shirt and work boots, rushed out from somewhere and opened them. Holy Lord, exclaimed Archer. This is one man's home? He stared up at the behemoth that loomed before them like the rise of mountains from the plains. Duckett nodded. Yeah, why? What does one man want with all that? said Archer. Duckett aimed a glare his way. Don't tell a man what to do or not to do with his money. Mr. Piddleman wants a place like this, well then he can damn well build it. And he did. I wasn't saying otherwise. Just voicing an opinion. Man single-handedly made Polka City into something. I grew up here. Wasn't shit here. Man changed that. Why, I got a job. Don't be bad-mouthing him with your opinions, lest you want trouble. I'm the sort who doesn't care for trouble, pal. Had enough of that to last a lifetime. Damn good thing, because the trouble I'm talking about starts with a capital T. Well, if a man's going there, he better make it count replied Archer, drawing a sharp glance from Duckett. Thanks, Manuel, Duckett called out to the man who'd opened the gates. After he drove through, Duckett said, You can get out here if you want. What about unloading the truck? said Archer. I do that at the trucking warehouse Mr. Piddleman has. It's about a quarter mile away. You can see it from the rear of the house. Has its own road off the main one, but I can get to it from here. They got men there to help unload. Well, the deal was I help you at both ends, so let's get to it. Duckett looked at him with an odd expression. Didn't expect that. Thought you'd duck out if you could. I didn't duck out fighting a war. Not starting now.
Duckett said defensively. I was too old to fight, but did my part here. I'm sure you did. What was it like over there? Not too bad if you didn't end up dying. They drove to the warehouse, which was a large, sprawling structure about forty feet high with an A-framed shingle roof. Two double metal slide doors fronted it. Over the doors was stenciled HP Trucking. For Hank Piddleman, noted Archer. Well, ain't you a smart one, said Duckett. You must have gone to college. He backed the truck up, and they climbed out. A smaller door set next to the double ones opened, and a medium-height, sturdily built man around forty with a pencil mustache riding over a slash of mouth came out. He shook hands with Duckett and was introduced as Malcolm Draper, Piddleman's business manager. Duckett told him why Archer was there. Draper wore a slick three-piece worsted wool suit, polished shoes, and a gray hat with a black band. His eyes were beady enough to make Archer instantly distrust the gent. And the Smith & Wesson thirty-eight Special revolver he carried in a holster dangling near his crotch didn't endear him either. Archer pointed at the gun. Never seen a man in a three-piece suit and collared shirt wear a holstered gun like that. Draper said, We have valuable property in there. We take precautions. Archer fought in the war, noted Duckett. So did a lot of men, said Draper dismissively. Ain't nothing special. Did you fight in the war? Archer asked him. I got asthma. Well, ain't that special, replied Archer. The metal door slid open, and two men came out with a metal and wood trolley, and they all helped unload the truck. Then the men rolled the loaded trolley through the open double doors and into the warehouse. Archer caught a glimpse of boxes and crates stacked nearly as high as the ceiling. A lot of stuff, he commented to Duckett and Draper. Draper said, no railroad lines near here. Only way to haul freight is by truck. I can see that. A few minutes later, Duckett dropped Archer off at Piddleman's house and said, how are you getting back? Figure that out later. Thanks for the ride. Duckett said, can I give you a dollar for the help? Archer waved this off. I'm good, friend, but thanks anyway. Duckett flipped him two walking liberty half-dollar coins. Don't never turn down money, friend. Duckett put the truck in gear and drove off. Archer watched Manuel close the gates behind him. Then he slapped his hat against his thigh to knock off the dust and headed to the house. Chapter 8 The place seemed even larger than Polka City's courts and municipality building. With more imagination in the design and better materials, Archer observed. The layout was not so much medieval castle-like, at least to Archer's limited familiarity with architecture, as it was similar to the grand mansions he'd seen pictures of and built by the likes of the Vanderbilts and Rockefellers. Wide, curving flower beds were planted on both sides of the walk going up to the house. Yellow and red and pink buds cascaded all around these beds, so they must be getting water from somewhere, he figured. It seemed like vast attention had been paid to all the landscaping outside, and Archer assumed that attention to detail would carry through to the interior. He knocked on the door, and a few moments later could hear footsteps approaching. An elderly woman with stringy gray hair dangling from under a cap and attired in a black and white maid's uniform opened the door. Yes, she asked dully her face as fine a representation of a sourpuss as he was ever likely to eyeball, and he had seen plenty in his time. I'm here to see Mr. Piddleman. Name's Archer. He knows me. Just wait here, she said, without a sliver of interest. She stalked off after leaving the door open. Archer took the opportunity to step through and look around. Archer had never seen such opulence, even when he'd been in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York before the doorman had run a uniformed archer out for loitering around with a female guest apparently beyond the boundaries of good taste. He was confronted by tapestry-shrouded and gilt-tasseled chairs set against the far wall, curtained French doors leading off to who knew where, a row of grandfather clocks with fancy faces and fancier inner workings that he could see, and marble tables 
with flower-filled, hand-painted vases topping them. Twin suits of armor, a foot taller than him, were set on pedestals on either side of the front door. Far above him were other doors set in the wall with iron grills fronting them. He imagined they were like fake balconies to look down from, but the first wrong step would be a doozy. Long grass and oriental rugs covered stretches of the stone and timbered floor. The walls were covered with paper that looked like silk, though Archer couldn't imagine even someone like Piddleman being able to afford acres of that commodity. But what did he know about such things? Unfortunately, despite the vast size of the space, he could feel the walls closing in on him. The oxygen seemed sucked from around him and replaced with pure carbon dioxide. He hadn't had so much trouble making his lungs function since a German sniper had missed Archer's head by the width of the lucky strike he'd been in the process of lighting. He had dipped his head to ignite his smoke at the exact moment the bullet struck. That slight change in position meant the round entered and exited his helmet instead of finishing its business in his brain. Realizing his near death, he'd laughed for a good ten minutes and then chucked up vomit into a bucket for ten minutes more. He'd never smoked any other brand from that day forward since those smokes had more than lived up to their name. He heard footsteps approaching again, but these were planted more firmly than the old woman's. Pittleman came into view. He was dressed casually in pleated and cuffed gray slacks and an open collared shirt, which showed a glimpse of his undershirt and also highlighted his bloated belly and soft shoulders. His trousers were held up by a braided leather belt that looked expensive, and probably was. He was holding a newspaper in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other. His hair was just as neatly combed, but in the light of day, Archer could see clearly the sun splotches spread over the man's face, like clumps of dirt on an otherwise pristine, if saggy, carpet. And under his eyes were pouches filled with blue-veined wrinkles, like the tracings on a dime store map. He doubted Jackie Tuttle would look any less alluring in the daytime instead of in a dark, smoky bar. But still, that was reason enough to drink in the absence of light. What in the hell are you doing here, Archer? Came to report on Mr. Tuttle. You got the Cadillac, boy? He glanced toward the front door. No, sir, but I'm working on it. Mr. Tuttle told me a few things, and I just wanted to run them by you. Piddleman looked him up and down. New clothes? Yes, sir. I guess I see where my forty dollars went. You gonna disappoint me? I hope not to. Come on back. He turned and led Archer down a broad hallway festooned with paintings, murals, and the heads of unfortunate animals. You hunt? asked Archer, looking at the frozen countenance of what appeared to be a water buffalo. I do, just not critters. Archer looked confused, until Piddleman saw this and laughed. Lots of things in life more important than these here things to hunt, Archer. Like what? I'll let you find out for yourself. Hope it's not a lesson you come to regret. He led him into a room with glass walls and a glass ceiling, all supported by steel beams. In the center of the room was a table and three upholstered chairs, with medieval scenes stitched on them. Leggy, potted plants were arrayed around the room. A dark Davenport was against one wall with light-colored pillows and a menagerie of birds printed upon them. Floor lamps with shirred paper shades and graced with various designs, both architectural and animal, were strategically placed. Sitting in one of the chairs was, Archer supposed, Mrs. Piddleman. She was around sixty, white-haired, large, big-boned, and matronly with flat cheeks, a chunk of nose, and ears that stuck out. Her eyes, covered by a pair of pince-nez, were set too close together for symmetry. She wore a dress of little style and shape. It might as well have been a blanket laid over her. But it probably cost a small fortune, Archer thought, just like everything else in the place. Archer doubted she had been beautiful even in her youth. But there was refinement and intelligence in her eyes and features. He believed her soul might be far more attractive than the outside of her. But that might just be wishful thinking. Thinking the best of people often was, he had learned. Marjorie, honey, this is Archer. He's been doing some work for me. She inclined her head but offered no verbal greeting. 
Pittleman sat down, drank his coffee, and folded up his newspaper. Take a seat, Archer. Archer sat uncomfortably on two nights jousting. Pittleman said, So you've been out there and talked to him? Why? Did he catch you trying to take the Cadillac? If so, why aren't you dead, or at least gravely injured? I don't pay good money for a half-ass effort, soldier. I went yesterday afternoon, knocked on the door, and talked to him. Pittleman shook his head in confusion and poured another cup of coffee from a silver-plated pot with a long, curved spout. A platinum cigarette case was on the table lying open. Inside were gold-tipped, needle-thin smokes. Next to that was a nickel-plated Smith & Wesson snub-nose revolver, with walnut grips and a hair trigger manually filed down to make it so. You like that little belly gun? asked Archer. Nice gat. Drops what I hit. Can't ask for more. With hiked eyebrows, Archer said, How often do you drop things? Depends on the target and my mood. With that hair trigger, do you even bother fanning the hammer? I shoot slow, but I don't miss. Isn't that right, Marjorie? She didn't respond, but Archer didn't think Piddleman expected her to. Piddleman took a drink of his coffee, and the movement revealed on his wrist a watch encrusted with six diamonds and twin sapphires. Archer saw the name Longines etched on the face underneath the glass. He looked down at his own timepiece and reminded himself that they both told the same story, despite being separated by a truckload of dollars. Piddleman said, So why the hell did you go out there and see Tuttle in broad daylight? You think he was gonna just hand you the keys to the damn caddy? You can't be that cockeyed boy. No, sir. I just wanted to verify that he owed the money. I already verified that to you, son. Are you simple? Did I make a mistake hiring you? Well, he did verify it. And he has the money to pay the debt off. Which I think you probably want more than the car. Am I right about that? I mean, you said it wouldn't come close to paying off the debt and interest and such. You are right about that. So what? Well, there's one little sticking point on the debt. And what might that be? Archer glanced at Marjorie and did not proceed. Piddleman looked confused for a moment before exclaiming, Good Lord, is it Jackie we're talking about? Archer shot another glance at Marjorie, who was now drinking her coffee and leafing through a magazine with a placid expression. She could be in church marching silently through her catechisms, he thought. That's what he said. He wants her back. She's an adult, in case you and her daddy didn't notice. She can decide on her own. But he won't pay back, which is why I told you to get the goddamn car, Archer. Hell, boy, I didn't need you to go out there and ask the man what his problem was in paying me back my money. I know what it was. He doesn't like the fact that his daughter is now seeing me. Now go paste that in your new hat bought with my money. So you know all that, then? Let me tell you something else I know, son. Jackie's current status doesn't give Lucas Tuttle a pot to piss in when it comes to a legal obligation owed to yours truly. Why not take him to court, then? asked Archer. Piddleman sat back in stark wonderment. What? And subject my dear wife here to gossip of a perverse nature? To dredging up facts in a court of law that might prove painful to her? No, sir. He patted his wife's hand. I love her too much to put her through that. I can see that said Archer slowly, when in truth he could see none of it. He eyed the three-initial monogram on the man's shirt cuff. Got a problem with something? said Piddleman, when he caught him looking there. You afraid you might put on another man's shirt by mistake? Funny guy, huh? If I'd known that when I hired you, maybe I wouldn't have. Now get your ass out there, Archer, and take back my collateral by hook or crook. And if you don't, you're gonna owe me forty dollars with interest. And I might leave you naked on the street, son, with more wounds than you got fighting the crowds. Where you staying? Derby Hotel. Mighty fine place, said Piddleman, with another sly glance in Marjorie's direction. You need money to keep staying there, and you sure know how to get it, don't you? He turned back to his paper. 
Got another question, said Archer. We're done here, replied Pittleman, as he picked up the belly gun and examined it, the barrel pointing in Archer's general direction. Archer next looked at Marjorie, who was still leafing through her Saturday evening post magazine, apparently mesmerized more by the words therein than by her husband's admitted adultery. Pittleman glanced at her. You need anything, honey? Just tell me if you do now. She graced him with a smile. I'm just fine, Hank. Hell, I know you're fine. Just ask any man. He glanced at Archer. And why are you still here, son? Have I not made myself as clear as the sky outside? Archer rose and tipped his hat at the woman. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Pittleman. She nodded absently at him, her gaze holding on the magazine. He walked to the door, looked back at the odd couple, and could only shake his head. On his way out, he glimpsed a young woman in a maid's uniform scampering up the stairs. She looked back, saw him watching, and gave him a wide smile. He tipped his hat and returned the smile. She hiked her eyebrows fetchingly, then disappeared from sight. He waved to Manuel, who opened the gate for him. He passed through and headed for the road. He walked for a while, the dust collecting on him like metal fragments to a magnet. He finally hitched a ride on a slow-moving Model A heading to Polka City, and driven by a man dressed all in black who said he was a circuit preacher. He told Archer he needed to repent his ways, regardless of what they were, and gave him a pamphlet from a wooden box in the back that was entitled, The Devil is Inside You. Archer got back to town over an hour later and threw the pamphlet away in the first trash can he spotted. I know the devil's inside me, and maybe I like it that way. He went back to the derby and washed off the dust in the hall bath. He went in search of and bought a bottle of bluebird gin and two packs of Lucky Strikes and a box of matches. He walked back to his room and debated what to do. Tuttle was not giving up the money if Jackie stayed with Pittleman. Pittleman was going to do nothing about that situation. So the only way for Archer to make any money off this was to take the damn Cadillac. But all the others who had attempted it had failed. Or maybe died trying, if the Remington had anything to say about it. He didn't even know where the man kept the sedan. Maybe in one of the outbuildings he'd glimpsed when he was there. Tuttle would be on his guard for another attempt, and while Archer would die for his country, and almost had, he didn't relish kicking the bucket via buckshot simply trying to earn a living. But if he didn't get the car, Pittleman, who he assumed was a man of his word, would probably tar and feather Archer before running him out of town. And if he could argue that Archer had taken his money and not done what he promised, that constituted a crime, and he'd be right back in Carterock. He smoked a lucky right down to nothing, drank his gin slow and easy, and pondered why he had not taken the simpler route and become a hog brain basher like Dickie Dill. This made him think of the scrawled note he'd found in Ernestine Crabtree's office. He pulled it out of his old jacket, read it again, found it even more disturbing, and put it back where it had been. Maybe there was one person who could help him with his dilemma. Jackie Tuttle. But he had no idea where she even lived. But Polka wasn't that big a place. He waited until the darkness was about to fall, put on his new hat, and then set out to find her. Chapter 9 His search ended abruptly in the lobby of the Derby Hotel, where Jackie was sitting in a cane-backed chair in front of an empty fireplace topped by a slab of marble collecting still more dust. He stopped and looked down at her as Jackie smiled up at him. Or get a load of you, said Archer. Surprised? she said. You can see that for yourself. She eyed his new clothes. Nice duds. Yeah, a lot better than what I had. I can see that for myself. What are you doing here? Waiting for you to come down. What else? Why? Hank phoned and said you'd come by today. And he told me where you were staying. Why would he call you about that? Hank tells me most things. She rose. Let's go eat. I'm starving. She wore a skin-tight, dark blue cocktail dress, a white scarf around her neck, 
and a black fitted pillbox hat with a bit of frilly lace tacked up. Her shoes were black with low heels and bows on the toes. Her costly nylon stockings gleamed over her shapely calves. Gold chandelier hoops hung from her ears, and she held a small clutch purse in her gloved hands. You do look sharp, she said, running her hand along his lapel, and then clutching his tie and pulling on it for good measure, bending him down to near her height. With a little work, you might be approaching dreamboat status. Sort of like Cary Grant and Clark Gable all rolled into one. You're nice on the eyes, too, he said appreciatively. Prettier than any gal I've seen at the movies. Glad we got all that out of the way, but don't say that in front of Hank. He's a jealous man, and that knife isn't the only weapon he carries. Yeah, I saw his belly gun up close and personal today. But his wife doesn't seem to be the jealous type. In fact, she doesn't seem to give a wit. As they walked out into the fading light and headed down the street, Jackie said, Oh, Marjorie gives a wit, trust me. Care to explain? Not really. And I'm not sure you're set up to understand, even if I did. They slid into a shallow booth with red vinyl seats at the checkered past. Jackie ordered a gin and tonic with a twist of lime. Archer went with a ginger ale. She looked at him oddly. You lost your thirst? Or are you waiting to tell them the rest of the ingredients for a highball? They do a nice seven and seven here, in case you're interested. No, just trying to watch my P's and Q's. How is not drinking doing that? If I get sauced, I might say or do something with you I might regret. Hell, Archer, that's half the fun. She sipped her drink when it came, while he chugged his. So, Marjorie, began Archer. What about her? She knows about you and Hank. I know she does. You're really not going to enlighten me then. She took off her pillbox and set it on the table next to her place setting. And why exactly do you feel the need to be enlightened? I don't like not knowing things. It gets under my skin. That's a good attribute, but it doesn't persuade me. I hear you talk to Lucas Tuttle. You mean your father? Yeah, I did. She shrugged. And what did the old gas bag say? Why ask me? Piddleman must have told you, since I told him. I'm not going back home, Archer, if that's what you want to know. Okay. But your father truly seems to miss you. She looked at her menu. What are you in the mood for? Steak and potatoes. Coffee. Black. Piece of the cobbler to finish. She glanced up at him. You sound certain about that, and you haven't even looked at the menu. I am sure. You've eaten here before? Last night. What did you have? Same as what I just said. You don't like variety? Two things in a row is variety of a sort. You'd make an intriguing study, Archer. Of what kind? She pulled out a pack of Chesterfields and offered him one, which he took. She lit his with her metal lighter, cupping her gloved hand around his, and then did the same for herself. Jackie blew out a cloud of smoke and said, Hell, just about any kind of study. He turned his head and released smoke from his nostrils. With all the other tables similarly engaged, the restaurant looked like it might be on fire. I heard your mother died in an accident. I'm truly sorry about that. She tapped ash into the chromium ashtray and positioned her elbow on the table so that her cigarette pointed to the ceiling like she was putting up her hand to swear an oath. Her flippant expression was gone. Who told you? Surely not my father. Lady named Desiree. She nodded. Desiree Lankford. Efficient-looking woman. She is very efficient. She finished her cigarette early and ground it out on the chromium ashtray. Your daddy said he had the money to pay back the debt. Only he won't, so long as you're with Piddleman. Then I guess you're going to have to take the Cadillac like Hank told you to in the first place. You need to keep up, Archer. Hank doesn't suffer fools gladly. And get shot for my troubles? Did my father answer the door with a Remington then? Does he usually? My father's not a trusting man. Yeah. It was pointed at all parts of me that I find important and necessary.
Well, why would he point at the unnecessary ones? You say he had the money? What he told me. Why? Just wondering. What's your plan now? Why? I'll tell you this. Hank isn't happy or already spent his money without getting his collateral. She once more eyed his new clothes. Is that why you sought me out? You sort of his spy? I won't hold it against you. A gal's gotta do what a gal's gotta do. I have better things to do with my time, Archer, than spy on folks. I sought you out because you're new in town, and I thought you might like some companionship. Okay, sorry about that. As to the plan, I'll think of something. Always do. I like a man with confidence in himself. I just hope yours isn't misplaced, because it won't turn out well for you. I know about the Remington now. Not talking about that. I know for a fact that Hank was angry when the other men came back empty-handed, and he took it out on them for sure. You don't think I can hold my own with Piddleman? It's not Hank you have to worry about. He employs a lot of men, and some of them are even bigger and stronger than you. She added sweetly. And I suspect that most of them aren't nearly as nice as you are. Thanks for the warning. Don't say I never gave you anything. Hey, where are you coming in from? You said seven hours from the east? Just wandering. Have been for a while. You mentioned you did two years of college? That's right. Where? Not anywhere near here. Why didn't you finish? A little thing called a world war came calling and interrupted my studies. Right. You said you fought. Every man my age did. Unless they had bad eyes, bad feet, or a bum ticker. I hear the sons of some rich or influential men didn't have to suit up. Well, my old man wasn't rich or influential. And anyway, I volunteered. Why? Do my part, why else? Were you brave? More lucky than brave, probably. Why don't I believe that? Believe what you will. They ordered their food when the waitress came over. Steak and potatoes for you too, he said, after Jackie finished her dinner request and the waitress had gone off. She gave a surprised archer a coy smile. I like variety as much as the next person. You left home right after your mom died? Why do you care about that, she said with a frown. I'm just a curious soul. Always have been. Well, it's my business, not yours, so tell your curiosity to scram. Archer looked around the dining room, and his gaze alighted and held on Ernestine Crabtree, who was eating her dinner in a far corner of the restaurant. She had a book next to her, and a pad of paper in front of her, and was writing something down with a pen. What is it? asked Jackie, glancing that way. You know her? Just looking around, saying what's what. I for the ladies, Archer? Don't be afraid to confess it. Look, I'm no better or worse than other men on that score. You know her? Jackie sat back and ran a finger down her glass of gin. Not really. Seen her around. She seems a little... Wound like a clock? Yeah. Seems that way to me, too. It's sad she's all by herself with only a book to keep her company. Books can be good for you. You don't strike me as a book reader, Archer, despite your two years in college, she said skeptically. You're wrong there. I've been reading books a lot lately. Good friends to help pass the time. Did you have time you wanted to pass? Don't we all? What did you study in college? Mostly the co-eds. You're a laugh a minute until you're not. Archer looked around once more and flinched when he saw three men sitting at a table in another corner of the restaurant. Two of them were hardened, uncouth types with greasy hats and slovenly chins. The other one was Dicky Dill. He was eating his steak blood rare, and cutting it not with the restaurant's cutlery, but with a switchblade. That was disturbing enough, but all three men were also snatching glances at Crabtree, and then talking and laughing. That all set Archer's nerves on edge. When one of the men rose and headed toward Crabtree's table, Archer said to Jackie, Excuse me for a minute. He beat the gent to the table by a half second. Crabtree looked up first at the man and then at Archer. Mr. Archer, what are you doing here? She said. 
saw you sitting here and came over to say hello. Archer glanced at the man. Hey, friend. You know Miss Crabtree, too? Not as well as I want to, barked the man. Three's companies a beat it, pal. He was larger than Archer, with a broad chest and thick arms. Archer said, I would beat it, but I also have business with the lady. What sort of business? The personal kind. Like I give a damn. The man reached out to grip Archer's shoulder, but Archer deftly blocked the man's thrust and took the hand in a firm shake. So firm, in fact, that the man's eyes started to wince. With his other hand, Archer held the man's other arm tight against his side. Mr. Archer, said Crabtree, what are you doing? Just having a gab with this nice man. It looks like you're hurting him. Nah, I'm not hurting you, am I, fella? You better let go before I get riled, said the man, his eyes watering now with the pressure Archer was applying. Archer glanced over at Dill to see the little man watching him intently his blade held point up. I mean no harm, friend, but I sort of have to insist on you going back to your table and I'll do the same. You can see that Miss Crabtree is busy right now, so the respectful thing to do is walk away. Archer gave the hand another firm squeeze, and the look in his eyes was of a man who was not going to be denied. The man looked down at the paper and the pen as Archer increased the pressure on the gent's fingers. I'll come back. Another time, then, he said hoarsely. Archer slowly let go and stepped back. Well, you might want to find somebody else to talk to. Dickie over there is a nice one. I know you're eating with him and all already. Crabtree jerked her head to look in that direction. Then she glanced up wide-eyed at Archer. Before the man left, Archer pulled him close and said into his ear, I'm just out of Carterock myself, pal. One thing I learned about Miss Crabtree. They got the law watching her all the time, in case people like you and me make a move like you just tried to do. Dickie gave me the same advice about the cat's meow. Just trying to help you out, friend. You take care. The man looked goggle-eyed at Archer, gave a searching glance around the restaurant, turned, and hurried back to his table, where he sat and immediately entered into a serious discussion with the other two while shooting glances back at Archer. Archer looked down at Crabtree, Sorry about that, ma'am. Didn't mean to interrupt your meal. No, um, that's fine. I, well, thank you, Mr. Archer. She paused. What did you just tell him? Nothing important. I take it he's one of your parolees? How did you know that? He's not drinking. Oh, yes. Dan Bullock. He was released three weeks ago. Right, well, I was just wishing him luck in his new life. Before she could respond, he glanced down at the paper and saw the writing there along with a title at the top of the page. You a writer? You working on a story? She covered the page with her hand. I just scribble. Well, okay. See you at our next meeting. Yes. He walked back to join Jackie. What was all that about? She exclaimed as he sat down. Just heading off a little bit of trouble. Seemed like you knew her. Didn't I say? I just met her walking around town. Nice lady. She glanced at the table with the three men. I think you might have made some enemies, Archer. Wouldn't be the first time. But I think it'll be okay. A woman like that is a target, unfortunately. Why's that? She doesn't have a man with her, said Jackie, matter-of-factly. He stubbed out his Chesterfield when their food came. They ate their meal mostly in silence. Archer had things he wanted to ask but was afraid to, something he usually wasn't, especially with a woman. But this was a woman the likes of which he had never really encountered before. He had an unsettling notion that she might be more than a match for him. Ernestine Crabtree, too. Polka City seemed to have its share of independent women designed to scare the bejesus out of him. Jackie insisted on paying and Archer didn't protest too much, since he would have had to dig into the dregs of his remaining cash to do so. Still, a woman should not pay for a man's meal. It just wasn't done. If you have any work needs doing, let me know. I can pay off the meal. She ran an appraising eye over him. Oh, 
I'll let you know, all right. You might come in very handy for what I need. Jackie then gave him such a look that Archer felt himself blush for one of the few times in his life. As they walked out, Archer thought he saw Ernestine glance at him. But that also might have been his imagination. Dickie and his pals had long since left. Archer kept a sharp eye out for them on the street, but saw neither hide nor hair of the terrible trio. It was warm, the air still bone dry as they walked along. Does any moisture ever creep into the ether here? He asked. Now and again, but not so you'd notice much. We're pretty far from the ocean. Yes, so. It does brittle your skin. I have to slather on moisturizer after I get out of the bathtub. Okay, thought Archer. That was a deliberately low blow, designed to knock him off his stride. And it succeeded beautifully. He nearly ran into a lamppost. Jackie entwined his arm with hers and said, You want to head over to the cat's meow? We could do some dancing and quench our thirst for real. No bender, just a couple of highballs. Aren't you Piddleman's gal? We see each other from time to time, but I'm not his gal. He provides for me. Okay. So you want to go drinking and dancing? I'll have to take a rain check on that. She did not look pleased by his refusal. I might not ask again. I understand that. Look, you have any idea where your father keeps the caddy? She stepped away from him. Do I look like a patsy? First you give me the cold shoulder, and now you ask me to make your job easier, Archer? Why should I? Give me one reason. I can't think of a single one, Jackie. This frank answer seemed to soften the hardened edge that she had adopted. Well, he used to keep it in the barn. He used to. Would you keep it in the same place if a bunch of men had tried to take it? Right. So where, then? She put a fist on her hip and stared at him. There's a building about a quarter mile behind the barn. My father stores old farm equipment there. If I were you, I'd look there. Any idea where he might keep the car keys? No. That's okay. I know how to hotwire a car. Do you now? How is that, I wonder? The Germans weren't always good about leaving the keys behind when they abandoned their vehicles, so the army taught me what to do. Good old army, she said, providing skills you can use your whole felonious life. Thanks, Jackie, for the information. Don't thank me, Archer. It's your funeral. He thought she would just turn and leave, but she didn't. She rose up on her heeled tiptoes, hugged him tight, and pressed her ruby-red lips against his cheek, leaving her mark upon him. She smelled of gin and lime, and also lavender, and maybe the moisturizer she used after climbing naked from the bathtub. She slowly withdrew her body from his, her hands sliding down his shoulders, along his obliques, and then around his waist. See you around, Archer? Yeah. She turned and left him there on the street. Right now, he couldn't have hit a German with a bazooka at a foot's distance. He took off his new hat and slapped it hard against his thigh, giving himself a sting from the blow. Not so much to rid himself of the ubiquitous dust, but to make himself feel some hurt for allowing a lovely young woman who wanted to drink and dance and maybe do other things with him, get off scot-free thinking he was a lame SOB from the east of here. He went back to the hotel and slept until one in the afternoon, dreaming of tubs and moisturizer and a host of college co-eds applying same and who all looked like Jackie Tuttle. He had dinner at a place cheaper than the checkered past. After that, he stopped at a hardware store, where he bought a clasp knife and a Rayovac flashlight with batteries for the grand total of a buck fifty from a man in a dirty undershirt with a bib tucked in gnawing on a chicken leg and holding a past blue ribbon in the other mitt. Both these tools would come in handy. Later that night, he glanced at the still cloudless sky, wondering if actual weather had been somehow suspended over Polka City. He then turned to look at the road where the bus had dropped him. It seemed like at least a year ago, but not in the way of accomplishment, since he had none.
He set off to see about taking back a 1947 Cadillac sedan without dying in the face of the Remington. He had had the good sense to change into his old clothes from prison. He reasoned that if he did get killed, they could bury him in the new duds instead of the old blood-splattered ones, and there'd be nothing Hank Piddleman could do about it. Archer angled his hat just so, and set off to snatch a caddy. Chapter 10 He managed to hitch a ride on a Peterbilt long-haul truck. The tobacco-chewing driver said he was taking freight all the way to Nevada, and could do with some company for a bit. For a good hour, he and Archer sat in the cab and talked about the war. The driver had served in the Navy, and the New York Yankees probably winning the World Series again. Hell, I can see him winning a bunch in a row, the lineup they got, said the driver. What about that player with the Dodgers, said Archer? Jackie Robinson. The man nodded. That colored boy can hit something fierce, I'll give him that, and run like the darn wind. He spit his chew into a Maxwell House coffee can riding next to him on the seat. One rookie of the year in 47. Heard he might be the National League MVP this year, said Archer. Maybe so, fella, maybe so. Then they'd turn to politics, speculating that maybe Dwight D. Eisenhower would run for president when Truman was all said and done. I like old Ike, said the driver. Make a good campaign slogan, opined Archer. He had the man drop him off about a mile before Tuttle's, figuring he didn't want any witnesses to what he was planning. Archer walked the rest of the way. A silky darkness had fallen by the time he got to the mailbox, with the air turning chilly. He made the turn at the fork and squatted down, studying the house and the barn and the flat-tilled fields beyond. Channeling his instincts as an army scout, Archer looked at what needed looking at and formulated a plan. The caddy clearly wasn't in the house. The barn was the next logical choice, but Jackie had warned him off that. But still, he had to be sure. He skittered over to the barn, found the door unlocked, which did not give him any ease, and decided to approach the place from another entry point. A side window succumbed to the nudges of his knife, and he entered there and shone his Rayovac flashlight around. It was quickly apparent that the car wasn't in here. But there was another vehicle. He ran his light over it. It was a four-door, long-hooded, burgundy automobile with a beige cloth top and white wall tires. He opened the door and looked at the license and registration cards on the steering post. It was in Tuttle's name, and the car was a 1938 Cadillac LaSalle. It was a beautiful car, just not the Cadillac he was looking for. After a bit of a trudge over uneven ground, he found the outbuilding right where Jackie said it would be. But there was nothing inside except ancient pieces of farm equipment, including a strange-looking device that had several cone-shaped nodules fronting it. He shone his flashlight over it and read off the words, Alice Chalmers, Corn Picker. This farming business was more complicated than he had thought. Frustrated now, he left the shed and squatted on his haunches, pondering what to do next. His nostrils twitched due to some disturbance in the air. He took a long whiff and then gave a short cough. He rose and followed the scent down a dirt road that wended its way through the shallow-rooted loblolly pine trees. The smell grew stronger the further in he went. He finally arrived at a wide clearing, with dirt underfoot. And smack in the middle of this flat, blackened ground was the source of the smell. The vehicle had been set aflame. The chassis was still there, but the tires had burned away, as had the interior. What was left wasn't much, to be sure. Archer walked over to it and looked around. The original color of the vehicle couldn't be determined, the paint also having burned away. The license and registration cards on the steering post had long since been consumed. He hustled around to the back and knelt down. He had to use his knife to scrape away burned fragments, which allowed him to read the plate number. It was the 1947 Cadillac, all right. He stood, an undeniable truth now vexing him. Pedalman's collateral no longer existed. His trip had been wasted. Well, that was a kick in the gut, almost near to what the over-under shotgun could have provided. He walked back to the main road and looked around. 
He didn't see a vehicle light in either direction. He took to his heels and returned to the derby after midnight. In his agitation, Archer took the stairs two at a time. He unlocked the door to his room, tossed his old hat down in the corner, opened the window, drew his chair up to it, lit a lucky strike, and sat there looking out while he smoked. If he couldn't get the Cadillac, and Tuttle wouldn't repay the loan without his daughter back, Archer was fresh out of ideas as to how to earn his commission, and he wasn't certain that this latest calamity might not cost him his life at either the muzzle of Piddleman's snub-nosed gat or the twin barrels of Tuttle's Remington. He burned down two more luckies and took more than a swallow of his bluebird gin and ended up sleeping in his old clothes. He awoke the following morning with no plan going forward. With his money dwindling and his prospects bleak, he opted for coffee and a slice of toast and a fried egg in the little cafe attached to the hotel. He strolled around town as Polka City woke up, thinking about the burned-out caddy. He figured that Tuttle must have done the deed to spite Piddleman. It seemed to Archer that the sedan had been burned some time ago. It had been cold to the touch, only the burned smell had lingered. That odor could stay for a very long time, Archer knew from his combat days. Archer was certain it had been destroyed before he'd even gone out to meet with Tuttle. The man must have had a nice laugh at his expense, knowing that the loan collateral no longer existed. Whether consciously or not, his strides took him to the blocky Polka City Courts and Municipality Building. He walked up to the correct floor and knocked on the door. Enter, said the stern voice. He swung the door open and there sat Ernestine Crabtree clacking away on her royal typewriter. She had a pencil stuck through her hair bun. She stopped typing when she saw him. What are you doing here? she asked. It's not your time yet. She was attired in a similar fashion as before. Prim dress, same shell glasses, low chunky heels that he could once more see through the knee hole, thick stockings, but very nice ankles and calves. He noted a cigarette smoldering in the ashtray. He came in, pulled the chair in front of her, and sat down. I could use some advice, Miss Crabtree. About what? He eyed the lit smoke. She saw this and said, No, I can't, I'm sorry. No problem. Brought my own. He pulled out his pack of luckies, tapped it against the desk, shook out a cigarette, and lit it. She took her smoke from the ashtray and had a puff, too. What advice? she said curiously. You know my debt collection job? Yes, you mentioned it. Well, I've gone out there twice now. Who owes the debt? Lucas Tuttle. Wait, the other night, weren't you with- That's right. Jackie Tuttle. You know her? She shook her head. Not really. Did you collect the money? Well, no. Lucas Tuttle says he has the money to pay Hank Piddleman back. Hank Piddleman? You know him? She shook her head a second time. But I know he is very wealthy and owns a lot of property around town. Anyway, Tuttle won't pay back the debt unless Jackie comes back home. And she doesn't want to do this? No. Then how will you collect the money? Well, Mr. Tuttle signed over his collateral for the loan, his 1947 Cadillac. He added, it's all legal. Piddleman showed me the papers. And Mr. Tuttle confessed to owing the money. So you could take the car in repayment of the loan? I could. Except I found out last night the man burned it up. She sat forward and put her cigarette down. He burned up his own car? Looks that way. Where does that leave you? In a pickle of sorts. You know, Mr. Piddleman advanced me forty dollars. And if I can't get the loan repaid or the car now, I'm sort of up the creek, so to speak. You mean Piddleman will want his forty dollars back? Right. But surely you still have the money? Well, I spent some of it. How much? Actually, most of it. She looked at him in disbelief. You spent nearly forty dollars since we last met? Well, I bought some new clothes to replace these. I wore these to prison some years ago. And I have to eat and all. Though I earned a dollar doing some lifting, I'm not eager to use my back for my daily bread. She shook her head and looked cross. See, this is why I was prepared to have you go out on job interviews. If you had, you wouldn't be in this kind of dilemma. 
Yeah, I see that. But I can't take it back now. But it's not too late, you know. You can earn money other ways. I can help you with that. Yes, ma'am. And it may come to that. And for that, I thank you. He smoked down his lucky and then ground it in the speckled glass ashtray. What book were you reading at dinner? It was by Virginia Woolf. Have you ever heard of her? Archer shook his head. She was from England. She died back in 1941. I admire her work greatly, and her personally. I might try something of hers then. I could loan you a book here and there, if you'll really read it. I guarantee you I will. I like detective stuff the best, but I'll read most anything. So you're trying to write too? Again, I just... scribble. She paused and considered him in an appraising light. Dan Bullock? You were afraid he was going to try something with me, weren't you? Well, he was, wasn't he? It wasn't the first time a parole he has approached me. I would expect not. But that doesn't make it right. And, well, there's something else. What? In answer, he took out the paper he'd found on her office floor and explained that fact to her before handing it over. I wouldn't normally give such trash to a lady, but maybe it's best you know about it. She only briefly glanced at it before tossing it into the waste bin next to a desk. You're right, it is trash. You get many of those? He asked quietly. She glanced up at him. It unfortunately comes with the territory. Please don't give it another thought. He nodded, sensing that she was done with this topic. So, any advice for me? Mr. Archer, it's not my job to get you out of jams you got yourself into. He cracked a grin. I'm being serious. I know you are. It's just that I've been in jams mostly my whole life. He rose and put his hat on. I'll get out of this one, too. He tipped his hat. Hope you have a nice day. She half rose from her seat and started to say something, but Archer was already gone. Crabtree rushed over to the door, opened it, and watched him walk with purpose down the hall and out of sight. She slowly closed the door and went back to her typewriter. But the royal never clacked once, because she never touched the keys. Chapter 11 That night Archer, dressed in his new clothes, walked down the street and took up his post across the street from the cat's meow. It was near on eight, and he assumed that Piddleman and Jackie might already be in there. After having had dinner with the woman, he felt a pang of jealousy that she was in the company of another man, particularly a man like Hank Piddleman. While he stood there, Archer thought about what he would discuss with Piddleman when he came out of the bar. He wanted the man to have a few drinks in him before he did so. He didn't think he was going to get a second chance with the gent. But the fact was the collateral was no more, so perhaps Piddleman would have another plan. At the very least, he couldn't blame Archer for Tuttle's torching his own caddy. Like any good scout, Archer was prepared for the unexpected, but he had not anticipated what would happen next. Mr. Archer? said the surprised voice. He turned to find Ernestine Crabtree standing there on the pavement, not six feet away, staring at him. Like his, her clothes were different from what she had started the day with. The dress that had fallen well below the knee had been replaced with a fresher model in a startling petrol blue paired with a black jacket with a high back collar. Her dimpled knees showed clearly below the starkly raised hem, and the thick nylons had been replaced with their sheer silk cousins. The low heels were gone, and her height had shot up to within about two inches of his by virtue of her spiked strappy footwear. The knotted bun had vanished, and she had on a black fascinator hat with a sticking up bow and attached short veil. Her blonde tresses fell straight down and skimmed her shoulders like a stage curtain against the floor. Her face, freed from being pulled at by the hair and covered by the shell glasses, had now relaxed into a thing of startling beauty, the eyes wide and holding considerable depth, and the paint on her face, lips, and nails rivaled Jackie's for its vitality. Archer could only stare open-mouthed at her for a few seconds. Miss Crabtree? What in the world do you... Well, you look... different. She glanced down at herself, and the woman's pleased look gave her inner feeling away. I'm meeting someone. 
Where would that be, I wonder? said Archer, as he made a show of eyeing the cat's meow, which was the only place down this way worth going to, and that still had its lights on and its door unlocked. Where that would be is none of your business. What are you doing here? Just stretching my legs and getting some fresh air. You wouldn't possibly be thinking of going into that bar. What bar would that be? The cat's meow, right there. Oh, is that what that is, a bar? Of course, it's a... She paled a bit and looked down at her peep toe shoes. Archer said, I guess you've been in to see for yourself. I wouldn't know. She squeezed her black envelope handbag and continued to study the toes of her high heels with evident concern. There is no law against me enjoying a drink every now and again? No law at all, ma'am. I would join you if I could, but it would violate rule number 14, and possibly 15 and 16, depending on how things turned out. There might be others, but those will surely do. She eyed his clothes. Your new suit fits you very well. And that dress is very pretty, and your hair down that way gives your face a nice framing. She touched her hair and tried, but could not manage to suffocate the smile that appeared on her face. Thank you, she said with a level of shyness that he had a hard time reconciling with the unyielding parole officer. Are you working on your pickle of a problem? I am indeed. It's why I'm here at this particular spot. She glanced at the bar. You think he might show up here? Mr. Piddleman, I mean? Well, the man told me he's here every day except Saturday and the Sabbath, when he's with his wife. And I know that for a fact since I was at his house on Saturday. Why did you go there? He's paying me, so I thought it right to explain things to him. But from what you told me this morning, he wasn't very understanding. No, but he was very clear on what I needed to do if I wanted to get paid. But now with the collateral all burned up, we have to go in a different direction. I've been thinking about some options to give him, and see if he has any ideas. Always a good thing to give a man options and let him know what's what. Yes, I agree, that is smart. Well, I have to be smart since he pretty much told me he was going to hurt me bad if I didn't finish the job. He threatened you with bodily harm? That's a crime. Who's going to call him on that? From what I've heard, he owns just about anything worth owning around here. Well, he doesn't own the law. Or me. Never figured he could afford you, Miss Crabtree. She smiled at this comment, but then caught herself and her expression returned to neutral. So what will you do when you see him tonight? Tell him the truth. Tell him about the burned-out car and give him some ideas going forward. At the least, I figure it'll buy me a little time to sort things out. I mean, I can't collect what doesn't exist anymore. He paused and eyed the bar. Well, don't let me keep you. Is the person you're meeting already in there, or are you meeting him out here? She ignored this and said, If things don't work out with Mr. Piddleman, I have other positions, as I said. You can earn money to pay him back what you owe. I really do appreciate that, Miss Crabtree. More than you can know. But the fact is, the slaughterhouse job doesn't really appeal to me. Now, old Dickie Dill might favor bashing hog skulls in for cash in his pocket. But it's not something I'm suited for, being human and all. He thought she might laugh at this last part. But she fought it long and hard, and her cold side won the day. A job is a job. You think everybody loves what they do for a living? Do you? I do not have to answer that. I know that. I'm just making conversation, since you're still here. This seemed to sting her a bit, something he had clearly not intended. Well, I'll let you get on with your thinking, then. Hiding his self-inflicted chagrin, he tipped his new hat at her and watched as the woman crossed the street and entered the cat's meow without a backward glance at him. He was cursing himself for having now messed up twice with beautiful young women when he saw the pair navigating down the street. Piddleman was dressed in a seersucker suit with a boater hat, sporting a red and blue band, and brown and white wingtip shoes. Jackie Tuttle rode on his left arm and was bedecked in a tight lavender dress and a short-waisted white jacket with narrow lapels over it. Her legs were encased in black-seamed stockings, and her feet in black heels with fancy laces around her ankles, the mere sight of which gave Archer the spine shivers. She wore a lavender beret over her dark hair. 
He had never seen a more beautiful woman, other than Ernestine Crabtree minutes before. If someone had told him a place like Polka City could hold two such alluring women, he would have called the person either a liar or cockeyed beyond belief. He slunk back behind a conveniently placed sycamore growing up out of the street as they passed, and so they did not see him as they entered the bar. About two hours later, Ernestine Crabtree exited the premises. Archer looked for but failed to see the companion to whom she had referred. He kept behind the tree as she looked around, perhaps for him, or possibly others. Then despite the height of her heels, she began walking quickly down the street with elegant strides of her long legs. He watched her go until she was nearly out of sight. He was about to turn back, when Archer saw something that made him leave his post outside the bar and take up following Crabtree. Chapter 12 These boys just don't take a hint, thought Archer. The subject of his frustration was the burly and unkempt Dan Bullock, who was currently following Crabtree. This was why Archer had left his post at the cat's meow. His fellow ex-con was stealthily making his way from cover point to cover point as the woman walked along. Archer felt he was back in Italy, threading his way through a bombed-out village as he slipped along in the hopes of uncovering some information to help him and his fellow soldiers. He knew very well what Bullock was doing. He just didn't know the exact particulars of his intentions in following a woman late at night. But he knew that none of them were good for Crabtree. They had entered a neighborhood of cute bungalows with little shutters on the windows and tiny brown lawns. Archer thought it seemed like a nice place to call home. Bullock seemed to like these surroundings better for his purposes. He picked up his pace, closing the distance between him and his prey. There was no one else around, except for Archer, twenty yards behind. Bullock took something from his pocket. Under the moonlight, Archer saw a flash of metal. It was a knife. Archer started to sprint forward. He needn't have bothered. When Bullock was still five feet from his target, Crabtree turned. From her sizable envelope purse, the woman had taken a walnut-gripped thirty-eight Colt Detective Special snub-nosed with a three-inch barrel. She took aim at Bullock's broad chest as the big man came to a stop so fast he nearly toppled over. What in the hell? he cried out. Crabtree calmly looked him over and noted the knife in his right hand. Mr. Bullock, first drop the knife before I put a large hole in you. He immediately did so. Second, I hope you see that this means your parole is hereby revoked. The authorities will be coming to arrest you just as soon as I tell them what you've done. A pale Bullock took a step back. Look here, ma'am. I don't want to go back to no Carterock. Then why were you following me with a knife? I... Clear out, she barked, startling the man. Now! He turned and sprinted off. Crabtree watched him go until she could see him no longer. She bent down and, using a handkerchief, picked up the knife and put it in her purse. She continued on into one of the bungalows. A light came on in the hall, and then another in the front room on the right side of the bungalow. Archer drew closer and assumed this was probably her bedroom. He could see her silhouette against a lowered window shade. Then she drew the curtains across it, cutting off his view. He turned and hustled back to the cat's meow, his already high respect for Crabtree growing immeasurably. He had barely taken up position behind the sycamore tree when the door to the bar opened and out staggered Hank Piddleman with Jackie on his arm. Yet she seemed to be carrying him more than he was carrying himself, and it was apparently a struggle for the woman. While Archer was standing there, Piddleman turned and slapped her across the face, knocking her beret off. The sudden blow almost caused Jackie to fall over and take him with her. Archer had stayed his hand in the bar when Piddleman had acted the same, and he'd held his objection because of the look Jackie had given him. But not this time, he decided. He rushed across the street and came up beside the pair. Piddleman didn't seem to have the capacity to recognize him or anyone else, but as he lifted his hand to take another swing at Jackie, Archer smoothly put his hand under the man's arm, blocking him from doing so. Jackie, her cheek reddened where he'd struck her, looked over, smiled, 
and mouthed, thank you. She bent down and retrieved her hat. Instead of attempting to put it back on, she simply shoved it into her jacket pocket. What the hell? snapped Piddleman. Then he clutched his head and spit something up. Archer had to move his foot out of the way to avoid getting his new shoes besmirched by the man's vomit. Too much to drink? he asked Jackie, as Piddleman started to rattle nonsense once more. How'd you guess? You okay where he- I'm fine. I've been hit a lot harder than that. They lurched along with Piddleman talking mostly incomprehensibly. Where are we taking him? asked Archer. He's got a place in town. He nodded, and they kept walking, cradling the gimpy-legged Piddleman between them. It surprised Archer when Jackie led him to the Derby Hotel. What, this is where he stays? Yes, he's on the top floor. Archer's jaw slackened another few degrees. What room? Two of them they've put together for him. 615 and 617. I'm in 610. Jackie looked over at him, her features full of possibility. Why, that's right down the hall, Archer. When Piddleman failed completely to continue standing even with assistance, Archer took off his hat and said, Hold this for me, Jackie. He squatted down and hefted Piddleman into the air over his shoulder with one clean thrust of his legs. You are a strong man, Archer, she said approvingly. Yeah, well, at least I'm something. Lead the way. With the load he was carrying, Archer forced himself to ride the elevator up though he closed his eyes while doing so. They got to the room, and Jackie dug into her purse for the key. She stuck it in the lock while Archer stood there with Piddleman slung over his shoulder like a carcass kill. Jackie swung the door wide and waved Archer in. He strode in, saw the bed, and deposited Piddleman there. Quiet snores were now emanating from him. Archer looked around as Jackie handed him back his hat. What's he need two rooms for? He doesn't need them, he just wanted them. Well, that makes no sense whatsoever. Makes sense to him. And didn't you know? Know what? Hank owns the hotel. Archer took a step back and looked down at the sleeping mess of a man. Hell, what doesn't he own? Not much. Archer looked her over. If anything, her dress was even tighter and more revealing than the one from the other night. Jackie caught him eyeing her and sat on the edge of the bed, taking all the time in the world to cross one gleaming, stockinged leg over the other. Well, he's taken care of. Now what? He looked down at her. Any ideas? We can go to your room for a drink. I had some gin, but it's gone now. She reached into her purse and pulled out a small flask. Problem solved. Last gal I saw with a flask pulled it out of her stockings. Her smile was wide, warm, and inviting, and caused Archer to go weak-kneed. She edged her skirt high enough to get his undivided attention. Well, as you can see, I am wearing stockings. But I'll keep that in mind for next time, Archer. You're counting on a next time? I like math. I can count really high. She rose. In fact, to 610. Let's go. Okay to leave him like that? I leave him like that all the time. They made the short walk to Archer's room after she locked Piddleman's door behind them. He opened the door to his room and let her go in first. He shut the door behind him and pocketed the key. She picked up two short glasses off the scarred dresser and poured out a portion of the contents of the flask into each one. Archer observed that she measured with precision. You like things just so, he noted. Just so, she replied, handing him a glass and then clinking hers against his. She pressed the glass against her injured cheek. You're going to have a bruise there, he said. Wouldn't be the first time. Back in the bar that night? He looked down at her wrist. Men have to show off, Archer. If they can't do it with their brains, and most often they can't, they do it with the fact that they're stronger than women. Hank's not stupid, but he's no better than most men when it comes to that. Doesn't make it right. Are you telling me you've never struck a woman? 
Never even thought about hitting one. She raised her glass to him. Glad to hear it. She took a drink and looked him up and down. So you never told me why you got the new clothes. Wanna look the part. What part is that? Professional debt collector for one drunk asshole. He grinned and took a swallow of his drink, while she laughed loud and long, something that both surprised and pleased him. She ran a hand up and down his jacket while he tossed his new hat down on the bed. Where do we go from here? He wanted to know. Jackie moved slowly around the room while she sipped her drink, swaying maybe to some tune in her head. She reached the window, drew back the curtain, and looked out onto the dryness of Polka City. I have no plan, Archer. I'm just feeling my way. What were you doing outside the bar tonight? Waiting for you to come out with Mr. Piddleman. Why? Needed to update him on things. Like what? Like your daddy torched his 1947 Cadillac, so there's no way for me to get it back. And how do you know this? She said, looking at him with interest. I went out there last night with the idea of getting the car. It wasn't where you thought it might be. I found it in a little clearing not too far from there, in the middle of a bunch of pine trees. She continued to gaze at him, her hand perched on one hip. That used to be my secret spot, Archer, when I was little. I'd go there and pretend to be all sorts of things. A princess, Amelia Earhart, Jean Harlow, and Madame Curie. Well, right now it's got a mess of a burned-up car, and it's been there a while, long before I went out there asking about it. I wonder why he did that. To spite Piddleman. Make sure the man's never going to collect so long as you're with him. Then he's a fool. Not sure about that. Piddleman told me he's not taking Tuttle to court because it might cause embarrassment for his wife. Jackie smiled and said, He really told you that? I went out there to see him, and that's what he said. You don't think he was telling the truth? Who knows? I find the truth coming out of folks' mouths less and less these days. He sat on the one chair while she slipped off her shoes, taking so long to undo the straps around her ankles that it forced Archer to look down into his drink before something happened he might later come to regret. But that water might already be over the dam. She dropped her heels on the floor, took her legs up under her haunches, and perched there like a queen on her throne. But it wasn't a throne. It was Archer's bed. This is getting interesting, Archer, don't you think? She said in that husky, and now whiskey-draped voice. He looked up, cradling his drink and taking another short swallow. Could be. You know, all the others just tried to steal that damn caddy in the middle of the night. May they rest in peace. I took a different tack. Just my nature. You're the path-less-traveled sort of man, are you? It seems to me that if I just follow along with everybody else, my life will always be crowded with folks I don't necessarily care to spend time with. Now, you can't accede to my father's request, and you can't fulfill Hank's either, and you spent money and you can't pay Hank back. You seem different than you did in the bar that first night. I mean, the way you talk and all. Hank likes me a certain way, so I'm that certain way when I'm around him. What way is that? You're a college boy. Do you know what chattel is? Like property. Right, that's what Hank likes, owning things. And he also likes girlish giggles, flighty, flirty, his hand freely grabbing my ass, and all that goes with it. That also includes the occasional insult, slap, or punch. And you're okay with that? If I weren't, I wouldn't let him do it. You're educated, aren't you? I mean, you sound it. I went to college, too. Only I graduated. She tacked on a smile and eyebrow hiked to this. What did you study? Psychology. How's that work for you? I can read people pretty well. Now, Hank, he's easy. You? Not so much. Always thought I wore it on my sleeve. You might be wearing something, but it's not you, Archer. Not by a long shot. Why do you want to be around a man like that? He's more than twice your age, and he's married, too. Marjorie Piddleman seems nice and respectable. That's not my issue. That's his and his wife's. As to my reasons, Hank treats me pretty well for the most part. We go out, we have a good time, 
and then I have my own time. Where do you live? In a house in El Dorado, number 27. Hank got it for me. A house, huh? Then you're a kept woman of sorts. You got that from a book, I think. I think you're right about that. You have long-term plans with old Hank? I don't really think past tomorrow. I only live in the moment. Spontaneous. He shook his head and finished his drink. I don't think I believe that. Believe what you will or won't, but let me give you an example. She set her drink down, stood, and slipped off her jacket, revealing her dress straps and bare shoulders. She pulled down the straps, reached around to the back of her neck, undid a clasp there, pulled down the zipper, and commenced to wiggle herself free from the dress's constraints, while Archer could only watch with rapt attention. Finally, the fabric hit the floor. She stepped out of the pile of dress and stood there with not much on except her stockings, garter belt, and underwear. Archer found he could not look away, not even if a regiment of Nazis were bearing down on him with Hitler leading the pack. He'd seen naked or nearly naked women before in four different countries. He had never seen one that stirred his heart like this woman. Her body was icy pale and soft in every place that mattered to a man. Her mouth was infinitely kissable, and her contrasting Veronica Lake dark peekaboo had never seemed more in reach for a man like him. She put an exclamation point on this by twirling around for him. Are my intentions now made clear? She said, coming to face him. Because I'm not sure what else I can do, quite honestly. I think I get the point. I'm truly relieved. And Hank? He's not here now, is he? Do I have a say in this? Her face fell. I think that's a given. But if you're not interested... She bent down to pick up her dress, but he gripped her by the shoulders, pulling her straight up. You're taller without my shoes, hon, she said, looking up at him. I suppose I am. You have a nice mug, Archer, good bones, not too handsome and not too scary. Moderation is a good thing, but not all of the time. He looked down at her and noticed the bruises on her arms, upper thighs, and obliques. His features darkening, he said, What the hell happened there? You fall? She didn't even look at where he was staring. Nothing important, Archer, nothing at all. You sure? I mean, if Piddleman did... She put a hand over his mouth. Focus. I need you to focus. The night's not getting any younger, and neither are we. She stood on her tippy toes and put her lips against his. A moment later, they toppled as one onto the bed. Chapter 13 When he woke early the next morning, she was gone. And Archer wasn't surprised. She seemed like a cat to him affectionate when she wanted to be, and off again when she'd gotten her fill. A loud noise from somewhere out in the hall had catapulted him groggily from his slumbers. He rolled out of bed and saw it. She'd left her flask behind, perched on the dresser. He hefted it and heard the slosh of contents inside. Maybe she'd left it here because she intended to come back and retrieve it at some point. That was a thought to both spur and trouble a man. He washed up in the toilet down the hall, put on his new clothes, and stepped out of his room. Piddleman's room was just down there. Archer wondered if that was where Jackie had gone for the duration of the night. The thought that she had left his bed to inhabit Piddleman's gave him a pang of jealousy that within the span of two strides, he decided he had no right to feel. Still, he walked briskly down the hall to number 615 and was surprised to see the door slightly ajar. He gripped the knob and opened it just a crack so he could see inside. With the light streaming in from the windows, he gazed around the room and saw Piddleman still stretched out on the bed. He smiled when he thought about the hangover the man was going to wake up to. But despite his earlier thoughts, there was no sign of Jackie. He was about to leave when he saw it. The towel on the floor. And next to it, something that glinted in the creeping glow of sunlight, but that he couldn't make out precisely. He gave a searching look up and down the hall. No one was about yet, for it was still early, 
He swung the door all the way in, stepped inside, and closed it behind him. The last thing he wanted was to disturb the sleeping man, but he thought of a ready explanation if Piddleman woke up and saw him. He scurried over to the towel and squatted down. The object next to it was a switchblade, like the one he had seen Piddleman use at the bar to spear the twenties and not so subtly threaten him. The blade was open. Archer looked at the towel and knife more closely, and then became rigid. They were both coated with blood. He stood, walked over to the bed, and looked down at Piddleman. The man wasn't asleep, nor was he awake. He was just dead. The slit under his throat was wide and deep. The person wielding the knife had driven the blade into its full length, and then worked it jaggedly from side to side, like opening a can of soup. This wasn't necessary to kill the man. It was done to mutilate. And that thought sickened Archer. The dead man, his clothes, and the bed covers under him were soaked in dried blood. It must have been a gusher when the blade had hit the big arteries. He knew this for certain. Archer had killed a German near Salerno in hand-to-hand fighting. He'd been lucky to get the advantage, and the German had been unlucky to lose his grip in what might have been the coldest winter Italy had ever seen. Though he hadn't been nearly as vicious as the person who had dispatched Piddleman to the hereafter, Archer had slit the German's throat from basically ear to ear, just as he'd been taught. That way you didn't have to worry about your opponents having a second opportunity to take your life. Archer had been covered in the German's blood when twin geysers had erupted from the severed arteries feeding his brain. He thought whoever had killed Piddleman would have the same foul coating. His next thought was one of self-interest. He rummaged in the man's pocket and pulled out the thick wad of cash, which seemed about as hefty as the last time Archer had seen it. Well, it didn't look like robbery had been the reason to kill the man. And yet for Archer now to peel a few twenties off would not diminish it a jot. The man's widow would have plenty left over. And Archer might have indeed done so, for he was no better than most when it came to levels of selfishness. But he made the mistake of looking at the man's eyes. They were wide open and seemed to be staring intensely up at him, carrying with them a look not of disapproval, but of betrayal. If a dead man's eyes could really convey that emotion, they had just done so to Aloysius Archer. He slowly put the wad back, with not a single twenty plucked from its hide, and then used his fingers to close the man's flat, glassy eyes. Archer had done this very thing on battlefields more times than he ever cared to remember. It had been gospel among American soldiers that a dead comrade with open eyes could still see the violent carnage of his own death and would therefore never have a restful afterlife. Archer wasn't particularly fond of Piddleman. He really didn't know the man, and what he'd learned about him was not especially heartwarming. Yet he could see no reason to deprive him an element of peace and death. But then something occurred to him. He looked in the other pocket and pulled out the promissory notepapers given by one Lucas Tuttle to now a dead man. He slipped these in his jacket pocket, they might come in handy down the road. A moment later, and after fully realizing the peril of his current situation, Archer stepped away from the bed, back to the door, and left the room of the murdered man, after giving another look up and down the hall. Slightly dazed by what he'd seen, though he had viewed deaths far more horrible than Piddleman's, and in far greater numbers, Archer hurried back to his room and had himself a nip from the flask. There was a difference between killing on the battlefield where it was expected and murder in a hotel room where it wasn't or at least shouldn't be a common occurrence. He took out the papers and studied the legal writing there. He looked at the amount owed and the signature of Lucas Tuttle. He flipped back to the page with the collateral listed and saw the Cadillac's description. That collateral no longer existed, but that didn't matter now. These papers were worth $5,000 plus interest to, he supposed, Piddleman's widow, and at least sixty dollars to him. But Archer wasn't sure what to do with them right now. He put the papers away in his jacket pocket. His nerves steadied a bit. He walked down the stairs to the hotel lobby, sat in the same cane-back chair Jackie had, stared at the empty fireplace, and thought about what to do. There was one prime suspect, at least to his mind. 
He knew that Jackie Tuttle was well aware of the dead man's location last night, having helped transport him to that very spot. And Archer had no idea how early she had left his room, him being sound asleep after their lovemaking. And he had no clue as to how long Piddleman had been dead, though it was not a recent death, the blood having dried and the body having cooled considerably. Archer knew that they had reached his room at just about the crack of eleven, because a clock from somewhere outside had bonged the time. A few hours after that, Jackie could have left Archer, done the deed, and departed to her home on Eldorado Street. But why kill a man who had given her a house and money and all? He walked over to the front desk, where a different clerk from the one who had signed him in was drinking a cup of coffee. He was small with thin cheeks and dark hair cut close to the scalp. His bow tie was green against a pale white shirt with a wool vest over it. His cheeks and nose carried the red sheen of a heavy drinker, and the heavy pouches under his eyes spoke of many nights with little or no sleep. Help you? asked the man. Yeah, I was wondering if you saw a young lady leave early this morning. And who are you? Archer. I'm in room 610. And what young lady would that be? Archer described Jackie Tuttle, but didn't give her name. The man looked back at him primly and said, I didn't see anyone. You sure about that? What time did you come on duty? You ask a lot of questions. What's your business with this person? Just making an inquiry about a lady. If you don't know, you don't know. Would she have been coming out of your room this morning? This ain't that kind of place, mister. Well, thanks for telling me. And also thanks for nothing, pal. As soon as he started walking to the door of the hotel, Archer could feel the man's gaze on his back. He wished he hadn't said what he had. Now there'd be a direct line among him, Jackie Tuttle, and the dead Piddleman. As a scout in the army and as an inmate in a prison, Archer had never made an error like that. And he wondered why he had in Polka City of all places. Well, maybe he knew why. A woman was involved. Archer just had a weakness there that disrupted his otherwise flawless instincts at self-preservation. He walked along, hands drilled into his pockets, wondering if he should break his parole and make a run for it now. Archer decided against that, and made a detour after asking a man for directions. El Dorado Street was about a half mile away, nearing the edge of Polka's compact downtown. It was a neighborhood of quaint small homes that looked like something you'd see in a Hollywood picture. Number 27 was maybe the nicest of them all, he thought with pretty little white shutters and flowers in both pots and dirt beds already looking for sun at this hour, and no doubt thirsting for water. The brick siding was painted white, and the front porch had a little overhang with a metal chair and matching tables set near the front door. Unlike some of the other homes, there was no automobile parked in the short gravel driveway. Archer observed as much of the house as he could, checked around for folks who might be watching him, saw none at this still early hour, and headed up to 27's front door. He knocked, waited, and knocked again. Then he heard feet padding toward him. The door was opened, and there stood Jackie, in a thin, form-fitting bathrobe that looked to Archer like something out of Chinatown in New York. It was crimson, and had dragons and elongated masks, and symbols of other such oriental influence emblazoned across the fabric. She was barefoot, her face puffy and free of makeup, and her hair looked slept on. She rubbed her eyes and exclaimed, Archer, what in the world are you doing here? You were gone when I got up. Well, I wasn't going to spend the night there. She smiled. Did you like it so much last night that you came around here for more? Can I come in? I suppose. You want some coffee? Now that I'm up, I intend to brew some. That'll be swell, yeah. She led him into a small living room and pointed to a chair. Black or something in it? She asked. Just black. She left and he looked around. He didn't know if the furniture had come with the place, but it looked like it had. It was stuffy and old and downtrodden, and he couldn't imagine the stylish young woman picking it on her own. A few minutes later, she came back with a small wooden tray holding two cups of coffee perched on delicate saucers. She handed one to him and took the other. On a plate on the tray were also a couple pieces of toast, buttered. Help yourself, she said, yawning. 
You look hungry. For food or something else? She added enticingly. Food will do for now. He sipped the coffee, which was hot and strong and bitter, just the way he liked it. And the bread and butter felt good going down with the coffee and helped to settle his rumbling stomach. What time did you end up leaving my room? He asked. What? Why? He shrugged. Just wondering. Didn't hear anything when you went. Well, I was quiet. Didn't want to wake you. You were sleeping so good. She smiled and stroked his arm. I wonder why. She let her hand drop and added, You were really something last night, Archer. Compared to Hank, well, there was no comparison. But he's old. And not getting any older, Archer thought. You check on him before he came here? She took some of her coffee and a bite of toast. Check on him? What for? He was dead asleep when we left him. Archer managed not to wince at the unintended irony of her word. Just wondering. He would have passed right by his door and all. I came straight away here and fell into bed. You wore me out. He abruptly took off his hat and drank his coffee fast enough to where it burned going down. You thought any more about how to get that debt paid? Yeah, you can go back home to your daddy. Any other way? Because that's not an option. Was it really that bad there? What's it to you? I'm just trying to understand things. No, you just want your crummy money. Okay, that's part of it. And I can understand why you want to be on your own. But your daddy seems nice when he's not pointing his Remington at you. You met my father exactly once. How in the world could you possibly think you know him? That's fair enough. I know you loved your mother. Desiree told me that. Even showed me her picture. Archer thought this would please the woman. But by her flushed face and angry features, this had been a serious miscalculation on his part. I don't like the fact that you're snooping around my business, Archer. See here, I didn't ask the woman to tell me that or show me her picture. She just did. And your mom was beautiful. You take after her, not your dad. Jackie's features softened. I do take after my mom. And she was beautiful. On the inside, too. I can see that. There was a lot of sweetness in the picture. But she could get angry, and she never shrank from giving her opinion on anything. Like mother, like daughter. She smiled at this, and Archer, heartened by how the conversation was going now, followed that up with a question which he regretted as soon as it left his mouth. So how'd your mother die, then? The flush came back to the face, and in her anger, Jackie stood and glared down at him. Why in the hell does that have anything to do with you? What right do you have to even ask it? I'm... I'm sorry. I have no right at all to ask it. And I didn't mean to... She cut him off. I don't want to talk about it, Archer. And if that's the reason you came, then you can finish your coffee and get the hell out. It's not the reason I came. What then? Your daddy thinks Piddleman has defiled you. This did nothing to quell her anger at him. He has defiled me, and it felt good. Why don't you go back there and tell him that, you bastard? Archer, getting worked up himself, shook his head disapprovingly. Look, what do you have against your father? What I have or don't have against him is my business, and only mine. Do you love Hank Piddleman or what? Why? Do you want to propose? She snapped. When he looked stunned by her response, she suddenly laughed and clutched his arm. Don't go running off, Archer. I was just teasing. And I know you didn't mean to upset me, but sometimes questions like that do. She sat back down and had another sip of coffee, while Archer contemplated the mercurial nature of this so-called gentler sex. The fact is, I'm not ready to settle down. And no, I do not love Hank. Chattel does not typically love its patron. We just endure until something better comes along, if it ever does. Well, that's something I didn't know till I met you. Then I'm good for more than sex in a hotel room. You left your flask behind. I thought I might come back and get it sometime. You mind that? Before finding a dead man, the answer would have been easy enough for Archer. She looked at him peculiarly. What is up with you? You look like you've seen a ghost or something. Nice house you got here. But the furniture doesn't seem to fit you. All this was already here. 
I just brought my clothes. You said Piddleman got you this place? So who does this all belong to? The folks who lived here before? That's right, you don't know. Hank and Marjorie used to live here until he built his place outside of town. You mean his hotel of a house? She was about to reply when a knock came at the front door. She got up. Who the hell could that be at this hour? She added crossly. Hope you didn't bring any friends. Except for you, I don't have any. She cinched her robe tight and padded to the front door, while Archer rushed to the window and looked out. Chapter 14 The patrol car was parked in the gravel drive of the house. It was a wonder to Archer that they didn't hear it drive up. It was a four-door, big-grilled Hudson Hornet with a chrome engine spoiler, a single red light on top, and a chrome-plated searchlight mounted on the driver's side door. It was an intimidating vehicle that was, unfortunately, painted a dull yellow with a brown stripe down the side. It might qualify, Archer thought, for the ugliest damn car in the whole country. Archer retook his seat when he heard the squeak of the front door opening and the mumbling of words exchanged. Then he heard Jackie say in a louder voice, What? Footsteps came down the short hall, and two uniformed men, dressed all in brown except for black stripes down the sides of the pant legs, appeared behind Jackie. One was short and pudgy and about fifty. His eyes were planted on the woman's backside, accentuated as it was by the tightness of the robe and revealing that she had not a drop of anything on underneath. The other deputy was Archer's height and age. Their faces were both weathered, and their hair, when they took off their wide-brimmed tan stetsons, was smushed flat. When they saw Archer, both lawmen's faces creased to frowns. Who might this be? the older one asked. Archer slowly rose. His manner of dealing with men who wore badges and carried guns was to appear forthright and cooperative, without making sudden moves or giving away anything of importance in the way of information. Name's Archer. I was just over visiting my friend. Mighty early for a visit, said the younger man. I was thinking the same thing, Jeb, said his partner. Archer looked at Jackie. She looked like she might be sick. What is it? They just, they just told me that Hank was found dead. Dead? How? Where? The pudgy deputy said, so how do you two know each other again? What the hell does that matter, Bart? Snapped a distraught Jackie. Now look, Miss Tuttle, we're just trying to get some information, he said soothingly, now staring at her chest, where in her distress the robe had opened, revealing enough cleavage to apparently captivate the lawman. How about you find out who killed Hank? How about that? She snapped. Killed, said Archer. Somebody killed him? Hell, yes, they did, proclaimed Jeb excitedly. Bloody as all get out. Never had one like that in poker before. How do you know Hank Piddleman? Bart wanted to know. He hired me to do a job for him. What sort of job? asked Bart. Archer hesitated wondering how best to describe what he was doing for Piddleman without getting himself involved in the man's murder. Hey, fella, barked Jeb. You better give us the straight dope, or we're taking your butt in for some questions, and we don't ask nice in Poker City. Before Archer could say anything, Jackie blurted out, Oh, hell, Hank just, he just hired him to collect a debt from my daddy. Jackie now had a good deal more twang to her voice than Archer had previously noted. Collect money from your daddy? said Bart. Through teary eyes, Jackie said sharply, Yes, okay. What the hell does that matter? Hank's dead. You have to find out who did it. She drilled a finger into Bart's broad chest. Okay, okay, we will. Now this debt, do you know where the paperwork for it is? Archer involuntarily ran his hand along his jacket pocket where these very papers were. Jackie stifled her sobs, covered her mouth for a long moment, looking like she might be sick and said slowly, he kept them in his coat pocket. Last time I saw them, they were there. We didn't find nothing like that in his pockets. Jackie glared at him. Then do your job and look somewhere else. How's that for a plan, Bart? An angry Bart turned his attention to Archer. Where are you from, son? East of here, 
took a bus in. From where? The lawman asked again, his features flexing raw and determined. No way around it. Archer said, Tartupa. Bart and Jeb exchanged glances. One thing in Tartupa that I know of, said Bart, and the bus does come here, sure enough it does. What are you going on about? said Jackie, more tears starting to collect in her eyes. Carterock prisons in Tartupa, volunteered Jeb. Ex-cons come here for parole. Archer isn't an ex-con, she said, turning to him. Are you? Now this was a predicament Archer had to concede. But it wasn't like he could lie about where he had come from. All they had to do was check his name or go to Ernestine Crabtree and ask her. And you lie to the law? They never seemed to forget. They seemed to take it personally, in fact. I did my time, said Archer. What? exclaimed Jackie. Then you are an ex-con? Bart looked triumphant, even as his partner's hand stole to the forty-five long-barreled pistol riding in his holster. It was a movement not lost on Archer. What did they have you busting rocks for? Bart asked. Breaking the law. Bart's triumphant expression vanished, and his hand too went to his gun, as Jackie, looking confused, took a step back. I'll ask you one more time, and one more time only, Bart said. The law said I stole something. What was that? A car. Bart snapped. Shit, they don't send a man to no car to rock prison for stealing a damn car. You lying to me, boy. I won't have it. This was a special car. What kind of special car? It was the car belonging to the mayor of the town I was passing through. Okay, but still, and his daughter was in the car with me. Jeb guffawed, but Bart didn't look pleased. You kidnapped the mayor's daughter? No, she was there voluntarily. Oh, really? Well, she had her suitcase with her, with all her worldly possessions in it. Fact was, she didn't want to spend her life in some podunk town, and I was her ticket out. But we didn't have a ride, so we borrowed- You said you stole it, interjected Bart. No, I said the law said I stole it. The daughter was the one who took the car, and since it belonged to her father, I don't see how that could be stealing. We were going to drop it off in the next town over and take the train. Things didn't work out that way. What happened then? They caught up to us before we could get on the train and the mayor got his daughter to say things about me and what happened that weren't true. And that got me sent to Carterock for a spell. Bart rubbed his cheek while Archer glanced at Jackie to see her staring at him with hurt eyes. Bart said, Well, that ain't why we're here. The fact is, Mr. Hank Piddleman was killed, and we're here to tell Miss Tuttle. Why her? asked Archer. Because they were friends. Something glinted in Bart's eyes. Hey now, where are you staying? Archer had wondered when the lawman would get around to that. Jackie answered for him. He's staying at the Derby, same as Hank. Bart wheeled around on Archer. Oh, you are, are you? Oh, for God's sake, Bart, said Jackie, who had finally settled down and dried her eyes. He didn't kill Hank any more than I did. Hank hired the man. With him gone, so is Archer's job. How does that make sense? Bart's gleeful look faded. Is that a fact? That's a fact, confirmed Archer. Have you told Marjorie yet? Asked Jackie sharply. When Archer looked at her, he could tell the woman's mind was going a hundred miles an hour. We just found the body, said Bart. Maid walked in on him and almost lost her damn breakfast in the process. You know it's a hike out to their place, but we'll get there. Wanted to come by and tell you since you're closer. Jackie nodded and managed a brief smile. Well, I appreciate that, I truly do. Archer was having a hard time following all this, but waited until the lawmen, who each gave him a stern, suspicious look, had departed. Jackie sat down and looked vacantly across the room, while Archer went to the window to confirm the law was actually leaving him alone for now. He sat down opposite the woman and said, can you explain something to me? What's that, Archer? She said wearily. 
The law knows about you and Piddleman? Yes, so? Just strikes me as a little odd. And the fact that they'd come here first and tell you before even letting his widow know. Well, like Bart said, I'm a lot closer. It's nearly an hour out to Marjorie's. Is this not a God-fearing place? Come again? I mean that people just accept the fact that you and Piddleman have this arrangement, and they're all good with it. Having met his missus, I know that she knows about you, which strikes me as even odder. Oh, that, said Jackie. Well, I saved their marriage in a way. I guess folks appreciate that. Maybe even Marjorie. Archer could tell by the way that she said this last part the woman didn't fully believe it. And what way would that be, he said, looking at her funny. Hank would have left her for sure if it weren't for me. Everybody knows that. I'm not following any of this, so just slow it down and let me have it. Take your time. I want to understand this. I don't have time to take my time, Archer, she said curtly. But I'll tell you this. Hank doesn't, didn't love Marjorie anymore and would have thrown her over in a minute. I mean, divorced her and married someone else. And there were several eligible ladies waiting in the wings, I can tell you that. But then I came along, and I fed Hank's need. Not just in the bedroom. At his age, he wasn't really interested very much, but in having a pretty young thing on his arm to show off to folks in town. You saw that in the bar, certainly. Archer nodded. Well, it made him feel, well, more virile. You know that word? I've heard it, yeah. Hank spends time with me in town, and then he goes home to Marjorie for a couple of days and comes back to town on Mondays. Marjorie knew I had no interest in marrying the man. Wait a minute. How did Marjorie find out about all this between you and Piddleman? I suppose he told her? No, I did. You? I insisted on it. I'm not going behind another woman's back like that. When Archer still looked confused, she came over to sit next to him. I know it's complicated, but it was sort of like a negotiation. I wanted money in a place of my own. Hank wanted a young woman to walk around with and show off, and Marjorie wanted to stay in a big house. In the end, everyone got what they wanted. So are you happy? asked Archer. Well, I was, until I found out Hank was dead. And now? Now, who knows? I'm sort of left out in the cold. Your daddy, he began, does not figure into the equation of my happiness, she said firmly. Then her expression changed. I should go out and see Marjorie later today. We'll need to let Bart tell her first, of course. You want to come with me? Archer looked at her for the longest time until he nodded yes. What in the world do you think happened to Hank? She said. Who could have killed him? How did he die? Jeb just said it was bloody. Beats me, replied Archer. Chapter 15 Where'd you get this thing? Asked Archer, as by prearrangement, he was standing in front of the Derby Hotel later that day. His query had been prompted by Jackie's pulling up in a spanking brand new Ford or Nash Ambassador painted a two-tone blue. It looked like a big-butted bullet about to be launched down the road. Hank gave it to me, she said through the open driver's window. He gave you a house and a car? Well, yes. He wanted me to be able to get around in style, after all. I didn't see the Nash parked at your house. That's because I don't keep it at my house. I keep it in a garage not too far from my place. Do you know what the sun beating down here can do to a car's paint? And don't get me started on the dust. Get in. Archer slid into the passenger seat, and no more than a second passed between his hitting the fabric and Jackie hitting the gas. The Nash sprung forward so fast it snapped Archer's head back against the seat. She glanced over at him in her reflector sunglasses as he looked at her in annoyance. I like to move fast, Archer. You'll just have to get used to it. Archer rolled his window down and kept a hold of his hat, or he would have lost it to the back seat while they were still in downtown Polka City. He ran his gaze over the woman. She was dressed in a below-the-knee black dress with a dark pyramid coat on over it, a felt hat with a bow on the side, sheer black stockings, and demure shoes with low clunky heels. He supposed it was the morning wear of chattel. It was a good look for her, not that anything wouldn't be. They drove for nearly an hour by the sun, and this was confirmed by his watch. 
When the house came into view, Archer whistled. Damn, place looks bigger than when I was here the first time. Maybe it keeps growing all on its own like a tree. Jackie honked the horn as they pulled up to the gate. About thirty seconds later, Manuel emerged and opened the gates for them. Thank you, Manuel, said Jackie as she drove on through, while Archer studied the house. How big is this thing, really? he asked. I have no idea, but it's big enough, don't you think? Whose cars are those? he asked, pointing to a little park off where two vehicles sat. They weren't there last time I came. That's Hank's Buick Convertible and Marjorie's Cadillac Coupe de Ville. Nice rides, though we won't be needing his anymore. Jackie pulled to the front of the house and they got out. Archer slapped the dust off his hat and then put it back on as he looked around. He lit up a Lucky and flicked the spent match into the dirt. He drew down on the Lucky and said, Actually, I can see why Piddleman would put up a place like this. Why? she asked. He'd want everybody driving by to know that this was his place and only he could build it. That's why. I like that about you, Archer. What's that? You see things. Just have to open your eyes. She flicked him a knowing look. Now ain't that the truth. Archer had to step back quickly, because he had almost crushed some of the encroaching flowers when he had started to head up the flagstone walk. When he regained his balance, he watched Jackie walk right into the house without knocking. Archer tossed his cigarette and quickly followed. Inside, he said, you think the law's been here to tell her? Though he had been here before, there were so many things to see. He hadn't glimpsed them all. Now he eyed a vase of silk flowers about as tall as he was. Right next to that was a stuffed fox on a wooden pedestal staring at him while in a hunting crouch. On the wall above that was a tapestry of a Revolutionary War battle scene, hung from an ornately carved piece of what looked to be teak. It depicted gallant men dying gallantly, seemingly without a thought as to their personal safety, only elegant patriotic sacrifice in their dignified countenances. It was something Archer had never once seen in three-plus years of actual combat. For him, it had been a tedious and spartan existence intersected with chaos, fear, and times of sporadic bravery mingled with anger, panic, hatred, self-pity, and sadness at those who had fallen, followed by a guilty relief at still being alive when the shooting had stopped. Jackie said, They have, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Then she called out, Marjorie! The same elderly sourpuss woman in a maid's uniform toddled out into view. Mrs. Piddleman's in the conservatory, Miss Jackie. Thank you, Agnes. Miss Jackie, thought Archer. One would think his companion was mistress of the place. Jackie led the way down the same long hall that Piddleman had led Archer on his first visit here. She stopped at a door and took a deep breath, seeming to collect herself for the confrontation ahead. You okay? he asked. She looked up at him. You ever felt like you were walking into the lion's den? Yeah, it was called World War II. Well, that's how I'm feeling right now. But you said Marjorie got what she- That means nothing now, Archer, not with Hank dead. I could walk in there and get my ass handed to me. Archer looked at her in confusion. Well, here goes nothing, she said to herself. Jackie opened the door and strode in. Archer followed and closed the door behind them. This was the room he'd been in before, only he didn't know it was called a conservatory. In the same chair she'd been perched in before was Marjorie. Sitting in front of the woman was a tall glass with chunky ice in it and an amber-colored liquid halfway up. Jackie walked right up to the woman and swept her arms around her. Oh, God, Marjorie, I'm so sorry. Marjorie Piddleman looked up at her and then glanced at Archer. Her face was shiny with tears. As he had thought before, while the woman was nothing to write home about in the looks department, Archer was once more struck by the delicate refinement in her features that bespoke of perhaps a sympathetic soul within. A soul that was clearly in distress right now. I can't believe it. I really can't. Why, Hank was just here. I know, I know. And someone killed him? How could that be? The law won't say much at all. I don't understand it either, Marjorie. I was stunned when Bart came to tell me. 
She patted the older woman's shoulder and placed a kiss on her flat cheek. Tell me what you need, and I'll go get it or do it. Anything, Marjorie, really. I can't think of a thing. But with Hank gone, what am I supposed to do? Don't you even think about that now. Not for one second. Marjorie glanced at Archer. Where are my manners? Hello, you were here before. Hank had hired you for something or other. Archer took off his hat, and glancing nervously at Jack, he said, Yes, ma'am. Name's Archer. I'm very sorry for your loss, Mrs. Biddleman. Thank you, Mr. Archer. She looked back at Jackie. The whole world seems to be crashing down on me, but it was sweet of you to come visit. Jackie sat down next to her and took Marjorie's hand in hers. We'll get through this. They're gonna find who did this, and that person will be punished as they should be. Marjorie nodded at these words. I hope you're right, dear. I hope so. Did Bart come by, or was it someone else? No, it was Bart Coleman and the other one, the tall boy, Jeb Daniels. I guess they'll be looking into this, interjected Archer. Marjorie said, no, I don't think so. Whenever we have a murder out here, they send in someone from the state police to investigate things. How many murders do you folks have? asked Archer, his eyes growing wide. Well, every place has somebody killing somebody else, pointed out Jackie matter-of-factly. And Polka City is no exception. She patted Marjorie's hand. We'll find out what we can, and then we'll come see you again. Now you need to get some sleep. She eyed the glass. You think that's a good idea? Better than pills, I suppose. But what about all Hank's businesses? He never told me anything. I suppose there are things to do. All you need to do right now is get some rest. Here, let me help you up to bed. Archer, I won't be long. The women departed, and Archer was left to his own devices. He was about to light another Lucky, but changed his mind. He stuck it in his hat band for later. He looked out the window. In the rear, he could see numerous outbuildings, and cattle in fenced fields, crops in other fields, horses in adjacent paddocks, men and trucks and tractors and dogs racing to and fro. Crop silos rose up from the dirt like the rocket ships Archer had seen in comic books. He had seen all this on his previous trip, too, and it was just as impressive the second time around. There was a lot of business going on here, and the missus of the house didn't appear to be up for any of it. He opened the glass door and walked out into the back. He spotted Sid Duckett holding a clipboard and talking to three other men who looked tired but were listening intently. After the men left, Archer walked over to the big man, who was dressed nearly the same as before, in dirty pants, a tucked-in cotton shirt, dusty boots, and a straw hat. Guess you heard the news? Duckett nodded. Archer surveyed all the activity. A lot going on here. Yeah, but it's not just here. He's got a lot of businesses, including a bank. A bank? Man owned First City Bank in Polka, and the Derby Hotel, and the Cat's Meow. Damn, didn't know about the Cat's Meow. So what'll happen to everything now that the man's dead? Duckett looked toward the house. The missus don't really get involved in all that. Maybe sell out? Archer scratched his ear. Hell, who around here can buy all that? Well, there's Lucas Tuttle. Jackie's father? That's right. He's got a lot of land. I mean, a lot. And he's got money. At least so I've heard. So how'd he die, Archer, you know? Law says murder. Damn. You think of anybody who'd want to do him in? Duckett shook his head. He could drive a man who works for him hard. And don't I know that? and cut some tough bargains with other folks. But kill the man? Duckett took off his hat and slapped it against his leg to clear the dust off. I can't think of a one. There was at least one. He walked back into the conservatory in time for Jackie to re-enter the room. You ready? She said. I guess so. I was just talking to Sid Duckett out there. He said Piddleman owns a bank and the cat's meow. That's right. Didn't you know that? How the hell was I supposed to know that? Don't snap at me, Archer. I was just asking a question. Anyway, he said Mrs. Piddleman might have to sell out. She might and she might not, 
That's not our concern right now, is it? He said your daddy may want to buy it. Jackie looked warily at him. Is that right? Yeah, why? Nothing. How's Mrs. Piddleman doing? Terrible. She just lost her husband. Good news is she seemed to like you. I explained that, and no, she doesn't like me. If you say so. I do say so. Now, I would still like to know where those debt papers are. You got any ideas? Not a one, lied Archer, because it just seemed the smart thing to do right now. They stopped on the way back at a roadside store and got some cold cider and a bag of peanuts still in their shells. They sat in the Nash's front seat, which was so big it seemed capable of holding Archer's old platoon in its entirety. They ate and drank their fill, while an occasional truck or car passed by on the road. They just tossed the shells out the windows. Archer watched as a man on a mule trotted by with a burlap sack over his shoulder. What was the war like, Archer? He glanced over to see her sweeping peanut skins off the lap of her morning dress. What do you think war's supposed to be like? I've never been to war, it's why I'm asking. You like your questions, and so do I. It wasn't a lot of fun. Were you wounded? He finished his cold cider and laid the empty bottle on the floorboard. I was. I saw a scar on your back and another one on your leg when we were in bed. Why didn't they send you home? Because I could still fight. You ever kill anyone? That was sort of the point of me being over there. How'd you do it? What sort of question is that? I'm just trying to understand you. Why's that? I find you interesting. Shouldn't you be thinking about the dearly departed Hank Piddleman? I already told you I'm sorry he's dead, but it's not like I love the man. Do you have to give the house and car back now? It's up to Marjorie, which means I won't be able to keep them. But back to the killing. You won't let it go, will you? Well? Okay. I shot a bunch of Germans and Italians. Then I killed some with my grenades, and some with my bayonet when it came down to man-to-man slogging it out. Slit one's throat with my knife. Killed one man with my bare hands when we both ran out of bullets. Broke his neck the way I'd been taught. My God, Archer. That must have done something to you. How do you mean? You can't kill all those people and not be affected by it. It's what I was trained to do. Didn't you feel anything? Yeah. I felt damn lucky I was alive, and they weren't. She put the Nash in gear. Well, I don't see how it couldn't have affected you. I don't think about it much. Seems to work okay. Yeah, well, one day that may not work anymore. How do you know about things like that? I told you I studied psychology in college, Archer. After the First World War, men came back with shell shock, or so they termed it. The human brain was not designed for war. It changes you. You weren't a killer before you went to war, were you? Never killed anything before I went across the Atlantic, man or beast. Wait a minute. You never hunted, even? Not much to hunt where I'm from. But then you became a killer in the war. Well, I'm not in the war anymore. And I'm no killer. She gave him a worried look and steered the Nash onto the road back to Poca City. Chapter 16 After Jackie dropped him off, Archer walked down the hall of the Derby Hotel. As he passed by number 615, a man in his forties stepped out dressed in a wrinkled dark blue three-piece pinstriped suit, worn black leather shoes, and a solid red tie that could have done with some laundering. He was about 5'10 and 160 pounds, and looked lean and wiry and tough, with a face that reminded Archer of a boxer he had once seen in the ring during an impromptu match he'd attended during the war, when they'd had a brief respite from fighting. A jutting chin of granite, a nose knocked off center, two hardened lumps for cheeks, and flattened cauliflower ears. His hair was thick, unkempt, and graying. Over his mouth was a ribbon of dark mustache. He wore a black Homburg with a gray band. Most remarkably for Archer, his eyes were twin darts of crystallized coal, or close to it. They were the calmest pair of eyes Archer had ever seen. Those eyes now looked at Archer with interest. You staying here on this floor, son? The man said. Who's asking? The man opened his coat, revealing a silver pointy badge on his vest. State police. 
Detective Lieutenant Irving Shaw is asking, Mr. Archer, you're a homicide dick then? Shaw ignored this and said, so you're Archer. You were at Miss Jackie Tuttle's residence this morning, correct? The deputies reported that to me. I was. You two going out or something? Just a friend. Told the same to your deputies. A friend was at her house early in the morning. You sure you didn't spend the night? I slept here last night. I went to see Jackie at her place this morning. Why that early? Missed her, I guess. Shaw took out a worn small notebook and a stubby pencil and wrote something down. You say you slept here last night. What room? Number 610. Shaw eyed the location of Archer's room, and his bits of coal eyes lit up like someone had flamed them. You hear anything last night? Like what? Anything out of the ordinary? I haven't been here that long, so I don't think I know what's ordinary for Polka City yet. Just use your common sense, then. No, I slept pretty hard. Didn't hear anything. Shaw wrote something else down. You could have just told me that to begin with. I could have, sure. Sorry about that. You're in from Carter Rock Prison, I hear. And I served my time. Not all of it. I looked you up. You're on parole now. Ernestine Crabtree? That's right. Already reported in. Good for you. So your story is you were asleep from when to when? Oh, about midnight to six or so. You see the deceased last night? Archer had been stunned that the two deputies had not earlier asked this question. But this fellow Shaw appeared to be a far superior sort of person. He seemed to like asking questions as much as Archer did. Shaw had his pencil poised over his notebook. You hear me, Mr. Archer? Yeah, I saw him. He was drunk. Outside the cat's meow. Me and Miss Tuttle helped him to his bed in there and left. So you were at the bar last night with him? I'm not allowed in the bar. Against my parole. So it is. Then how'd you run into them? I was passing by the bar last night when I saw them come out. Miss Tuttle was having a struggle holding him up. So I helped her out. Shaw rubbed at his mustache with the pencil. And she let a stranger do that? I had met her before. Both of them, actually. Is that right? Where would that have been? Archer felt something go hard in the pit of his stomach. Around town. My first night here, actually. We struck up a conversation. Interesting man, and she was nice, too. Shaw wrote something else down and shook his head. What? asked Archer, trying to peer at his scribblings. Every question I ask you, it seems to get deeper and deeper. What does? He ignored this query, too. The deputy said Mr. Piddleman had hired you to collect a debt owed by one Lucas Tuttle? That's right. And you have not been successful? Not yet. Would that have been Miss Tuttle who dropped you off in front of the hotel? I just happened to be looking out the window. Archer felt the stomach pit grow larger. Yeah, it was. We went out to pay our respects to Mr. Piddleman's widow. He chuckled. Short time in town and you met all these folks already. Impressive. I'm a friendly sort. I'm sure you are, Archer, I'm sure you are. So you and Miss Tuttle helped the deceased from the bar back to here and put him in his bed right there in room 615, correct? That's right. And what time was that? Eleven or so? Eleven or so. And then what did you two do? Archer wanted to lie. Desperately wanted to say they had gone their separate ways. But he was unsure what Jackie would say. And once he lied to the law, it was all over. We went to my room. The man's eyebrow went up as he wrote this down. He went to your room. Number 610 right there. You and Miss Tuttle? That's right. What for? We had a drink. Well, maybe more than one when all was said and done. Doesn't your parole forbid the consumption of alcohol? Does it? Shaw gave him a patronizing look. What else did you have? Why is that important? Use your common sense again, Archer. I didn't have anything to do with that man's death, and I don't remember accusing you of it. Well, uh, your questions are kind of funny. These questions are standard procedure, Archer. Didn't they ask you such when they arrested you before? That wasn't for killing anybody, but still. Archer leaned against the wall. We spent some time together. 
I fell asleep. When I woke up, she was gone. This time together. Would that be with clothes on or off? Archer's features darkened, even as his anxiety rose. Why does that matter? I can't see how you would think it doesn't matter, son. I don't know if I want to answer any more of your questions. You don't have a choice, Archer. The law is the law. Yeah. Folks keep telling me that. Okay. We were in bed together. Then she left. So you slept with the dead man's mistress on the night Hank Pittleman was murdered right down the hall from your room? She's not his mistress. Really? What is she, then? You'll have to ask her. Oh, I will, Archer. Rest assured. Is that all? No, it's not, son. So after you left Mr. Pittleman in his room, you never went back there? Archer pushed off the wall and gathered his wits. This fellow Shaw was poking him like a stick to a hornet's nest. Only thing was, he was hitting all the bad spots for Archer. Had no reason to. So that's a no, is it? That's a no, Archer lied. Understand you were in the army. Who told you that? I don't need to tell you that, and I'm not. You know your way around a gun and a knife, then? Look, I didn't have nothing. Were you in the military, Archer? Interrupted Shaw. Were you? Okay, I'll play your game just this one time. I was a pilot in the Army Air Forces. Ninety-three bombing sorties over Europe. Then I took my wings to the Pacific and dropped a shitload of TNT on the Japs. Loved every minute of it, and was scared to death every minute of it. Archer judged him in a new, more respectful light. That's impressive. A lot more complicated flying a plane than firing a rifle. I think every man who put on the uniform was impressive. You? 34th Infantry Division. Mostly in Italy, but we did work our way to Germany eventually. Though we fought more Germans in Italy than we did Italians. And I think you maybe had it harder than me. That was some damn tough going, I heard. A lot of those GIs never came home from that campaign. Sure seemed tough going to me at the time. I liked my foxhole as much as the next man, only we never got to spend much time there. And the Germans had damn good aim when it came to shelling us when we were hunkered in the dirt. You get shot up? We all got shot up. You done with me now? Shaw put away his notebook and pencil and gave him a bemused look. You know your way around a gun and a knife, and you were sleeping with a dead man's whatever on the night that he died. And by your own admission, you were drinking. And all night you were maybe fifty feet from where he was killed, and you have no alibi for the time he probably died. He paused. So not only am I not done with you, Archer, I'm just starting. He closed the door to 615 and made a show of locking it. That was the first time Archer noted the white dust coating the doorknob. Shaw tipped his hat at Archer and added, Do not try to leave Poker City, Mr. Archer. That would not be smart. It would make me very unhappy, and you even unhappier than me. He walked off, leaving Archer feeling like he'd just been rolled over twice by a panzer. He bent down and looked at the doorknob and the white dust coating it. He reached out to touch it, but thought better of that notion and retreated down the hall. Archer went back to his room, picked up the flask and drained the contents. He wiped his mouth dry, went over to the one window, and looked out at Poker City. He watched as Shaw walked out of the hotel and then stopped. The blood slowly drained from Archer's face as he saw the man Shaw was talking to. It was the front desk clerk Archer had queried about seeing Jackie. The man was gesticulating in the direction of the hotel, while Shaw pulled out his pencil and notebook and wrote it all down. Archer thought he could see the lawman's triumphant look from up here. Archer sat down on the bed and started to think things through. None of this was looking particularly good for him. The money in his pocket, the residue from Piddleman's advance, the papers he'd taken from the dead man, all felt like lumps of white-hot coal melting him away from the inside. He knew Shaw was probably going to see Jackie next. And what would she tell him? You didn't kill the man, Archer. Yet he hadn't committed the crime he'd been sent to Carterock for, and that hadn't stopped them, had it? And from what Shaw had said, the motive would be clear. I slept with Piddleman's mistress. I'd been drinking. I knew how to slit someone's throat. But Piddleman had hired him for a job. 
Now he had no job, like Jack had told the deputies. That would cut against any reason he would have to murder Piddleman. But would it be enough? Clearly not if Detective Shaw were the sole arbiter of his guilt or innocence. He lay back on the bed and wondered if Polka City would be the last stop of his short-lived life. Chapter 17 Later, Archer headed out. As he passed by the front desk, he looked at the clerk who had been talking to Shaw outside. How you doing, brother? said Archer. Better than you by a long shot, mister. Why is that? asked Archer, marching over to him. Give me the straight dope, pal. The smaller man drew back, fear riding in his eyes and the shakes of his limbs. Don't mean nothing, said the man. Just leave me be. Take it easy, I mean you no harm. Says you, he replied darkly. Tell that to poor Mr. Piddleman, he added. Archer wheeled around and walked outside. He took three long breaths, something he had done in the army before every significant military engagement he and his fellow soldiers had been called up to do. He hadn't been a superstitious person before he'd gone into the army, but he'd damn well become one while in uniform. Three long breaths and I came home alive. His spirits suddenly sagged. For prison and now this? He had some decisions to make. There was one area of possibility. With Piddleman dead, Jackie might, despite her words, see the benefit of reconciling with her father. But would Marjorie take Tuttle to court to get the money repaid? If so, Archer wouldn't be getting a dime from that. But maybe Marjorie didn't know, or wouldn't care, about the forty dollars her husband had advanced to him. Yet Shaw could use that as a motive for Archer to have killed Piddleman if he found out about it. Caught between a rock and a hard place, Archer. So what are you going to do? He hoofed it to 27 El Dorado Street and knocked on the door. When no one appeared, he tried the door. It was unlocked. He walked in, calling out Jackie's name as he went. He found the woman lying in bed with not a shred of clothing on. She had a glass of something held to her lips. You just looking or buying, she said, taking a swallow of whatever was in the glass. I don't know, you tell me. I'm hurting, Archer, more than I thought I would be. Come over here and do something about my melancholia. What do you want me to do? If I have to tell you, what good are you? He crossed the floor, stripped down in record time, and lay alongside her. That's better, she said, giving him a kiss. I feel funny doing this now. Because of Hank, it's because of Hank that I want to do it. Otherwise, I'd just be crying. I thought you didn't love him. I didn't. I can still be sad. I'm no angel, Archer. I'm also thinking that my means of livelihood is about to come to an end. So let me enjoy the moment, damn you. She gripped a part of him so hard he gasped. Then she kissed him roughly, and they went from there. Later, when they were done, she lay her head on Archer's arm and stroked his flat, rigid stomach. You have any family, Archer? Any brothers and sisters? No, just me. You said you never hit a woman, Archer, like Hank did me. I told you that because it's the truth. Oh, come on, never. Don't lie to me. Like I told you, I never even thought about doing it. Why, because you never had sisters? I'd like to think it's because I see the unfairness of a guy hitting a gal. How about your parents? They alive? He shook his head and stroked her hair. They died while I was overseas. Never got a chance to say goodbye, or even see him buried. She rested her chin on his chest and stared at him. Why not? Couldn't get any leave to go home. My division was in hard fighting with the Germans. The battle for Bologna was, well, it was tough. Good thing the war ended a couple of weeks after that because we were beat up bad. So even if I could have gotten leave, there was no way for me to get out. Not that I'd have wanted to. Why wouldn't you have wanted to? My parents were dead, Jackie. Nothing was bringing them back. But the 34th needed every soldier could muster. If we all started taking leave, a lot more men would have died who didn't need to. That was very heroic of you? No, it wasn't. Heroes are special people who do things they're not expected to do. I was just a grunt doing my job like millions of other grunts. Only I got to come home for no good reason other than I was lucky enough not to die. 
Still, that must have been awful. Not even seeing them buried. It happened to lots of boys during the war. Why should I be any different? That's extraordinarily magnanimous of you. Those are big college words for such a little thing. I'm an only child, too. I don't have anyone either. Well, you have your father, like it or not. Her fingers stopped stroking his belly for a moment before resuming. You sure know how to press my buttons, Archer, she said, and not in a good way. There were a few moments of silence until Archer said, Hey, did that detective fellow Shaw come and see you too? She sat up and looked down at him, covering her nakedness with the sheet. Yes. I didn't like him. He asked a lot of questions. What did you tell him? He asked. But what did you tell him? The truth, mostly. I told him the whole truth, nothing for it. Meaning? He asked where we met and I told him. At the bar? Well, that's the truth, Archer. Well, there goes my parole. My butt's heading back to Carterock regardless. And what did he say? Nothing. But he wrote it all down. I'm sure he did. He's a man who likes his pencil and paper. What else? That Hank had hired you to collect a debt from my father? But he already knew that. What else? That you had to carry Hank to his room, and then we went back to your place for a nightcap. Did you tell him what else we did? Not in so many words. Did you tell him we slept together? What else was I supposed to say? A gentleman would not have betrayed a lady's secret. I do have a reputation to preserve, Archer. Is that right? Well, he called you Hank Piddleman's mistress. I corrected him on that, not that he cared, just looked at me funny. Man's a bulldog. He's not going to let this go. We have nothing to hide, Archer. You and I know that. But what about him? I'm sure it will be fine. What about Marjorie? What about her? She may sell out everything. She may. It's her right. I told you that. So you really think she's going to turn on you then? Even after being nice to you today? We're not friends, Archer. We needed each other. That's what I've been telling you. Only apparently you weren't listening. With Hank dead, Marjorie Piddleman would love to see me in the street with not a dime to my name. I went over there today trying to buy some time, make her see me in a supportive light. She sighed heavily. But Marjorie's no dummy. With Hank dead, my goose is cooked. She grabbed her pack of cigarettes and lighter off the nightstand and ignited a Chesterfield. Archer declined her offer of one. She took a puff, blew smoke sideways from her mouth, and said in a funereal tone, Well, it was fun while it lasted. She pulled the sheet tighter around her with her free hand as she smoked her cigarette. It's a man's world, Archer. Your kind has all the money and all the power. Hold on now, don't lump me in with the likes of Hank Piddleman. My pockets are just about empty. And as for power, that's a laugh. I'm an ex-con with about as few prospects as a man can have, even after helping to win a big war. She tousled his hair. Well, I can see your point, but it still makes me so mad. It wasn't that long ago where we couldn't even vote. Women have to scrounge around the edges for our share and let the men think they're so far above us. We're just happy to be along for the ride. It won't always be that way, but it's the way it is now. Is that your psychology education talking? That and my common sense and living in this world. She snuffed out her smoke in a tall glass of melted ice. So now I'm up a creek without a paddle or a damn canoe. What will you do now? I'm not going back to my father, if that's what you're suggesting. She lit another cigarette. What about you? I'm not sure how I collect the debt now and get paid. Way I see it, you have options. Hank's dead. My father can pay the money back in good conscience since I'm no longer with Hank. Then you can collect the money Hank promised you from Marjorie. I'll vouch for the deal that Hank made with you. I was there, after all. I think she'll listen to reason. I mean, five thousand dollars is a lot of money, and if she wants it back, you have to get paid. I could go out and see your father. You think he knows about what happened? Of course he does. But I wouldn't go out there just yet. Why not? Hank was murdered, Archer. You rushing around trying to cash in on his death will not be missed by Mr. Shaw. Archer looked at her statement from several angles and pronounced her words starkly plausible. 
so maybe I should just lie low for a bit. Shaw already thinks I might have killed Pittleman. And you're sure you didn't? You're thinking I'm a killer, and yet you just let me in your bed? Well, it was as pleasurable for me as it was for you, and you didn't murder me. So let some time pass, and then you can take my car while the Nash is still my car and go see my father. You okay with me seeing your old man? So long as I don't have to go back to the son of a bitch, I'm okay with just about anything, Archer. Chapter 18 That night, Archer was sitting alone at a table in the Checkered Past restaurant, looking over his menu. The place was packed, and he had grabbed the last available table. He glanced up from his menu when she walked in. Ernestine Crabtree had reverted to her office look meaning an exceedingly modest dress in a drab range of charcoal with a coat sporting big flap pockets that widened her hips. Her hair was once more wound in a fiercely tight bun. The shell specks fronted her face, and she had on not a stitch of powder or lipstick. Her tall heels had shrunk by several inches, and her nylons were thick and scratchy looking. She was holding a wide-brimmed cartwheel hat the color of a robin's egg, which served to brighten her appearance a bit. Still, Archer had to almost look twice to make sure it was the same woman. As there were no empty tables, she looked ready to leave when Archer raised his hand. Miss Crabtree, he called out. The woman glanced sharply in his direction and stiffened when she laid eyes on Archer. Her gaze darted to the door, but he moved to checkmate her by crying out, Got a seat for you right here. He indicated the empty chair opposite him. She vacillated in the doorway of the eatery and finally, perhaps her hunger taking precedent over her good sense, she strode across the room and sat quickly in the seat he had indicated. She might have thought if she rushed this through, no one would notice that a parole officer was about to eat with a parolee. At least, that was Archer's observation. She set her hat down on the table. Archer had set his hat on the chair back. He slipped it on, then lifted it off, tipped it in her direction, and returned it to the chair back. Good to see you. Um, yes. He passed her his menu. She avoided looking at him and focused on the choices for dinner. You eat here a lot? Asked Archer. I mean, I saw you the other time, of course. I eat here sometimes. She seemed to decide on her supper and set the menu down. When it appeared she could no longer avoid setting eyes on him, Crabtree lifted her gaze to his and said, I heard about Hank Middleman. They say he was murdered in his room at the Derby Hotel. He was? Does that help you or hurt you? She asked bluntly. I was sitting here thinking about that myself. And what have you concluded? That it's not a simple answer one way or another. I guess I can see that. He cocked his head. Can you, now? The man who is owed the debt is dead. Is the debt still owed? Legally, yes. But pragmatically? And what if his widow isn't aware of the liability? Men often don't tell their wives anything about their business, believing, wrongly, that they won't understand. Now Lucas Tuttle may decide he never has to pay it back, in which case you probably won't be compensated. But the upside might be that you won't have to pay back the forty dollars to Pittleman's estate. Couldn't have said it better myself, ma'am. In fact, you show a right logical mind. Are you sure you weren't about to add, for a girl? He put a hand over his heart and held the other one up. So help me God, I was not. She smiled at this. A man named Irving Shaw has already talked to me. Do you know him? I know of him. He's a lieutenant detective with the state police, very highly respected. Yeah, I imagine so. He asked a lot of questions. Why did he question you? I'm on the same floor as the dead man. Shaw wanted to know if I'd heard or seen anything. And did you? No, and I told him so. I wonder who could have killed Pittleman. From what I've learned about the man, that list might be pretty long. As I said before, he owns a lot of property in town, including the cat's meow. Archer lit up a cigarette and studied her, tapping his ash twice into the ashtray before speaking. Speaking of the place, Dan Bullock's back in jail, I take it, after coming after you with a knife when you were headed on your way home from there? To her credit, Crabtree didn't even flinch. So you followed me? I followed him because he was following you. I wouldn't have let him hurt you. Turns out you didn't need me. He glanced at her purse. You got the snub nose in there now? In my line of work, I rarely go anywhere without it. Why'd you choose that line of work in the first place? 
She took a few moments to light her smoke, tapping her ash alongside his. It's a job, and I do help people. The ones like Dickie Dill and Bullock are hopeless cases. I will freely admit that. She paused and took a long draw on her Pall Mall. But you are not, Archer. Not by a long shot, if I'm any judge. How's the story writing coming? Slowly, but I have a lot of material. Where do you get that? Life. So where'd you live before coming here? He asked, bending his matchstick in half and depositing it in the black ashtray sitting between them. In response, Crabtree waved the waitress over. She stood next to the table, pad and pen in hand. She was in her fifties, tired and worn out looking, with gray hair partially covered by the cap that was part of her uniform. A dark brown short-sleeved one-piece with a frilly stained apron built into the front. What are you all having? She said curtly. Archer glanced at Crabtree, who said, I'll have the beef stew. To drink? Lemonade. She wrote this down and turned to Archer. You, sir? Steak, rare, with the potatoes and green beans, and coffee to drink, black. And for dessert, how about a slice of that coconut cream pie I see behind the glass over there? She wrote this down and departed. Crabtree took another puff of her cigarette. I was born and raised in Texas. I left when I was 17. When the war started, I worked building airplanes. Really? Which kind? He said with interest. Quite a few, actually. The last one I worked on was the B-29 bomber at a plant in Georgia. He nodded appreciatively. The Super Fortress, they called it. Seen them in the skies when I was over there. And didn't one of them drop the A-bombs on the Japs? Yes, I believe that's right. Building airplanes. That's impressive, Miss Crabtree. I wanted to do my part, as I'm sure you did. You still have family in Texas? No, I have no family left. None. She stared down at the table. He nodded, felt sorry for her obvious uncomfortableness, and decided to say no more for now. They waited in silence until their food came. They ate with only the occasional glance at each other. In the middle of it, Archer excused himself to use the washroom. Later, when he'd finished off his steak and vegetables, he eyed the slice of pie the waitress had set off to the side of the table. I'd be honored if you'd split the pie with me, he said. No, I really couldn't, said Crabtree, setting down her utensils. One bite of pie isn't going to kill anybody. She sighed and looked unsure, but reached for her fork. It is good, she said, as they ate away at it. A lot better than what they fed us in the war. It was either rotted or too hard for the teeth. What did you do then? Scrounged off the countryside. You mean you stole from people? I never stole from anybody. Lots of places were abandoned. If I put a hunk of bread or an apple or some raw carrots in my pocket, I don't think anybody minded. Crabtree wiped her mouth with a cloth napkin. Well, I'm just glad the war's over. You and me both. Thank you for the pie. I should go now. I will pay my bill separately, of course. Already paid the bill when I went to use the john. Now why did you do that? I knew if I'd offered, you wouldn't let me, so it's against the rules for me to- You tell me how it's wrong for a man to buy a woman a meal. I mean, you're helping me out with all the parole stuff. This is a way of thanking you. It's my job. It's what I'm paid to do. It is not done out of friendship or kindness. I paid for your dinner out of an act of kindness. Do you want ex-cons to be kind and thoughtful or not? Well, when you put it that way, the answer seems obvious, I suppose. So, thank you very much for dinner. Good. Now it's a fine evening. We can walk off dinner. I... I really should be... I can at least walk you home. She glanced at him sharply. If you saw Dan Bullock, you know where I live. He nodded. So what happened to him? You never said. He was sent back to prison based on my written account and the knife that he had with his fingerprints on it. I called the police as soon as I got in my house. They picked him up trying to hitch a ride out of town. I think he's right where he belongs then. He stood put on his hat and looked down at her. You ready? She picked up her purse and hat, and they set off together. Chapter 19 The air was crisp, which was a nice change, for the sky was clear to the horizon and probably beyond. Archer kept glancing at his companion curiously as she walked along rigidly and uncomfortably. 
Crabtree said, So with Piddleman dead, that means you no longer have a job? The jury's still out on that, so to speak. How so? I have an opportunity to still make it pay off, only I have to handle things delicately. With Lucas Tuttle? Right. I'm going out to meet with him at some point. Why not right away? Well, with Mr. Piddleman being murdered and all, it's probably smart to let things quiet down a little before I go making money off something connected to him. Oh, I guess I can see that. She suddenly eyed him sharply. Archer, you didn't have anything to do with the man's death, did you? I swear on a stack of Bibles that I didn't. Her gaze lingered on him for a bit. Her look had told Archer all he needed to know. She and Jackie both thought he might have killed the man. Did you finish that book you were reading by... Who was it again? Virginia Woolf. And yes, I did. It was wonderful. She paused. The writing of hers I like best isn't a novel or a short story, but an essay entitled A Room of One's Own. What's it about? A woman working in a man's world, essentially. Is that how you see it? Perhaps. I read a lot in prison. I like detective stories. You heard of Philip Marlowe, Sam Spade, and that little fellow from Belgium? Yes, I have. They're quite entertaining. And maybe I can make a living doing that sort of work, said Archer. He had thought of this before and had decided to try it out on her. From convict to detective? Quite a leap. I was a scout in the army. My job was to look at things, take in a bunch of information, and then take a course of action. Probably close to what Detective Shaw is doing right now, don't you think? She looked impressed with his logic. I think you might be right. They eventually arrived at her house. You own it? No, I'm renting it for the time being. It's really pretty. She smiled. It wasn't so pretty when I got here, but I've had some things repaired. Though the door to my bedroom still jams, I can never fully close it. I can fix that in a jiffy. She looked alarmed. What? No. That's all right. Ma'am, I'm right here. Probably take me no more than a few minutes. Archer, I wouldn't feel comfortable letting you do that. Ma'am, let me just say something. All right, she said, looking at him warily. I spent time in prison with the likes of Dickie Dill and others like him. They're hard men, and some of them live right here. And one of them followed you home. But I took care of that. And one of them wrote you that nasty note. So you need to lock your doors. That includes your front door and your bedroom door. Because if they get the jump on you, well... She stared at him very deliberately for a long moment. I think you're sincere, she said at last. That's because I am. She turned and led him inside. The interior of the place was spartanly furnished, but it was neat and overly clean, at least to Archer's mind. There were also a goodly number of books on the shelves. From a glance, he could see novels by people named Faulkner, Bronte, Whitman, Wharton, Austin, Dickens, Twain, and Steinbeck. And there were quite a few legal tomes, too. Got a lot of law books there. I actually wanted to be a lawyer once. Pardon my ignorance, but can women be lawyers? Of course they can. But I will admit it's unusual. If you want to be one, then I say go for it. Sure you'd make a fine one. Thank you, Mr. Archer, she said, evidently pleased by his remark. You have relations who are in the law? No, but my father... She faltered. Your father was a lawyer? No, he was... She broke off and said, Let me show you the door. Crabtree led him down a short, plain hall to her bedroom. She took off her hat, dropped it on the bed, and put her purse down on a dresser with a tilt mirror topping it. This is the problem, Mr. Archer. She attempted to close the door, but it caught on the floor. Okay. Let me see this thing. He swung it back and forth until the door rubbed like before. It's not the door. I believe the floor might be off a bit. Archer took out a nickel and set it on one end of the floor, and they watched it roll right over to the closet door. Yep, I'd say the floor is definitely not plumb. He pointed to the door hinges. I think if I tighten the screws up enough on these hinges, it should clear the floor, warped though it is. You got a screwdriver? Let me look. It might take a few minutes. I got nowhere to be. After she left, he looked around and noted the perfectly made bed, 
and the shade on the window that he had watched before she had cut the view off by closing the drapes. He looked in the corner and saw the pair of high heels that she had been wearing the night before. As he glanced once more at the bed, Archer saw what looked to be the edge of a book poking out from under a pillow. He checked that she wasn't coming back and then hurried over to the bed. He had no right or business to be doing this, but he couldn't seem to help himself. For Archer, more information was always better than less. And he just thought at first that it was a novel. But when he slid it out, he saw that it was a scrapbook. He turned the page and saw the old yellowed news article. It was from a local newspaper in Amarillo, Texas. It detailed the trial of Carson Crabtree, who had killed three men in separate encounters. There was a photo of Carson within the news article. It showed a huge man with a bald head and a fierce countenance. He had surprisingly worked as a police officer, and curiously enough, considering his features and the crimes committed, had the reputation of being kind and considerate to all who knew him. Yet not only had Carson not blamed his actions on mental affliction, the report said, but he also had confessed to the murders. He had died in the electric chair, leaving behind a wife, Jewel, and one daughter, Ernestine. Archer flipped to the next page and saw the grainy image of Ernestine Crabtree, then only fourteen. She looked small, drab, and dour, and it was hard for Archer to believe that she had grown up into the tall, lovely woman he knew her to be. There were a few other stories about this incident, including ones about the three men killed, and their pictures were included, too. Archer studied the men, and then read about their backgrounds. Each was twenty, and had been in and out of trouble with the law since their mid-teens. As Archer read down the list of crimes committed by them, one caught his attention. Peeping Tom. Each of the three men had been shot, their bodies left where they fell. The sidearm used was Carson's police-issued one. There had been no trial, what with the man's confession, and no deal worked to avoid the death penalty for that confession. And Archer wondered why. He heard footsteps coming, and he hastily slid the book back under the pillow exactly as it had been before and stepped over to the door. A few seconds later, she appeared in the doorway. Here it is, Mr. Archer. He took the screwdriver from her. I'm going to loosen the screws first. When I say so, if you can, just pull up on the edge of the door. Use the knob to grip. She did so when he told her to, and he tightened the upper hinges. Then he got down on his knees and partially unscrewed the ones there. Just pull up as much as you can now. Crabtree let go of the doorknob, lifted her arms high, and gripped the upper edge of the door and pushed toward the ceiling, which raised the lower right edge of the door about a half inch. Just a little higher now. The holes are almost lined up where I need them to be. She went up on her tippy toes and stretched out even more. Okay, hold it right there. He glanced over and saw that, with her efforts, the woman's dress had ridden up some. And with him where he was, he had a clear sight line up her dress, revealing her stocking tops and pale thighs above them. He quickly looked away, feeling embarrassed for her. And maybe for himself, too. That was a new one for Archer. My mother always said I would grow up at some point, and maybe Polka City's the place. Okay, that should do it. He got up off the floor. Try it now. She did so, and the door swung freely. She smiled. That's wonderful, Mr. Archer, thank you. And don't forget to lock it now, and you may want to sleep with that gun under your pillow, too. They went back into the other room and Archer spotted a bottle and two glasses on a bureau. He picked up the bottle. Rebel yell. I hear they make it from wheat, not rye. You're not supposed to drink alcohol, Mr. Archer. Oh, I know that. Number 14 on the list. I was just wondering. A man does get thirsty here, with all the dang dust. Well, you did fix my door, and I guess one nip won't hurt. She poured out two small portions, and they clinked glasses. I'm growing to like this town, he said, taking a sip. Why's that? You have good people, for one thing, like yourself, trying to help others like me. She smiled and nodded. You seem to have come a long way since our first meeting. So what does the J stand for? I beg your pardon? Ernestine J. Crabtree. It's on your office door. What's the J stand for? 
Oh, um, Jewel. It was my mother's first name. Well, it's a pretty name. Yes. He finished his nib. Well, I better get on. Thank you for a nice evening, Mr. Archer. He tipped his hat. My pleasure, Miss Crabtree. Archer headed back to the hotel, where he ran straight into Detective Irving Shaw. Chapter 20 Irving Shaw was leaning back on the front desk in the lobby, staring out toward the main entrance doors, his hat tipped back. His thumbs were tucked into the pockets of his vest. He had an unlit, short-barreled cigar dangling from a corner of his mouth, while the rest of his face held a self-satisfied look. He smiled broadly when he saw Archer walk in. Just the man I want to see. Archer came toward him and looked for, but did not see the clerk. Is that right? You're working late hours. Hunting a killer in a nine-to-five job. Now I spoke with Miss Tuttle. Good for you. And? And she told me some things that I wanted to check out with you. Okay. You want to ask me down here or up in my room? Why don't we do it in the room where Hank Pittleman was found dead? This surprised Archer, but he followed the man to the elevator. I'll take the stairs if you don't mind. Shaw chuckled. Seen that before with ex-cons? Small, confined spaces don't feel all that good, do they? No, they don't. I'll meet you upstairs. An archer? Yeah. Shaw opened his jacket to show a big-butted Smith & Wesson forty-five with iron sights carried in a worn leather shoulder holster. It was a serious piece of ordnance meant for serious business of the killing kind. Don't you go screwball and try to bug out on me, okay? I might have flown planes in the war, but I'm a damn good shot. Not gonna miss anything near as big as you. Why would I do that, when we're getting all friendly? Shaw chuckled again and pushed the elevator button as Archer headed to the fire door and the stairs beyond. On the sixth floor, Shaw used the key to open the door to number 615. He and Archer went through, and Shaw closed the door behind them. Piddleman's body had long since been taken away, though the bed was still unmade and the cover and pillows bloody. Okay, said Archer. What's on your mind? Miss Tuttle said you carried Piddleman in here and put him down on the bed. Then you two left and went to your room. Same as I told you. You got a strong back then because it took two deputies to carry the man out. And you said you never came back in here? That's right. And Miss Tuttle said on the way out she opened the door and closed it securely after you both left and then locked it. That's right. Okay, glad we got that straight, Archer. Can I go now? Hardly, son. We're just getting started. Don't be in such a rush. Next, Shaw pulled something from his pocket. It was a hip flask that Archer recognized. Who said you could frisk my place? He demanded. I did. You got no right to do that. I got every right, son. A man's been killed. You mean you can just toss a man's room without permission? I mean exactly that. The law's on my side. I wish the law would sometimes be on my side. And try not breaking it, Shaw retorted. That flask's not even mine. I know that. I'm not concerned with the flask per se. What then? I also recovered two glasses from your room, with the remains of drink in them. Okay, I had a drink with Miss Tuttle, so what? I told you that already. Well, the so what is that's a parole violation to be using alcohol. But again, I'm not concerned about that. I've got bigger fish to fry. For investigating a man being killed, you don't seem too concerned about much. Oh, you'll see that I'm concerned about a great deal. And right now, I'm concerned about you. Now, there were fingerprints on the flask and the two glasses. You know about fingerprints? Archer looked at his hand. I know everybody's got them. Right. And you know everybody's fingerprints are different? If you say so. I do. I had Miss Tuttle's fingerprints taken today. I had them compared to the ones on the glasses and the flask. She didn't tell me that. Well, I didn't tell her why I wanted them. Why'd you take her fingerprints? Patience, son, I'm getting there. Shaw opened the door to the room and pointed at the doorknob. See that white powder on there? I see it, yeah. I had it dusted for fingerprints. That's what the white coating is, fingerprint dust. Amazing things they can do with fingerprint dust. Yeah, sounds exciting. Now there are three fresh sets of fingerprints on there, and only three. Okay. Miss Tuttle's? Well, sure, she opened the door, and the maid who found the body? 
interjected Shaw. Okay, but... Now Archer could clearly see the man's line of reasoning. And he felt like he had just been dropped out of a plane and was free-falling to death. And what had Ernestine mentioned? Dan Bullock's fingerprints on that knife had helped send him back to prison. And your fingerprints! Shaw shut the door so hard it caused a bang when the door met the door jam. Which makes me wonder how they got on the doorknob, both coming and going. Since you confirmed to me that you had never touched them to begin with, and that you had never been back to Mr. Piddleman's room after you and Miss Tuttle left him here. Shaw leaned back against the wall, edged his Homburg down a bit, folded his arms over his chest, and stared like a seasoned pointer on a bird at Archer. So I'm thinking what you told me before was a load of hooey, son. And somebody feeds me baloney, I don't make a sandwich with it. I make an arrest. You have a way with words, Mr. Shaw, I'll give you that. Now I want you to start having your way with words, Archer, starting and ending with the truth. Anything less than that, the cuffs are going on you right now, son, just so we understand each other. Archer glanced at the doorknob as his mind processed all of this at a rapid pace. The only problem was, he could see no way around it other than the truth. But sometimes not only did the truth not set you free, it could send you right back to prison. Okay, I'll level with you. When I passed by here this morning, the door was open a crack. I thought Jackie, I mean, Miss Tuttle, was maybe in the room. So I walked in. That's when I touched the doorknob. Meaning you lied to me before? I guess you could say that. Keep going, Archer, this is mighty fine stuff. I saw the man sleeping in the bed. Well, I thought he was sleeping. Then I saw a towel on the floor, with stuff on it. I came closer to see what it was. Then I saw the knife next to the towel. They were both covered in blood. I went over to the bed to see about Mr. Piddleman. But it was too late. He was dead, his throat all butchered. Then what did you do? Archer decided not to tell him about his debate on relieving some of the dead man's cash, because he could not see a way that would remotely benefit his case, which was now for shit anyway, though he had taken the debt papers. Then I left. I opened the door and walked out. Leaving your fingerprints behind? Yes, sir. Did you remove anything from this room or the body? Archer didn't hesitate, because he knew to a man like Shaw that would be the same as lying. No, sir. You see anybody? Hear anybody? No, it was just me. Archer paused. Now, I know this doesn't look good. Shaw unexpectedly chuckled. Well, you're right about that, son. But it don't take a genius, does it? What happens now? I have more than enough to arrest you, you know that? Look, what would be my reason to kill the man? I was working for him. Him dead, I don't get squat. Shaw chewed on the butt of his stogie. Miss Tuttle made the same argument to me earlier. Well, she's one smart gal. So? A job and money's not the only reason to kill a man. I don't see another, at least in my case. Sure you do, Archer. Think about it. Give me a clue. How about a woman? Miss Tuttle. You wanted her and Piddleman had her. For all I know, you went to his room, you both argued about the lady, and you did what you did. You think I'd kill a man over a woman? Now Shaw laughed outright. Hell, Archer, if I had a dollar for every man who's killed another man over a woman, I'd be a damn Rockefeller. Did you check the knife for my prints? Because I can tell you for a fact they aren't on it. There were no prints on there because the killer wiped them off, probably on the towel. Otherwise, he wouldn't have left it behind. He just was careless about the doorknob. On this, Shaw looked pointedly at Archer. Meaning maybe you were but why not take the knife with him? Then you got a weapon that killed a man to hide or dispose of. Not an easy thing to do. You think I brought a knife with me from prison? You took a long bus ride here. For all I know, you bought or stole a knife from someone on that bus, or you could have done the same while you were here. Miss Tuttle told me Piddleman gave you an advance. Forty dollars cash. How much of that you got left? Archer took a quick breath, but didn't answer right away. So now Shaw knew about the money Archer owed to Piddleman, which meant Archer now had a motive to kill the man. Well, I bought some stuff. Clothes and food and such. Right, but you didn't do your job, Archer. 
You didn't get the car, so that means you owed Piddleman money. And I've been asking around about the man. He is not somebody you want to owe money to. Did you get into an argument with him about that? No. I was going to talk to him about it, but never got the chance. So you say. And the fact is, you didn't have to bring a knife with you. Jackie Tuttle and two other witnesses have already identified the murder weapon as belonging to Mr. Piddleman himself. I know that. He took it out in the... In the bar? Where you met him? Miss Tuttle told me about that, too. That's another lie you told me. You're ringing up quite a tally. So the fact is, you could have used Piddleman's own knife to slit his throat, and presto, you don't owe him a dime, because he's not around to demand it. Lots of other men probably owed him money, but lots of other men weren't sleeping with his lady friend, or staying in a room pretty much right down the hall, or leaving their prints on a doorknob to the dead man's room. You, and only you, on the other hand, hit the trifecta on that. Frustrated Archer fell silent, while Shaw's gaze continued to bore into him. I've investigated a lot of crimes, Archer, and this isn't my first murder, not by a long shot. Did it before the war, and I'm doing it again. Now it can take a while, but I've never failed to get my man in the end. As a law-abiding citizen now, I'm right happy about that. We'll see how happy you are when I'm done. This is a hanging state, you know that? Tell the truth, I hadn't bothered to look into it. That might change as time goes on. Are you arresting me? Not right now, no. So I can go? For now. But Archer, don't try to make a run for it. You hear me? You keep telling me that, because I want the message to sink in loud and clear, son. I got nowhere to run, and no interest in running. That's for a guilty man to do, which I'm not. You're a funny one. Nothing funny about being wrongly hanged. I'll grant you that. Now get on out of here. Chapter 21 Archer went to his room, shed his new clothes down to his skivvies, opened the window because he felt claustrophobic and bitter about what was happening, and lay down on the bed in the dark and stared at a ceiling he couldn't really see. The four walls of his room seemed to be closing in on him. The feeling of claustrophobia was, in fact, far stronger than he'd felt at Carter Rock after the mayor's daughter had turned all his sincere help into a tale of vicious kidnapping. He had been simple and naive, and just plain stupid, to let that happen to him. The fact was he had also been trusting, because he had relied on his comrades-in-arms with his life during the war. It had never occurred to Archer that once he was home again in peacetime, his fellow citizens would turn against him. Still, he was fortunate they hadn't given him life in prison. But Archer would never get back the several years they had taken. He would never feel he had gotten the better end of some vague deal. And here it was happening again. An hour passed, and Archer never once stopped looking up at nothing. Then he rose and put his clothes back on. It took him twenty minutes to walk it. Then he was outside of number 27 Eldorado Street. Despite the lateness of the hour, there was one light on in what he knew was Jackie's bedroom. He wanted to know what else she had told Shaw. He walked up to her door and knocked. Who is that? The voice came from the right of him. He stepped back and looked at the lit open window. It's me, Archer. Archer? Her voice sounded funny. What do you want? I'm in bed. There was nothing inviting in her tone. I need to talk. Shaw came by to see me again at the Derby. Well, he came by to see me again, too. Woke me out of a dead sleep. He only left a bit ago. Can I come in? It's important. A long moment passed before she said, Give me a sec. A minute later, she opened the door, and in the light from inside, he saw she was dressed in a thick light blue robe that went down to her ankles. Her face held a scowl. She stepped back, and he passed through. They sat in the living room. She stared at him, and he stared down at his hat. Shaw is setting up to arrest me for Piddleman's murder, he finally said. She nodded. I could tell that by the questions he asked me. It would have been nice if you had given me some warning. And he took your fingerprints, too. That would have been good to know, he added accusingly. As soon as he said this, Archer realized he had made an unforgivable mistake. The scowl turned to something else something that unnerved Archer maybe as much as fighting the Germans had. 
she stood and looked down at him. When she spoke, her voice was low and calm, and still managed to bristle with menace. Let me tell you what would have been good to know. She paused, but only for a second. When you came to see me before the cops showed up, you didn't tell me that Hank was dead. But according to what Shaw told me just a bit ago, you sure as hell knew he was dead. Now that would have been good to know, Archer. She bent down and slapped him hard across the face. The blow stung and reddened his skin and made his eyes water a bit. But Archer didn't move. He didn't say anything. When she raised her hand to strike him again, he assumed no defensive posture, did nothing to stop her. She looked down at him in some confusion. Then when it became apparent that Archer was not going to defend himself or fight back, this seemed to take all the energy from her. She dropped her hand and slumped down next to him. I should have told you, Jackie, Archer said quietly. I don't know why I didn't. No, maybe I do. I trusted a gal once and ended up in prison because of it. When I found Piddleman dead, I panicked. I figured the fewer people who knew, the better for me. It was just all about surviving, I guess, and not going back to prison. He fell silent, and Jackie said nothing for a few seconds. I don't blame you for not trusting Archer. It's not like I trust easily or at all, and it's not like I've been an open book with you. So where do we go from here? asked Archer. You could start with telling me about Hank. Shaw told me what you told him, but I'd prefer to hear it from you. Archer nodded, marshaled his thoughts and said, I woke up, got dressed, went out in the hall, passed by the door, and saw that it was open. I went inside. Why? I thought you might be in there with him. You had left my bed, he added. Oh, good Lord, Archer, are all men as dense as you when it comes to that? Probably. Anyway, I saw the man was dead, so I hightailed it out of there. And you never raised the alarm? Never went for help? Her eyes flashed with suspicion. Help? For what? I've seen a lot of dead men in my time, Jackie. No way you were breathing life back into Hank Piddleman. Still, you left him like that, Archer? And now Shaw thinks you killed him. Did he say that directly? He didn't have to. I could tell from his questions. She paused. Did you kill him? Come on, tell me the truth. In his agitation, Archer stood and paced. What reason would I have for killing him? Maybe because you didn't like me being with him like you just suggested. Archer ceased his pacing. Don't get me wrong, Jack, you're a wonderful gal and all. But to kill a man, I would have at least have to know you for longer than a few days and sleep with you more than twice. So you say. So you really think I did it? Killed a man? It doesn't matter a whit what I think, Archer. It matters what Shaw thinks. It matters to me what you think. I know you can kill because you did that in the war. She paused as he stared her down. But I guess I don't see you killing Hank, no. You guess? Well, thanks for nothing. She gripped his hand and pulled him down on the sofa next to her. Don't be that way, okay? You say you don't really know me. Well, that works both ways, Archer, because I don't really know you. You can see that, right? Archer didn't want to see that, but what she said made good sense. She said, hell, maybe somebody robbed him. Shaw wouldn't tell me if Hank's wad of cash was missing. He was always waving that around. Everyone knew he carried a lot of money. Stupid thing for him to do. But that could be it. Archer knew it wasn't robbery. He put his hat back on. Okay, well, thank you. For what? For sort of believing me. He may be the only one in Poca City who does. You still gonna try to collect that debt? I need the money. I don't want to bash hog brains in. She looked at him in confusion. Hog brains? Never mind. Now when you're ready to head out to my daddy's place, let me know. I'll give you the keys to the Nash. It's over in a covered garage in Folsom Street. You can't miss it. She gave him directions to the place. Just leave the keys in the glove box when you get back. I will, thanks. An archer? Be careful when you go out there. Your old man pulled a shotgun on me last time I was there. Careful is all I'm going to be. Chapter 22 Archer rose early the next morning, 
washed his face, armpits, and other strategic locations of his person in the communal bath, put on fresh socks and underwear, and headed down the hall. He halted when he saw the door to 615 standing open. Hello? He said, poking his head in. The door swung fully open, and there was Shaw eyeballing him. He had on another suit, a faded gray double-breasted with a black and white polka dot tie, and a pair of scuffed black mock toe shoes. His hair was neatly combed and his features fresh. He smelled of aftershave and had another unlit stogie perched in his mouth. You're up early, aren't you? Don't like to let the grass grow under my feet. You never know when you might get yanked off him. Let me ask you something. Come on in here. Archer stepped through, and Shaw closed the door behind them. He pointed to the connecting door. You ever been in that room? No. And if my damn fingerprints are on that doorknob, then somebody put them there. Get off your high horse and just listen. We didn't find a single fingerprint on the two doorknobs there, or the two on the hall door to 617. Okay. You find that puzzling? Should I? Presumably he went into that room on occasion. Why would there be no prints there? You mean someone might have wiped them off? Bingo. Archer looked at the connecting door. Jackie told me he had the two rooms, but she didn't tell me what for. Thought it was a waste, a man having two rooms. But she said he wanted them, and the man owns the hotel so he can have what he wants. Interesting. How's your job coming? Well, I met with Mr. Piddleman and his wife before he was killed to let them know something. Really now? What was that? That Mr. Tuttle had apparently torched the car that was collateral for the loan from Mr. Piddleman that I was trying to collect from him. Did he, by God? I didn't see him do it, but I saw the caddy all burned up. What were you doing out there, then? Trying to get the damn car. It was collateral, after all. That's legal, right? Piddleman said it was. Don't know, Archer. I don't do anything with debts and collateral and such. Well, since I didn't touch the car, no harm, no foul regardless. Why wouldn't Tuttle pay back the loan if it's owed? His daughter was hanging out with Piddleman, and Lucas Tuttle hated that told me he'd pay the loan if Jackie came back home. So long as she was with Piddleman, he wasn't paying. So old man Tuttle had a grudge against Piddleman then. Archer was alarmed. Now hold on. Don't go get all riled up about him. He wasn't going to do anything against Piddleman. I told him I was working on it. And hell, if he was going to kill the man, he wouldn't use a knife. He would have shot him with the same damn Remington he pointed at me when I went out there. Shaw shook his head and grinned. What? asked Archer. I just right now put up another plausible suspect to have killed Piddleman, and you shot it down, boy. Are you dumb, or just too honest, or both? I did my time. I'm not looking to have anyone go behind bars if they did nothing wrong. I know how that feels. So you were innocent, were you? Hell yes, I was. If I had a dollar for every time I've heard that. Yeah, I know, you'd be as rich as a Rockefeller. No, I'd be richer. He eyed the connecting door to 617. Want to see what's in there? You want me to? Maybe you'll see something I missed. Shaw opened the door and they passed through. It was then that Archer could see why the man wanted two rooms. Is this his office? He said, looking around. It is indeed. There was a large desk with a glass top with a squat black phone sitting on it and a slim white phone book next to it. On the other side of the desk was a tobacco pouch. A briar pipe with a worn mouthpiece was aligned next to it, and a box of Van Dyke cigars sat alongside that. A calendar sat in its own holder on the desk glass, with the day's ink filled with appointments and meetings, and a few manila files were next to it. Behind the desk was an oak shelving unit full of stacked paper, files, and an odd book or two having to do with land title issues. At least, that was what Archer gathered from reading off the spines. Against one wall was a four-drawer wooden file cabinet with alphabet ranges written on them from A to Z, top to bottom. Comfortable chairs and a couch were on the other side of the room. A full bar was set up against one wall, with an empty silver ice bucket and scooper off to the side. Though it was still morning, Archer looked lustfully at the bottles lined up there. You poked around already? Shaw nodded. Checked his calendar and such. Didn't find much there but I did find some interesting things. Like what? 
Man was sick. Dying, actually. Who, Piddleman? You gotta be kidding. Shaw shook his head. Found some medical reports. Man had a brain tumor. Inoperable, it said. Checked with his doctor. He confirmed it. Funny. What is? First night I met him, Piddleman clutched at his head. Said it was the bad liquor. Nope. It was cancer. How long did he have? Not long, the doc said. Damn. So why kill the man if he was already dying? That's the question, Archer. But then your motivation would have nothing to do with that. If you wanted Jackie Tuttle, you wouldn't want to wait on it. And by your own admission just now, you didn't know he only had a little time left to live. I never wanted a woman bad enough to slit a man's throat, Mr. Shaw. Shaw perched on the edge of the dead man's desk. What do you know about Piddleman? Here he's the richest man around. Owns most of the town. He's got a place outside of Polka, almost as big as this hotel. His wife is okay with him seeing Jackie, or at least she knows about it. Mr. Piddleman spoke about it right in front of her while I was there. Did he now? What else? I helped haul some stuff from here to his trucking warehouse the other day. Got paid a dollar for it. By a man named Sid Duckett. He works for Piddleman. Met another man there, too, name of Malcolm Draper. He works for Piddleman, too. He's his business manager. Man carries a gun. Shaw rubbed at his thin mustache. Okay. Anything else you find? In answer, Shaw picked up some pieces of paper and handed them to Archer. Didn't find those in here. Found them in the trash bins behind the hotel. You checked the trash bins? You always check the trash bins, Archer. I even looked at the one in your room. Only found a drained gin bottle and empty packs of Lucky Strikes. Archer looked at the papers. They're bills of Piddleman's, and they're all stamped past due. That's a fact. Man was apparently not paying them. But Piddleman was rich. Even a rich man can spend more than he's got coming in, and that makes him a poor man. Doesn't make much sense. It will eventually. Well, I wish you luck. I just hope you're coming to the conclusion that I had nothing to do with the man dying. I'm not there yet, Archer. I'm truly not. Just so we know where we stand with each other. Okay. Why were you up so early the morning Piddleman was found dead? Heard a noise outside in the hall. Well, son, I asked you about that, and you said you heard nothing unusual. You were asking about unusual sounds in the night. I heard that sound in the morning. What time again? Around six. Why? Shaw's features turned grave. Something's going on in this town I don't like. You watch yourself, Archer. You watch yourself close. And don't be no fool, son. As Archer headed to the door, the lawman added one more warning. And don't trust nobody. He added warningly. I don't care how damn pretty they are. Chapter 23 Hey, fella. Archer was crossing the lobby of the Derby when the front desk clerk called out to him. It was the same one who had initially checked him in. Yeah, said Archer, coming over to him. You gotta pay up if you want to stay here. This was not what Archer had been expecting. What's that again, mister? The clerk swung the register around. You only paid for three nights. You've been here way longer than that. Would have caught it before, said poor Mr. Piddleman got murdered. How much are we talking, then? asked Archer, and the clerk told him. Archer reached into his pocket and counted out his remaining cash, including the two half dollars he'd gotten for loading the crates. The clerk snatched all this up and said, That don't even cover what you owe, and what about going forward? That's all the money I got, brother. Then I guess you're gonna have to find other accommodations. But if I don't have any more money, how am I gonna do that? Not my problem, fella. Now go clean out your things, and see here, I'll be watching. You got ten minutes. Gotta get that room ready for a paying guest. Archer went to his room, collected his few possessions, and marched out of the lobby while the clerk watched him go every step of the way. Archer looked up and down the street and decided he had only one option. He headed over to the courts building and waited on the steps with his hat tilted over his eyes. Mr. Archer? Archer pushed his hat back and gazed up at Ernestine Crabtree. She had on a plain blue A-line skirt with a pleated front, a long-sleeved white blouse, 
puffy in the arms and tight at the wrists, with a wide open v-neck collar and low pumps with chunky heels. Her dark hat, made of felt, was narrow-brimmed with a band around it and a little bow of ivy green in front. The hair was not done in the usual tight bun. It was actually down around her shoulders, in the same style that he had complimented her on before. What are you doing here? Coming to see you about a job. You mean you need to work to pay back the forty dollars? I mean I got kicked out of the derby and I'm flat broke, so, yeah. Come on up. They took the interior stairs up to her floor and he followed the woman down the hall. Another man passed them going the other way, leered at Crabtree and then Wolf whistled. Woo-wee, baby, you got something I need. Smiling, he eyed Archer. You're a lucky man getting that skirt all for yourself, pal. Archer had done this very same thing more times than he could count. But that was before he had read about Ernestine Crabtree's terrible past. And when he glanced at her and saw first embarrassment and then resignation, he wasn't sure which one made him angrier. Hey, buddy, said Archer sharply. He dropped the things he was carrying, grabbed the man by the lapels, and slammed him up against the wall, knocking his pork pie hat off in the process. What's your problem, fella? barked the man. Show the lady some respect. Respect? You kidding, pal? Dames love when guys do that. Not this dame. Now apologize to her right now before I smash her damn nose in. Crabtree called out. Mr. Archer, it's all right. Let it be, please. But I don't want you to get in trouble on my account. Please. Archer slowly and reluctantly let the men go. The shaky fellow grabbed his fallen hat and rushed off down the hall. Archer picked up his things and followed Crabtree down the hall, but looked back twice at the man. I'm sorry about that idiot, he said. Yes, well, thank you, Mr. Archer, that was very chivalrous. She opened the door and led him into the office. Have you had anything to eat, she said, or some coffee? No, ma'am, but I'm fine. You sure? You look hungry. She opened her purse and held out two dollars, but Archer put his hand up. I'm not taking money from you, ma'am though I thank you. It'd be against the rules, no doubt, and I'm not going to put you at risk for losing your job. Back there you said you didn't want me to get into trouble. Well, I feel the same way about you. Just let me get to work and earn some on my own. She closed her purse and looked up at him with her wide, depthless eyes and said, Well, I know what you said earlier, but the only thing I have where you can start work immediately is the slaughterhouse. I'm in no position to be choosy so if you could call him and tell him I'd like the job, that would be good. And how do I get out there? She looked at the clock on the wall. A truck takes the men out there every day. Leaves at 8.30 sharp right down the street from here. You'll see them gathering. Sounds fine. She looked at his suit. However, I would not wear your new clothes to do that sort of work. He looked down. You're probably right about that. I got my old ones in this bag. There's a bathroom down the hall on the right. He changed his clothes in the bathroom and put the new ones into his bag. When he came back to the office, Ernestine was just hanging up the phone. It's all settled. She eyed his new suit in the bag. Why don't you leave those here? I can hang them up. You can pick them up when the truck brings you back. You don't have to do that. Like you said, my job is to help people like you. Just come and see me after. I'll wait for you. Thank you, Miss Crabtree. Well, good luck to you, Mr. Archer. At that place, you, um, you may need it. Archer saw the men collecting at the corner and headed over to join them. And as he had expected, there was old Dickie Dill smack in the middle of them. He and a few other men were engaged in a game of back alley craps right there against the front steps of a building. Archer watched this for about a minute while the men were focused on the game and took no note of his presence. Dill's final roll of the dice brought a curse and an evil look from the man. Archer saw a dollar bill pass between the ex-con and another fellow. Hellfire, Archer! Thought I might see your butt out here before long! exclaimed Dill when he spied Archer. Hey, Dickie, he said with little enthusiasm. This here's Archer, boys, announced Dill to the group of rough-looking gents. Most were smaller than Archer, but a couple were giants who looked like they were put out by having to share the same air with him. He's one of us, said Dill. What were you in the joint for? growled one of the giants. His clothes were filthy, and so was his thick beard. 
One eye lurched inward too far, giving him an unsettling expression. Archer looked up at him. Something stupid. What were you in for? Killing a man who needed it. And he wasn't the first one who bought the farm with me. Just the only one they caught me on. He added proudly. How long did you do? Long enough. This was in the big house. Because the son of a bitch was a snitch for Hoover and the G-men. Would have done a lot longer, except the guards got too scared of me. The man did not appear to be joking. Dill pulled Archer aside. Buddy of mine got put back in Carterock. Who might that be? Dan Bullock. You saw him at the checkered past. He told me you gave him some good advice. Only the man got all cockeyed and didn't take it. Hey, I'm always looking out for people like us. Dill grinned. You always were okay in my book, Archer. But there was something in the little man's features that made the hair on Archer's neck stand up and salute. A man like Dickie Dill did not understand nuance. And when he put his arm around Archer's shoulders, the steely fingers bit in a little too deep, relaying critical information his mouth had not. An old Ford truck with a sputtering radiator pulled up. Its open rear bed had wood slats on the sides and rough wooden bench seats. The driver came out and dropped the rear gate, and the men climbed on one by one. Dill sat next to Archer as the truck pulled away. What you gonna be doing at the slaughterhouse? asked Dill. Don't know yet. Guess whatever needs doing. If it's killing the hogs, I'll show you how. Thanks. Hey, saw you rolling the dice back there. Dill's friendly expression faded. So what? You ain't thinking about snitching on me to Miss Crabtree. Dill plucked something from his pocket. Archer saw it was the man's switchblade. This was the dicky Dill he remembered and loathed. Archer leaned over and whispered, All's I'm saying is you better watch yourself around games of chance. You remember inside Carterock? Hell, that game was fixed by that bastard Riley. Yeah, it was. And just like with Riley, you crapped out five times in a row back there except for your first roll, where you got your eleven and sweetened the pot and then crapped out right after. And the man who took your money palmed the dice after each throw. He sees you as a patsy for sure. So next time he asks you to play, just tell him, no dice. Funny, huh? Something seemed to go off in Dill's head, and he looked viciously over at the man who'd taken his dollar. I'm gonna cut the bastard up. No, you're not. Remember, third time's the charm. You're not going back to prison. Now put the blade away. You're not even supposed to have a weapon, Dickie. That'll get you put right back in Carterock. Dill slowly slid the knife back into his pocket, but he kept shooting looks at the other man the whole ride out. Archer could smell the place about two miles before they arrived there. The stench made his nostrils seize up. Dill noted this and chuckled, as did two other men on the truck. Hellfire, Archer! After a while, you can't smell nothing, said Dill. He touched his nose. Goes dead in there! Well, I like to smell things. Like Miss Crabtree's perfume? said Dill, with a wicked look. We already talked about that, Dickie. Man can damn well dream. He licked his lips, his lascivious look turning Archer's stomach, as he thought about what a man like Dill would do to a woman like Ernestine Crabtree given the chance. He was glad he had fixed the woman's bedroom door. But then he heartened himself by thinking that Crabtree might just shoot the little bastard before he could do her any harm. The slaughterhouse was a large one-story cement block building, with hog pens on three sides, teeming with very much living stock. When Archer asked about this, Dill said ominously, Ain't for much longer, as they marched through a door after climbing off the truck. This here is where the hogs come to die, he added gleefully. They were processed in by a burly foreman wearing a long white coat and safety hat. The man told Archer, Yeah, she called. Pays five dollars a day. Get your money end of the day on Friday. Look, can I get an advance, friend? said Archer. You trying to be funny or stupid or what? Guess so. Coat, gloves, helmet, and goggles in that room over there. Find what fits. So, what's my job? Not crushing hog skulls, I hope. Nah, we got enough of those. You're gonna be sawing up the meat and racking it. You just watch the fellas in there to get the hang of it. 
Why the hat, goggles, and all the rest? The man laughed. You'll see why. Now beat it. Archer put on a long white coat that was stained with blood, and a helmet, goggles, and gloves. Dill, similarly dressed, came over to him. Hey, you want to watch me bash some hogs in the head? Got a guy who ropes him by the neck, holds him steady like, then I come in from the rear so as not to spook him, and bam! Hog brains all over! No thanks, Dicky. I'll take your word for it. Archer was led to the room where he'd be working. There were long wooden tables all over, and hog parts of all descriptions hanging from ceiling hooks connected to a powered conveyor belt.